Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. Senator Wong, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am, Mr President. Thank you very much. By leave, I ask the Leader of the Government in the Senate to clarify whether the Government intends again to seek leave uh, to recommit the vote on General Business Notice of Motion 1270 relating to the inquiry into the ABC and is, SBS complaints handling process. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And I presume that question is asked. Did you want to continue, Senator Wong? Or you, I mean, you've asked the question. Please. Minister. I assume, Mr. President, that I have leave to uh, to respond. Um, I thank uh, I thank the Senate, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I do advise the Senate that uh, that following matters that were raised in the Senate uh, late in the proceedings yesterday, I have had discussions with the relevant whips and other parties uh, involved in the division that was questioned uh, in Senate proceedings uh, just prior to adjournment yesterday. Uh, as a result of uh, those discussions, uh, I do not believe that there is an adequate example of misadventure uh, for the Senate to seek to have the vote recommitted. The government will not be seeking to have that vote recommitted. And Mr President, more broadly, I would like to acknowledge uh, the very important role that pairing arrangements play in this place. One of the things that distinguishes this chamber from the other place uh, is indeed uh, the upholding of conventions, particularly around pairing in this place, to ensure uh, that uh, the will uh, of the chamber is adequately reflected at all times, noting that for many very legitimate reasons, senators will from time to time be unable to participate in the proceedings. And that has not always been the case in the other place, uh, and I, be I believe it has been to the detriment in terms of the operation of that chamber compared with this chamber. Uh, I take very seriously the importance of such conventions and practices uh, because I know they enable all senators of all political persuasions to be able uh, to exercise their duties in this place as well as their duties outside of this place, uh, both professional and personal obligations from time to time. Uh, so, Mr President, uh, I want to assure you and through you, the Senate, uh, that, uh, that when matters were raised yesterday, I did take steps to look into them uh, and, uh, and that the government uh, at all times will seek to be ensuring uh, that all government senators where pairs are requested uh, are uh, recorded appropriately uh, and reflect entirely the will of those senators. I am aware, Mr President, of correspondence that the opposition uh, has, uh, has sent uh, two uh, government senators, uh, to two government senators in particular, I believe. Uh, I understand the opposition's request to have uh, express pairing instructions from those senators. Uh, I believe those senators uh, are aware of that matter uh, and, uh, and the government whip uh, will work with the opposition whip uh, and those senators to ensure uh, that, uh, that practices are provided and advice provided in a manner that gives the opposition uh, and the chamber sufficient confidence uh, that the will is accurately being reflected of individual senators at all times. Are you seeking leave to respond, Senator Wong? Thank you. Um, I think that possibly the most efficient thing to do might be for me to seek leave to move a motion to take note of the, that statement, because I think other parties may wish to respond as well. We'll just prevent leave being granted each time. So I seek leave to make, move a motion that the Senate take note of the statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection? I, I thank the Senate. And I thank the Leader in the Government for his recognition of 
you know, the circumstances of misadventure which have enabled recommittal, which really weren't, I think, demonstrated yesterday, uh, uh, and also for his acknowledgement uh, of the importance of pairing arrangements, which at their heart, we need to remember, are about ensuring the will of the Senate is reflected. Uh, they're not about funny games to manage your internals. They're ultimately about whether or not uh, the democratic will of the Senate is reflected in the outcome of a vote. Uh, and I do want to raise an issue, the issue that, to which he uh, re averted, which is the issue of two senators on the other side who have made public comments about withholding their vote. Now, in those circumstances, Mr. that is Senators Antic and Senator Rennick, Senators Antic and Rennick, they have made public comments that they will withhold their vote. Uh, I'll refer to Mr. Senator Rennick. This evening, I sent the following letter to the Prime Minister, advising him that I will withhold my vote from the coalition until a number of issues are dealt with. And he goes to the lifting of vaccine mandates, obviously hasn't occurred, um, the uh, uh, compensation for people who have been injured. Uh, and a whole um, range of issues about testing, which are a little bit confusing. But anyway, that's a matter for him. But my point is, the convention in this place that the whip of a major party, or actually of any party, can advise of who is being paired, is predicated on the assumption that the whip speaks for the senators. That's the basis on which we grant pairs, and the basis on which uh, pairs are granted in order to reflect the will of the Senate. And the Senate yesterday really was in a position where a senator who said his vote was being withheld until the Prime Minister dealt with a few things was actually paired as a coalition vote and then rocks up to the chamber and says he wants it recommitted because actually he wanted to vote for it. <laughs> so, my vote's been withheld until the PM does what I want on vaccine mandates. Actually, my vote will be counted, but I'll duck, you know, but I'll be paired. Actually, no, please recommit it because I think I wanted to be there. I could talk about the shambles that that was last night, but we were all here. <laughs> I think we all saw. But the more important point is in circumstances where two senators have made repeated public assertions that they will not be voting with the government, I make it clear to the government, as has been outlined in Senator Urquhart's letter, which was copied to Senator Smith, we do not feel we can simply accept the whip's advice that they have their votes for the purpose of granting pairs. It is an unprecedented situation. And so to keep faith with the pairing arrangements, I think it's a very responsible thing to do, if I may say, that Senator Urquhart has done. She's written to Senator Rennick and to Senator Antic and said, to ensure the will of the Senate is reflected in remaining votes in the parliamentary session and in light of your public statements, I ask that you communicate in writing your intention to support, oppose or abstain on each vote to all whips. It is consistent this requirement with the requirement for independent senators when they are absent from the chamber and minor parties when they are not represented. So it's the same standard we expect of Senator Hanson and Roberts when they're not here, Senator Lambie when she's not here, Senator Griff when he's not here, Senator Patrick when they're not here. And we are asking for this. We're not, we're not asking for it on a whim. Or to, we're asking for this because their senators, these two senators, have said we're not voting with them, but they still are. Or we're told they still are, sometimes. So I move. Uh, I seek leave to table the document from which I've just quoted, which are the letters from Senator Urquhart to Senators Rennick and Antic. Is leave granted? Thank you. Leave I is thank the Senate. Uh, and I would ask the government, after this uh, discussion has concluded, to make a commitment in the chamber that that request, in order to re to ensure that the pairing arrangement remains both intact and beyond reproach, that the arrangements sought in this letter are complied with. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I uh, rise as the Australian Greens whip to uh, make a contribution to this debate. Um, let's be really clear about what happened last night first. Uh, Senator Rennick came into this chamber and placed on the record that there had been 
to use his words, confusion over the pairing arrangements and ask for a vote to be recommitted. Now the government has come in this morning and informed the Senate that they would not be proceeding with any attempt to have that vote recommitted. Now this raises really significant questions about what Senator Rennick said last night, whether that was in fact accurate, whether there was in fact confusion over the pairing arrangements, or whether that was a cover for something else. And I want to make something really clear. In the view of the Australian Greens, recommittals are not mulligans. They're not like a, a second shot you get in golf because you shanked the first one out of play. They are for genuine misadventure, where a senator genuinely couldn't make it to the chamber before the bells stopped ringing, or when there was genuine confusion over the pairing arrangements. That's what recommittals are for. They're not just some free kick to, to have a vote recommitted to buy time to put pressure on senators to change their voting position. That's not what recommittals are for. So, of course, as we said last night, the Greens would have been very happy to consider a recommittal if, in fact, there was genuine confusion over the pairing arrangements. But that case was not made last night by the government. That wasn't made by the government because simply asserting that there has been confusion over the pairing arrangements is not enough of an argument for the Senate to recommit a vote. For clarity, we would have needed to know or sought to know information including exactly what the confusion was. What was the chain of events that led to this asserted confusion over pairing arrangements? Was Senator Rennick actually paired? If so, how was he paired and how did he communicate his, his position on that vote and to whom did he communicate his position on that vote? These are questions that not only all senators but the Australian people deserve answers to, and not just in regards to the vote that the government last night sought to have recommitted, but in fact on all votes that are taken in this Senate. And this episode, along with other recent events, has exposed a genuine weakness in the pairing system in this place, including a lack of transparency and a lack of rigour. And this transparency and this rigour is not just so that we can all have confidence in the pairing arrangements. This is where we make the laws of the country. Legislation in the current Senate has often passed or failed to pass by a single vote. And it goes on to either become law or not to become law as a result. And Senator Hanson Young raised this last night the potential for a High Court challenge into laws on the basis they were not made in accordance with the Constitution. These are incredibly serious matters. And there is a very strong argument for the pairing arrangements to be considered in detail and at length by a committee, for example, the Procedures Committee. Now, I thank Senator Wong for um, placing before the Senate the letters that Senator Urquhart has written, uh, I understand, to Senators Rennick and Antich. And the questions uh, that were contained in those letters that Senator Wong has tabled are extremely important questions uh, for those senators to answer. Extremely important questions. But it's not just um, Senator Re Senators Rennick and Antich that uh, the Australian Greens have uh, concerns about. We also have concerns about for ex uh, uh, the, the voting position of all members when they are engaged in the pairing system and how they communicate 
that position and to whom. And we've seen, um, for example, One Nation in the past vote differently on particular matters that come before this Senate. So our view um, is that uh, there is uh, that, that these episodes of last night and this morning have raised um, significant questions about uh, the robustness and transparency of the pairing system, and our view um, remains very strongly that these matters need to be considered very carefully and at length because they are incredibly serious issues. And it is the view of the Greens that the Procedures Committee would be um, the correct place um, for that to occur. Uh, there may be some further discussion about that this morning. If not, uh, I, I um, simply inform the Senate that the Greens uh, will take under consideration um, a referral to the Privileges Committee on these issues. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Um, well, there have been a, a number of assertions and comments made um, in this place in relation to the pairing arrangements, um, and particularly in relation to the pairing arrangements uh, to, of two government senators. Um, uh, I want to absolutely assure the Senate that um, the, the uh, pairing arrangements that have been reflected in the votes of uh, the last um, few days um, are absolutely consistent. Um, with the, the wishes of those senators, and for the interest of uh, transparency, um, I would like to read into the record uh, the positions of uh, those two senators. Um, so, um, uh, Senator um, Alex Antic has, has written to the Whips, um, and he has sought f to be paired with the government on all non-legislative votes conducted in the Senate chamber. So. Um, uh, and I also refer to um, correspondence that's been received by Senator Gerard Rennick, uh, and he has also sought to be paired with the government on all non-legislative votes. So just to be very clear um, that this is absolutely consistent with the position that has been taken and reflected uh, in the WHIPS um, uh, arrangements over the previous two days and will be uh, reflected in the WHIPS positions in coming days. So, I just want to make sure that we be very clear um, that we are absolutely consistent with the position of those two senators and have been so during the time that they have been seeking those pairs. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. What a shambles this chamber has become under the government's management, under the Morrison-Joyce management. What a shambles. For the past two weeks, we have been hearing threat after threat after threat from Senator Rennick and Senator Antic to withhold their vote from the government unless they got their way. And let's be clear, this is not in the tradition of the Liberal and National parties. We can cross the floor on an issue if we want to. This was an absolute threat to withhold a vote on everything to hold the government to ransom. This goes against the individual conscience approach that the Liberals and Nationals like to crow about, it was an absolute strike. They went on strike, and they threatened it, and they threatened it, and they threatened it, which is how we got to the shambles of last night. And there we had the empty threats laid bare. As Senator Rennick, having told the media he was not for turning, Having told his constituents in Queensland he was absolute, having told this chamber, having told anyone on Facebook, and we know about Senator Rennick's Facebook, don't we? We know about Senator Rennick's Facebook, but that's not the subject of this speech. The subject of this speech is that Senator Rennick has been telling everyone uphill in Downdale that he is not for turning. He will not back the government unless the government overturns vaccine mandates, unless Scott Morrison personally stands up and opposes vaccine mandates. What did we see last night? A somewhat ashen-faced, a somewhat embarrassed, a somewhat disheveled and dissembling Senator Rennick stand up, unable to even articulate why he hadn't voted, what his position was, and whether he was trying to recommit a vote or not. It was an absolute omni-shambles from a government that is splintering in the Senate before our very eyes. 
We saw it on Monday. Five government senators crossed the floor against their own government. And then we saw it again last night with, Gov with Senator Rennick going to water, crumbling before our very eyes, showing he does not have the courage of his convictions, and just seeking, just seeking to recommit a vote. And then we have Senator Antic. Same thing, Senator Antic has been telling everyone, I'm not with the government, I'm not with the government, I'm not with the government, I'm standing firm on vaccine mandates, I'm not for turning, I'm not going to back down until I do. There he was, Chamberlain with his paper this morning, Chamberlain with his email, really, capitulating, capitulating to the Liberal National Whips capitulating away, signing away their individual right to cross the floor by committing themselves to pairing with the government on all non-legislative votes. Give me a break. Either these senators have the courage of their convictions or they do not. And what do we see here today? Now, now it's getting a little more conditional, isn't it? They're all the conditions they're putting on their, uh, their supposed, their supposed um, protest against their own government. Now they're going to go with the government. Now, now Senator Rennick and Senator Antic are going to vote with the government on all non-legislative matters. Come on. And meanwhile, we've got a government that is unwilling to bring on a vote on a legislative matter. How many speakers did this chamber see from the government side yesterday on pieces of national security legislation that clearly had the support of the chamber, that could have been brought on, dealt with, and moved on? We, critical infrastructure. Come on. High-risk terrorist defenders. Come on. They talked these out because they didn't know where their own senators would line up when it came to the legislative vote, and I'll make a prediction here to the chamber, we're going to have another day of talking about legislation that is not controversial, legislation that could pass this chamber today. And why? Because this government doesn't have the courage to bring on a national anti-corruption commission bill. Yeah, yeah. They promised it over a thousand days ago. They're not bringing it on. This government does not have the courage, Mr. President, to bring on its religious discrimination bill. The Prime Minister is going to make a big song and dance in the other place of personally introducing it, but he can't even guarantee that his own team backs it. This is a government that is dissembling before our very eyes. So I think this goes to the debate we are having here today, and I thank those senators who have participated and those who may well. The fact that we've got these two you know, emails now been uh, provided from Senators Antic and Rennick, backing down, dissembling, calling off their general strike against their own government. This just goes to show why we need clarity about pairing arrangements. How can this chamber vote in good conscience, not knowing what the pairing arrangements are? How can the crossbench participate in, in these votes, not knowing what the pairing arrangements are? How can the public understand what the voting intentions and how vote decisions were arrived at in this chamber if it's not transparent what the voting arrangements are? Come on, get your act together over there. It was embarrassing last night. It's embarrassing that you tried to have under Senator Bragg's – well, that was a misadventure, wasn't it, Senator Bragg? His misadventure in striking off on his own to have an inquiry into the ABC's complaint handling process, leading to Ida Buttrose, the chair of the ABC, asking this chamber to suspend or cancel that inquiry until the ABC had a chance to do their own work. Extraordinary move. Almost unprecedented, I imagine. The chair of the ABC asked this chamber to take a decision. We took it yesterday. I acknowledge Senator Hanson Young and Senator Gallagher moved a motion. It was supported by this chamber. 
it was supported by this chamber. And then what do we have? The government that is always intent on attacking the ABC decided last night they would have one more go at attacking the ABC. They would have one more go at disregarding their own hand-picked chair, the ABC, Ida Buttrose. They would ignore her. They would try to recommit a vote. They would try to bring it on. They would try to allow Senator Bragg to continue on his lark of attacking the ABC. Let's be clear. You cannot trust the Morrison government with the ABC. You cannot trust the cuts to the ABC, the political attacks on the ABC, the most trusted source of information in this country, the ABC, and what is the most distrustful government we have seen, a prime minister who can't tell the truth, what do they do? They go about last night in a shambles of an event trying to recommit this vote and reignite their attack on the ABC. You cannot trust them with the ABC. You cannot trust them with pairing arrangements. You cannot trust Senator Antic or Senator Rennick when they say they are going to stri on strike. You cannot even trust the government to get their whipping arrangements right. So let's have some transparency. Let's have some visibility. Let's rebuild some trust in the system here in the, cha in the, in the chamber. Mr. President, I implore you as a new president to ensure that we have that transparency. I employ the chamber to ensure that we have that transparency. Nothing less than our democracy depends on it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I just want to take note of the uh, statement made by the leader of the government tonight, uh, today, which is in stark contrast to the shambles that we saw here last night, only minutes only minutes before uh, this chamber was meant to uh, adjourn, that we saw the government in all chaos having to march Senator Rennick into the chamber, have him grovel to the chamber, asking for a recommittal of a vote that he says he's still confused about. It was like watching a hostage video. And this is what is going on on this side of the chamber, a government in chaos, a prime minister untrustworthy, trying to find everyone else to blame. The renegades can't even get their show in order. They don't know who they're after, but the prime minister has and his government continues to have the ABC in their sights. Well, this chamber didn't accept that yesterday. The Senate did what we should do, and that is to allow an independent process to continue and to not do the bidding of politicians who don't like what journalists report. That's what was going on here. That this chamber last night was about to be asked to set up a witch hunt into the ABC because the Prime Minister doesn't like what the broadcaster reports. On the eve of an election, Mr Scott Morrison and his untrustworthy ways did not want our public broadcaster to report on what his government is up to. If he can't win an election in his own right, well, bad luck. This government has had the ABC in their sights from day dot. Since the moment that Mr Abbott was elected as Prime Minister, he was found out to be misleading, untrustworthy. When on the eve of the election in 2013, he said, oh, we won't cut the ABC's budget only then to cut and slash and burn over $700 million cut from our public broadcaster. The service that tells Australians what's going on in the midst of, our, of the bushfires, the news service that is most trusted when it comes to information about COVID-19. The ABC, our public broadcaster, is the most trusted public institution in this country. It's not the ABC that Australians have a problem with. It's the Prime Minister 
Mr Scott Morrison, who can't be trusted and has a problem with the truth. So I welcome the about face of the leader of the government today to come in and confirm that they won't recommit this vote, because in doing so, they've exposed just what a shamble the government is in, what a plaything they've considered pairing in this place to be. And now we hear that there is going to be uh, commitments to at least recording paired votes in the Hansard. Heavens above, the Australian people might be able to know how senators in this place have exercised their influence, power and vote. I mean, it's beggar's belief that we're in 2021 and it's a breakthrough to have that element of transparency because it's been forced upon them as they've been exposed for trying to manipulate and be sneaky. It's right up there with the characteristics of the Prime Minister, isn't it? We do need to sort out the pairing arrangements in this place, and we do need to make sure there is better transparency and accountability. And I look forward to seeing those reforms come forward. But make no mistake, this government wanted this done last night to continue to attack the ABC, to continue their witch hunt, because the only thing going for the Prime Minister right now is more cover-up of his untruths and his inability to lie straight in bed. Senator Wong. Um, actually, if I do this, I close the debate and Senator Patrick might need to seek leave to speak. I just want to do one minute, which was to make clear to the government, on the basis of the letters we now have received, the chambers have received from Senators Antic and Rennick, which indicates an ongoing pair on non-legislative matters. I want to make crystal clear to the chamber the opposition will not grant pairs for those two senators for legislation in the absence of written instructions. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Just, uh, just in response, uh, the reason that, uh, that Senator Ruston uh, read uh, those pair instructions into the record in the Senate uh, following their provision uh, to the government whip as well as uh, to the opposition whip uh, was to ensure that that was transparent and clear in the interests of all senators and the interests of, uh, of the two senators involved as well. Uh, you will need to seek leave. Yeah, I, I seek leave to make a two-minute statement uh, in relation to the that previous debate. Being no objection, leave is granted. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to put on the record this is not just about, in my view, uh, Senators Rennick and, and Senator Antic. There is just a general masking of senators' intentions. There are, there are different ways in which we can influence the out outcome of a vote. One of them is to sit in the chamber on the yes or no side. Another way is to abs uh, absent yourself. And another way is to pair yourself. And, it, and uh, all of that influences the outcome of the vote. And it is the pairing that masks the absentee. It is pairing that masks um, uh, other, other voters. So, for example, um, this is not a criticism. Senator Hanson, Senator um, Roberts are not in the chamber, so it's impossible to see how they are exercising their vote through a pair unless you go and ask the whips. Over the last couple of days, I've had journalists call me and say, "How did uh, Senator Hanson vote?" And I say, "Actually, I don't even know." And we, we just have to be transparent. We have to find a mechanism uh, to enable that to happen. And I do understand that uh, the leader of the opposition and the leader of the government in the Senate are now uh, engaging in a, a bit of background discussion to work out how that uh, should happen. Uh, and uh, Senator Waters and I will also seek to have whatever is agreed and form in, informally formalised through the procedure committee. Thank you. I will now put the question, uh, the, the motion that uh, the Senate take note of uh, the response from Senator Birmingham. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. All right. So we'll move back to the order of business. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr. President, Mr. President documents are, are tabled as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for the committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any 
Senator. Senator Keneally. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of General Business's Notice of Motion 1269 as circulated in the Chamber. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted. Uh, to contingent stand notice standing in the name of Senator Wong, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as to prevent me from moving the motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that general business notice of motion 1269 may be called upon immediately, have precedence over government business, and if not finally considered by midday, the question shall be put and determined without amendment. In seeking to debate this motion today, I am calling for true leadership from the Prime Minister and the government he supposedly leads. I call for everyone in this parliament, both in this place and in the other chamber, to urgently and without qualification condemn the violence that we are seeing in Australia. What we have seen at protests over the last few weeks has been shocking. It has been utterly appalling. It has been without precedent in modern times in this country. A swift rebuke of these violent threats should be easy. But that's not what we have seen from Mr. Morrison. What we've seen is a bet each way, a prime minister talking out both sides of his mouth because the prime minister is, at his heart, just an ad man who wants nothing more than to sell a product. And that product is himself. There are few limits that Mr. Morrison will place on his own ambition to keep his own job. He's pandered to violent extremists because he sees value in their vote. And he relies on the support of their proxies in this parliament to hold up his government. It's not enough to clinically cloak your words in the democratic language of debate, protest, choice and truth. Well, those around you are plain and brain with violent threats, parading gallows through the streets, threatening murder and violence. Now, peaceful protest, considered and informed debate, a free and fair media are all, of course, important and cherished pillars of our democracy. These are core tenets of our society, and they must be protected. But instead, they're being sold up the river by a small group in this parliament who seek to undermine them. And the violence being described, encouraged and threatened that I encourage us all to condemn today, the frenzied abuse that is being hurled at health workers and experts, reporters, elected representatives, their staff and their families. I move that we condemn the graphic threats of violence encouraged by the comments on social media posts of government MPs who do nothing to remove or dissuade these threats. Two days in a row, I have asked the leader of the government in this chamber what the government is doing about specific threats that are being made in response to Mr. Christensen's social media posts, and two days in a row, I have had no answer. This is more than negligence. This is more than irresponsible. It is actually dangerous. Anger is virulent in person and in online. And as a democracy, we in Australia are learning in real time that disinformation, that fear and that anger can create a potent rage. There are those here, sadly, unfortunately, in this parliament, elected MPs who have stoked anger and rage because they know it yields them attention and relevance and profit at the ballot box but at what cost to our democracy? Fear and rage mixed together create something toxic in a democracy. And let us remember what is all at stake here. In January, in the United States, we saw that protest can spontaneously combust and become deadly. Our parliamentary colleagues in the United Kingdom know only too well that they are made vulnerable by their public accessibilities. Two of their members having been murdered by extremists. Our Senate colleague, Senator Lambie, said that we all have freedom to make choices, but not freedom for choices to be without consequences. And so what are the consequences of creating fear and fury in your followers <coughs> to deploy tactics of terror and intimidation? 
In our service to the people of Australia, we have a responsibility as elected representatives, and that is to make clear the boundaries of responsible debate and discourse. That is to refuse to associate with extremists who peddle falsehoods and intimidation. That is to draw back from this moment to urge calm, to restore respect before it is too late. We need this moment, true leadership, not political spin. The Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, has shown none of that. He has only condemned with qualification where he seeks to wink and nod and show sympathy to the violent protesters. Let us be clear. In this place of democracy, we must give an unequivocal condemnation, and we must unite this country in order to protect it. Senator Mr Acting Deputy President, <clears throat> just yesterday, I stood in this chamber in question time and asked the leader of the government in here whether he would or whether the prime minister would condemn far-right extremism. And what I got was the usual waffle, the usual sitting on the fence. Yes, sure, we condemn all kinds of extremism. That is absolute rubbish. That is bullshit. You are putting people's lives in danger. That's what you are doing. And you know what? This is nothing new. What we saw on the weekend, um, the far-right extremists on the streets again, who have embedded themselves in anti-lockdown and anti-vaccination organizing, far-right extremism in this country is not new. There are people of color, especially women of color, who have faced this abuse, these threats, this violence, for a very long time. People like Senator Thorpe, Senator Cox, and myself, and there are others as well. But yet, there is such a reluctance from this government to even utter the <laughs> words far-right extremism. Well, it exists. And you saw it blatantly on the streets on the weekend. But it has been blatant in social media, through people's emails, for a very long time. You can't even utter the words anti-racism. That's how terrible you are in stoking division and fear within communities. Because all you want out of this is to harvest votes, to stay in power, and keep doing the crap that you are doing for years now. You know, right-wing politicians that is the truth. Right-wing politicians in this place have fueled far-right extremism, they have fueled racism, and they have created an environment that is ripe for even further growth of the far-right by mainstreaming their dangerous ideologies and enabling far-right groups to recruit more members. We know now that ASIO up to 50% of their domestic counterterrorism caseload relates to what you like to call ideologically motivated violent extremism because you can't bring yourself to say far right extremism. There was a, a big report by the nine papers uh, just a few months ago, Nazis Next Door, which alerted us to the really terrible truths about the growing threat of far right extremism and white supremacy. I guess the reports were shocking, but not entirely surprising to those of us who have followed the, far, the rise of the far right closely and are impacted by its deadly consequences. And we did see those deadly consequences in Christchurch, where 51 innocent Muslims were brutally murdered by an Australian man because you refuse to stand up and condemn far right extremism. Develop a backbone, do the right thing, and condemn far-right extremism today. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to make a contribution on behalf of government senators to Senator Keneally's motion, and I do so <coughs> wearing a couple of different relevant hats. The first is as the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, currently leading an inquiry into extremism and radicalism, and it is an issue which I and I know all members of the PJCIS take very seriously. 
We have worked very closely with our intelligence, security and law enforcement agencies on what is unfortunately a growing and serious threat to the safety and freedom and security of all Australians. And I look forward to, hopefully in a bipartisan way, handing down a report that makes constructive suggestions as to how we can all tackle this threat together. But I don't think it's fair, as Senator Keneally and others have in this debate, to besmirch the government's intentions or the seriousness with which it takes these issues. The government has, earlier this year, for the first time, listed a far-right organisation, the Sonnenkrieg Division, as a terrorist organisation under our criminal code, as it should. And when handing down that report in this chamber, I called upon the government to carefully consider whether any other far-right organisations met the threshold for terrorist listing, and I look forward to further developments in that space very soon. The second relevant hat that I wear for this debate is as Deputy Chair of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19. And as we know, much of the protests, much of the anxiety, much of the heat around this debate has been related to the pandemic the public health restrictions that have been brought in to combat the pandemic and vaccination. And in that role, I have consistently supported the vaccine rollout and encouraged Australians to come forward as soon as possible to be vaccinated with the vaccine that they are eligible for uh, as soon as possible. Unlike some other people in this place who have uh, sought to disparage certain brands of vaccines to undermine the vaccine rollout, I have consistently supported it. But the third and most important hat that I wear in contributing to this debate is as a Senator for Victoria. Because as a Senator for Victoria, I represent uh, Australia's and the world's most locked down city. Uh, 250 days of hard lockdown in Melbourne has had an <coughs> enormous impact on the people of Victoria and the people of Melbourne. And we should not lightly dismiss the impact that that has on people's wellbeing, on their mental health on the more than 200 days of schooling that young people have missed, on the employment opportunities that people have missed out on, on the small businesses have, that have closed. And in the context of that lockdown, it is not surprising that there are many Victorians from all walks of life who are anxious about the Victorian state government's pandemic bill and the powers which it grants that state government. It's not surprising that more than 60 leading QCs, the Law Institute and other uh, eminent bodies in Victoria have raised profound and serious concerns with that law and the impact that that would have on civil liberties. And it's not surprising that many Victorians, in response to that law and the way in which the Andrews government is trying to <coughs> ram it through the parliament, have taken to the streets in protest to, uh, to put forward their concerns. Let me be very clear. It is totally and utterly unacceptable to ever threaten political violence. It is never an acceptable tactic. And I wish Senator Keneally was right when she said that it is without precedent. But unfortunately, it is not without precedent in this country. There have, also, there have been other threats of violence uh, in, the, in the pursuit of political goals uh, in not too distant memory. And I wish that it was only in the context of the COVID pandemic and mandatory vaccination and other issues that members of parliament and senators and their staff and their families had been threatened, had been harassed, had been bullied, had been stalked. But we know that it isn't the only context in which this has happened. You only have to ask Nicole Flint, the member for Boothby, about her experience at the last election, where a man was charged with stalking her uh, in, that la in that election, where her, her office was vandalised, where her staff were threatened, where they were made to feel unsafe doing their job working for a member of parliament. Unfortunately, this is not without precedent. Unfortunately, when those incidents have happened in the past, it has not been condemned in an unqualified way by people in this chamber. And perhaps the most galling contribution made so far is that of Senator Faruqi, given the association of the Greens political party with Extinction Rebellion, who not only vandalised this building, set a pram on, on, on fire at the front of it and vandalised the lodge, but regularly make threats against members of parliament, their staff, and make them feel unsafe. Senator, Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, seriously, uh, what a complete disgrace the Morrison government is. Sowing distrust in our country today, sowing division in our country today. Uh, and in times like this, in challenging times, 
when so much has been asked of Australians to get through this crisis, at a time when so many Australians have pulled together and done the right thing to keep this community safe, at times like this, what we actually need is real leadership. We need real leadership from our national government. We need clear leadership. We need unequivocal leadership. Uh, and instead, what we have is Prime Minister Morrison and his double speak. His double speak. We have today a Prime Minister who is actively sowing distrust. We have a Prime Minister today who is actively fermenting division in our country today. We have a Prime Minister who is flirting, flirting with the violent protesters in Melbourne. Our own Prime Minister today is giving comfort to protesters who are threatening violence to our political leaders in Victoria, in Melbourne. And he is doing that with his double speak. He speaks out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. Yes, out of one side of his mouth, he is condemning the violent protesters. Uh, and from the other side of his mouth, he is using their very words, their very words, and projecting them onto the national stage, giving those words, giving those violent protesters comfort today. He is telling everyone what they are saying, that it's time for government to get out of people's lives, he is saying, using the words of the protesters themselves. He is sympathising with their frustration, sympathising that over the last couple of years governments have gone too far telling Australians what to do, using their words, projecting them onto the national stage as the Prime Minister of this country. What a complete disgrace. Well, let's talk about exactly what is going on in Victoria today, because it is real. What is going on in Victoria today is affecting real people. It is affecting our political leaders. It is also affecting our essential workers, because these are the protesters that, during the pandemic, went to health clinics, went to our nurses who were vaccinating people, vaccinating homeless people in Melbourne, and spat on them spat on them for doing their job to keep people vaccinated, to keep people safe. Nurses in Melbourne's CBD. What a complete disgrace. And these protesters have now gone the next step, and they have stood out the front of our parliament in Victoria with gallows. With gallows. They've stood out the front of our parliament in Victoria with fake nooses chanting, hang Dan Andrews, hang Dan Andrews. Premiers Dan Andrews and Premier McGowan have both received death threats. The families of parliamentarians have been targeted. And this is not our way. This is not our way. And the Australian Prime Minister, the highest elected leader, the highest office holder in our land, must be clear. He must be unequivocal. He must give no comfort to this form of political violence. And he has not been clear because he has flirted with these protesters. He has given comfort to these protesters. And this cannot be how you win a political debate in Australia today. There are no grey lines here. There are no grey lines. There is no room for speaking out of both sides of your mouth. The Prime Minister needs to lead from the front and from the top of this country. He needs to condemn these violent protesters unequiv unequivocally and without reservation. This is wrong. It must be condemned, and it must be condemned clearly and unequivocally by the Prime Minister. Now, all of this is happening, all of the distrust, all of the division, all of the chaos is happening at a time when Australians are overwhelmingly doing the right thing, when Australians have stood together and protected each other, when they deserve a brighter future and a Senator better Prime Minister. Walsh, thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, while Senator Cormann was the leader of the government in the Senate, quite often I would attend citizenship ceremonies and I would point out what a terrific thing it was in our country 
that both the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate were born overseas and yet came to this country and managed to reach two of the highest political places, two of the highest political positions uh, in this country. And I'd use that as an example of what a special country we are. You can come from all over the world, come from places where political violence is endemic, where people are discriminated against, persecuted, put in jail simply for their political beliefs. And yet those who are moving this motion here today seeking seeking to unite seeking to unite that's what they say they're doing seeking to unite all we hear is a torrent of of abuse and questioning of our prime minister's motives and general reflections upon all government members is that how you seek is that how you seek if you were bona fide if you were bona fide about uniting the people of this country would you do it would you do it by attacking in a very personal way the Prime Minister of this country? No, you would not. No, you would not. This isn't, we didn't hear from Senator Keneally, Lincoln's first inaugural speech, appealing to the better angels of our character. Absolutely not. We heard a torrent of personal abuse directed against our Prime Minister. That's what we heard. That's what we heard from Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally is not seeking to unite Australians. She's seeking to leverage off a straw man she's constructed in order to attack our Prime Minister. That is what she's doing through the course of this motion. She's not seeking to unite Australians. And Senator Faruqi, I'm extraordinarily, through you, Acting Deputy President, I'm, I'm extraordinarily disappointed with the broad-ranging assertions you cast upon all government members. Can I say to you, I've attended mosques which have been graffitied, which have been attacked. I've attended those mosques with other people of my party, stood with those people in the face of discrimination, in the face of persecution. And it is very, very disappointing that again, seeking to unite us, seeking to unite us, you come in here, you come right. in here and seek to tar everyone on this side of the chamber with the same brush. This is how you seek to unite. Listen to it. Listen to Order. it now. The interjections from Senator Thorpe. Is that how you seek to unite, Senator Thorpe? You're bringing us together with your considered interjections. You're bringing, and Senator McKim, you're going to seek to unite us as well by attacking me as I draw to this place's attention the fact that by the very motion you're seeking to unite us with, you are dividing us. You are dividing us. You are playing politics. You've constructed a straw man constructed a straw man and then you've sought to conflate. You have sought to conflate. Here they are. They're uniting us. Order. Look at it, Mr Acting Deputy President. Here they are uniting us, bringing us all together, binding our wounds, as, as President Lincoln said in his second inaugural speech. Binding our wounds, are you? Binding our wounds. No, you're playing politics. Base politics. Not seeking to unite us. You're seeking to divide us with this motion. And we would expect better of you, Senator Keneally, as someone who was a Premier of the great state of New South Wales. You are seeking to divide us, conflating our Prime Minister with despicable extremists. You should know better. And Senator Faruqi, please reflect. Please reflect on the fact that members of the government don't fit your caricature. Do not fit your caricature. Here we are, uniting. We're uniting, are we, everyone? Order. We're uniting. Listen to it. Listen to it. Order. We're uniting, are we? Senator Keneally, is this what you wanted? Of course it's what you wanted. Because you wanted to divide. You didn't Order. seek you didn't seek to exercise good faith in terms of your assessment of our Prime Minister. You sought to use this for partisan political processes. Here's Senator Thorpe, you're uniting us, are you, Senator Order. Thorpe? You're uniting us, are you? Senator Scar. Are you uniting Senator us? Senator Scar, please direct your Questions through the chair. Through you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Senator Thorpe's uniting us with her consistent interjections. I wouldn't have thought so. Here we are, the, the usual moderate language in Senator Thorpe's interjections. Uniting all Australians. Uniting all Australians. I don't think so. This motion, which was calling for unity, was actually all about division. I'm going to go to Leave's not granted. No. No. 
just confer with the clerk. Thank you. Uh, what you couldn't you say it the first time. You're not yeah. the Sorry. Yeah. Is leave granted for Senator Keneally to yeah. make a short statement? Yeah. Yeah. Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator Scar did seek to subscribe several motives to my reason for bringing this motion before the chamber today. I'd like to advise Senator Scar before he leaves the chamber that I brought this motion before the parliament today in part because I personally am the subject of threats from Order. and has been Order. confirmed as has been confirmed by the ASIO director general. And those types of threats towards me towards, I know, other members of this chamber, towards elected premiers, uh, towards elected representatives, and towards our, our health workers, our media, and our community, as demonstrated by those threats in those Melbourne protests, they worry me. I am concerned that somebody in this chamber, either on their side, our side, or any side, is going to be attacked. And if we don't have a condemnation from the Prime Minister, that's what's at risk. Order. I believe Senator Steele John would like to have the call. Senator Steele John. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Leadership is about setting expectations uh, and setting boundaries. It's about bringing people with you in a process of change. It's about clearly articulating beliefs um, and the importance of working together to achieve change. In a, in a political context, uh, it is fundamentally about representing and championing those expectations and boundaries on behalf of community um, in critical decision-making spaces and bringing community um, along in a process of change. All the time being incredibly conscious of the cultural implications of actions. Because if you are in uh, a decision-making space that is empowered uh, by the community to shape lives and outcomes for, for people and planet, the way that you act in that space has a cultural impact beyond that space. Now, in the last eight years of this government's time in office, we have seen again and again the Liberal Party, uh, when given the opportunity to show leadership, um, to exercise power, uh, when given the choice to exercise that power in the uh, effort, in the project um, of calling out racism, of calling out violence, of calling out uh, political uh, methods and political discourses in the community which are causing harm to people uh, either remain silent or indeed give conscious or unconscious permission to those discourses and those actions which are causing people harm. So many times in the life of this government, particularly in relation to the comments of far-right individuals that have ended up in this place or have been contributing either in the national decision-making spaces or in state-based decision-making spaces when the opportunity has been given to the government to demonstrate that they are willing to reflect a community expectation that these actions, this rhetoric, this racism, this absolutely repulsive, violent rhetoric be rejected they have either kept their mouths shut or given permission to it. And we have seen in relation to this latest wave, and this is not the first, during their time in government, there have been from Fraser Anning onwards, time and time again, where racism of the vilest nature, often directed towards my colleagues, often directed towards Senators Thorpe and Senators Faruqi and Senator Cox, those uncalled out by this government. I know all too well uh, from my conversations with my colleagues the absolute and abhorrent violence that they are subject to 
every single day. When the Prime Minister or members of this government speak in this place, or indeed fail to speak in this place, the result is that members of our community are put in harm's way. Now, we have seen over the last few weeks the result of months of building, of far-right organising in the community that has been well reported on by those investigating it, as individuals have sought to exploit members of the community to justify and build to political ends which are ultimately racist in nature. Now, the Prime Minister was given an opportunity over the last few weeks, finally, to break that pattern of permission and to clearly call it out. And he has failed to do that. And the result of that failure is that nurses, the people on the front line of this pandemic, and people in the decision-making spaces of this nation are now being Order. subject Senator to Senator Steele, John, your time views. has expired. The time for the debate has expired. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Eyes pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the eyes. Senator Dean Smith, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 25. The question is resolved in the negative. We will return to the order of business. I will need the deputy president, as we will be in committee, but I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one. Independent. Yeah, that was suspension. Sorry. Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill 2021 in committee. Oh, Matt, sorry. Matt. Order. Okay, if you're not participating in this debate, I encourage you to maybe consider moving elsewhere. Okay, the committee is considering the independent sorry, independent <laughs> the, sorry, the independent national security legislation monitor amendment bill twenty twenty one and amendments on sheets one to four, uh, one four two four moved by Senator Patrick I leave. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Senator Patrick, you said. Yes, so I just want to, uh, 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 noting uh, I'm in continuation, just to refresh people as to what uh, the amendment is about. Uh, we have had a series of uh, reports coming from uh, Insulin, whether it be uh, the former uh, Mr. Rennick, uh, uh, Mr. Rennick SC, uh, indeed the current. Uh, or oh, sorry, the previous, the one prior to that, basically suggesting that it's no good having Insulin conduct a review, do a report, it goes to government, and government doesn't respond. There needs to be a continuous feedback process such that uh, uh, that, that we have a progression in respect of his uh, in respect of his uh, recommendations. Um, what my amendment does is, re is require the government simply to respond within a timely, uh, timely uh, period uh, and uh, gives the mechanism for uh, the government to respond in a classified way and also in an unclassified way back through the parliament. So uh, that's the, the fundamentals of my amendment. Uh, it seems uh, quite absurd to have a situation where the government uh, receives a report and then sits on it and does nothing. Uh, this amendment is a request uh, 
articulated in all of the previous if you go back through all the previous annual reports of, of Insulum, it's a request of Insulum to, uh, to, uh, to have their reports dealt with uh, with the government response. Uh, and of course, it, it is proper for the Parliament to see those responses, uh, uh, accepting that there may be the need for a classified version. So uh, I um, commend my amendment to the Senate. Senator Brown. Thank you. Labor will not be supporting the amendment. It's very important that reports by the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor are considered and responded to by governments. Far too often, the current government has not responded to reports and recommendations by the Monitor, either in a timely manner or sometimes at all. The Monitor has been tasked by this parliament with reviewing the operation, effectiveness and implications of Australia's counter-terrorism and national security legislation. So when the monitor makes a recommendation, it is no small thing, and it warrants a response. In this comprehensive review, in his comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community, former ASIO Director General Dennis Richardson recommended that, and I quote, as a matter of good practice, the government should provide a publicly available response to the Insulin's recommendations within 12 months of the report being tabled in Parliament. However, uh, end quote. However, it is important to note that Mr. Richardson fell short of recommending that this requirement be legislated. While Labor has a lot of sympathy for Senator Patrick's amendment, we are not persuaded that the departure from Mr. Richardson's recommendation is warranted. I should also add that the government has indicated that it does not support Senator Patrick's amendment, and what that means is that even, in this, even if this amendment were to pass the Senate today, it would be rejected by the House of Representatives, oh, and the passage of this important bill would be further delayed. Labor supports this bill and the government's <coughs> amendments, all of which were suggested by Labor and following negotiations were agreed to by the government, and we would like to see the bill passed as soon as possible. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, the government doesn't support the amendments that have been circulated by Senator Patrick. The government endeavours to respond to reports and recommendations made by the Monitor as soon as it is practicable to do so. Reports of the Monitor can raise really complex policy and legal questions that require and indeed deserve detailed consideration, consultation and review. Where that's the case, it often takes more than 12 months for the government to formally work through and respond to those matters, given that recommendations can affect agencies right across the national intelligence community and their portfolio departments. It's not a small thing to do, but even done with diligence, that can take some time. This position is consistent with that taken in response to recommendations made by the former monitor in his annual reports and also by the comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community. That said, the government does appreciate the intent of these amendments and will continue to advise parliament of its response to recommendations that are made by the monitor as soon as possible. We will also continue to review formal reporting timeframes into the future to make sure this is something for which we are always driving for better and better performance. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm quite disappointed, um, particularly with Labor, uh, in not supporting this. I mean, you say that uh, Dennis Richardson uh, has uh, recommended against this and therefore you're not going to support it. Let me tell you, Dennis Richardson has also suggested that the PJCIS not, not look into operational matters, but you've got a bill in place that, that uh, suggests that ought to happen. And I support that. So it's, it's just a duplicitous. You stand up and go, look, we're sympathetic to the view. This is not my view, this is the view of the monitor. The persistent view of the monitor. And in fact the Law Council also Made, uh, uh, you know, basically started off with this recommendation because they could see problems with it. And again, we see the Labor Party standing up saying, you know what, we're not going to support this because it's going to go back to the other place and, uh, uh, and, and they won't uh, support it there. Then it'll have to come back. You know what, when it comes back, we'll reject it. If the government really cares about national security, they'll end up supporting the motion. 
It's that classic game that uh, the Liberal Party play with the Labor Party. It's called chicken, and Labor always swerves. It's, 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 it just shows you uh, exactly what not being a, uh, a strong opposition is all about. Now, I think you're probably going to get elected, but it's not going to be through your strength. It's going to be because, on the other side of the chamber, things are just so much worse. And that may well be your strategy. But the Labor Party ought to stand up, ought to recognise this. You say you're sympathetic to it. It is a recommendation of the Monitor himself. Just very disappointing. That's all I can say. Thank you. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. Aye. Noes have it. Noes have it. Uh, beg your pardon. I'd like to obviously indicate I was supporting my own amendment. Sure. Sorry, Acting Deputy President, if I might, could I have the, um, yes. the Australian Greens position as supporting Senator Patrick's amendment recorded? Indeed. Okay, so the question now is that the bill be amended. Uh, sorry, the bill as amended be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Uh, the question is now is that the bill be reported. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The committee has considered the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill 2021 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be moved a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, call the clerk. Thank you. A bill for an act to amend the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Act 2010 and for related purposes. Government business orders of the day number two, dental benefits amendment bill 2021, second reading debate. Senator Brown. Thank you. Uh, in August 2012, the Gillard Labor government introduced the dental health reform package to the Australian people. A key part of this package was the child dental benefits schedule, delivering means-tested financial support for dental services for children between 2 and 17 years of age. Families with children from 2 to 17 years years old receiving benefits such as family tax benefit part A, the parenting payment, the double, double orphan pension, a carer payment and other benefits are eligible for the child dental benefit. It provides over $1,000 over a two-year period to cover dental services such as examinations, routine cleaning, feelings and root canals. Since Labor introduced re this reform, it has provided over $2.3 billion in benefits and delivered more than 38 million services to over 3 million Australian children. 3 million Australian children have avoided worsening physical and mental health impacts from untreated dental conditions thanks to this program, with massive flow-on benefits for their families, their communities and broader Australian society, including the government's bottom line from av avoided downstream medical costs. This reform, under the Gillard government and led by the member for Sydney, who was then the health minister, was a great reform, and it's delivering great health outcomes to millions of children and teenagers across Australia. It was informed by a great amount of evidence presented by the Dental Advisory Group that was chaired by the formidable former public servants Mary Murnane. It was informed by some of the very disturbing evidence from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, that great institution, the AIHW, which showed that as many as 42 per cent of five-year-olds had decay in their baby teeth and as many as 61 per cent of nine-year-olds had decay in their baby teeth and in a permanent 
feature of poor oral health. As many as 58 per cent of 14-year-olds had decay in their adult teeth, Acting Deputy President. This is a great Labor legacy. It is a great demonstration of what a government focused on working to make Australians' lives easier can achieve. This bill represents an important extension to a great Labor legacy. But this is a legacy which, over eight long years of this government, has been threatened repeatedly by a Liberal Party that has never fully supported this reform. That threat is consistent with years and years of the Liberal party op Party's opposition to Labor's introduction of Medibank and then Medicare. The Child Dental Benefits Scheme was not immune from the Liberal Party attempts to cut health services for Australians, and it remains in place due to the efforts of Labor and, in particular, the member for Ballarat, having consistently fought attempts by this government over their eight long years to abolish or to cut the scheme. It was, it was when the current Prime Minister was Treasurer that the government intended to cut the scheme entirely. And while Labor successfully opposed that attempt to abolish the scheme, the Liberal government then brought before the parliament a proposal to cut by 30 per cent the payments which would be received by children and to teenagers under the scheme. Rather than the $1,000 payment the scheme provides for, it was proposed by the current Prime Minister, who was Treasurer at the time, Acting Deputy President, that this payment be cut to just $700. It's unbelievable. This attack on the dental benefits scheme was also successfully opposed by Labor, led by the Shadow Health Minister, the member for Ballarat, Ms King. We're very glad the government has persisted in attempts to, to cut or abolish this scheme hasn't persisted in attempts to cut or abolish this scheme and has now been converted to actually expanding its scope. This bill represents a welcome reform to the dental benefits schedule and Labor supports it as an extension of Labor's past legacy. The bill extends coverage of the dental benefits schedule to children from birth to 17 years old, removing the lower age limit on eligibility. It is well known and accepted that parents promoting and practising good oral hygiene with children from a young age will aid in the prevention of more serious dental decay and associated health impacts as they grow up. The bill will help to deliver a positive initial dental experience for more Australian kids and help to curb the unfortunate negative stigma around dental practitioners and oral hygiene. As a result of this change, each year an additional 300,000 Australian children aged between zero and two will become eligible for the dental benefits schedule. From 1 January 2022, it is estimated that each year 15 per cent of children in this newly eligible age group—45,000 children per year—will now be able to, at, to and will access the dental benefits schedule. That is 45,000 kids with better oral health and better physical and mental health as a result. It means up to 45,000 families with fewer worries about being able to pay for the dental care their kids need. And it means 45,000 kids with a better relationship, experience and view of dentists, having been exposed to a dentist early in life with benefits flowing through the rest of their lives. That is why Labor supports this bill and commends it to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Stilljohn, you're seeking the call. Can you hear us? Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Greens support the Dental uh, Benefits Amendment Bill 2021. However, uh, we believe that this bill could uh, go much further uh, to enable people, uh, indeed more members of our community, to access dental care under Medicare. And I want to flag um, at the outset of my contribution, um, that we will be moving an amendment to this bill, which will seek to expand access uh, to the dental benefit scheme. Our amendment would remove eligibility criteria, allowing children and ad adults to access free dental care when and where they need it. Uh, now, I think it's really important before I go any further to, to place this uh, legislation before us today, the scheme that it seeks to 
uh, modify. And the overall question of publicly uh, funded uh, dental care in its proper uh, context. Um, the the Denticare scheme, as it is commonly known in the community, is a proud uh, Greens achievement. Uh, it is a legacy of a period of power sharing uh, between 2010 and 2013, um, and it is a program that I am uh, really proud of uh, personally, and which I know has done so much good for members of our community. It seeks to address um, at its core um, one of the great kind of gaps in our publicly funded medical system. We can be really proud of the Medicare system here um, in Australia. It is one of the better public health systems in the world. And yet it suffers from a, a, a really uh, nonsensical gap, which is to say that it looks at the human body uh, and takes into account the fact uh, that most uh, human beings will need some kind of publicly funded support in relation to our health um, that affects most parts of our bodies um, and indeed our mental health. Uh, and yet when it comes uh, to the mouth, the teeth, um, our publicly funded medical system uh, suddenly doesn't seem to register uh, the existence of the mouth on the human body. It doesn't cover it in any great or meaningful way. And that is a disconnect uh, that means that many in our community are not able to get the support they need for a basic uh, continual medical need that they have, which is to have good, high quality dental care. Now, the Dendicare scheme as currently exists um, gives people an ability to access publicly uh, funded uh, dental care uh, between the ages of two um, and 18, and this amendment before the Senate today uh, seeks to move that eligibility criteria down to enable uh, people between the ages of zero and 18 to access publicly funded uh, dental treatment. And that is a good thing. People should be able to use their uh, Medicare card uh, to go to the dentist, just like you can for so many other vital uh, procedures and health-based supports. But we can't stop there. The reality is that the mouth is not something, teeth are not things, which spring into existence between the ages of zero and 18 and then vanish for the rest of people's lives. Dental care and dental-based supports are things which are needed through the entirety of somebody's life. That is the reality. And our policy settings should meet that reality. We should enable all people to access uh, affordable dental care under the Medicare system. They should be properly funded and supported uh, to get that work and that support and those services because we know the transformational impacts that access to those supports uh, provide to people and conversely uh, the terrible uh, impact of not being able to access those supports. And that is the case so much for so many uh, in our community. Um, to drill down in, in a little bit more detail on this, there's been a recent survey um, in the electorate of Griffiths um, where people have had the opportunity to share the impact of the currently very constricted system uh, has on them. Basically, what impact does the absence of publicly funded dental care under Medicare have on people's lives? And the results are, are really quite stark and I think take a clear picture of the problem here and the impact that it is having on people. Some 86% of respondents um, had delayed seeing the dentist because of cost. Um, the average amount people uh, spent in their most recent dental bill so this is just in their most recent dental bill, was $809. Now that is the best part of $1,000. That is not money that most people just have lying around. That is a real financial impact on individuals, on families, on communities. And the longest period in this survey that a respondent had skipped seeing a dentist because of cost was some 20 years. Can you imagine what it feels like 
to sit in agony with an unresolved dental issue for two decades. It is beyond belief that in Australia, with all of the riches which are so uh, effectively siphoned off by corporate Australia and the billionaire class, that we sit here in 2021 uh, with a publicly funded healthcare system which does not recognise the basic reality that people have teeth and they need to be cared for. It, it is an absolute disgrace that this is the reality in 2021 and the amendment offered by the Greens today gives uh, both sides of politics, uh, Labour and the Liberal Party, the opportunity to join with the Greens in correcting this problem in giving people access to the support that they need, making sure that nobody has to endure the terrible pain and discomfort that comes from poor dental health, that every child, that every teenager, that every adult, that every older Australian is able to get access to dental support, to dental care when and where they need it without having to worry about whether they have enough money saved in the bank to enable them to do it. We know that this will have so many good, positive effects on our community. We know that it will support people uh, to be active in the community. We, will know, we know that it will support people uh, to pursue different career paths and goals, to do different types of work, uh, to be active members of their community, and to live life free of pain which should be the basic expectation of all people in our community. Now, these changes can be so easily funded by making the big uh, corporate entities that have made billions, if not tens of billions, through the course of this pandemic, pay their fair share of tax, while at the same time making sure that we do not waste tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars on unnecessary defence expenditures and on tax uh, measures which seek to put more money in the hands of people like Gina Reinhart and Clive Palmer. All these things are possible. The amendment offered before the Senate today enables the Labour and Liberal Party to get on board with a position which the Greens have been advocating for decades which is that Medicare should cover your mouth. You should be able to get uh, support for your uh, dental health through Medicare, regardless of your age. And you should be able to do so in a way that enables you to think solely of the medical support you need, not what is currently the balance of your bank account. I, I commend uh, the amendment to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Steele John. A Senator Askew. President, I rise today to make a brief contribution in support of the Dental Benefits Amendment Bill 2021, which was introduced to the House of Representatives on 4 August this year. The Dental Benefits Amendment Bill amends the Dental Benefits Act 2008 to allow eligible children to access the child dental benefits schedule from birth. It delivers on the government's 2021-22 budget commitment to lower the age eligibility restrictions in the child dental benefits schedule and is based on recommendations from the report on the fourth review of the Dental Benefits Act 2008, as well as extensive stakeholder feedback. While this amendment is minor, it allows any eligible child aged under 18 years to access dental care. As a parent, and now recently a grandparent, I appreciate how important this amendment is and know it will allow children to start a positive relationship with dental health professionals earlier in their lives. Positive dental experiences for children early on will instil the importance of good oral hygiene at a young age. It will also stop the negative stigma around dental practitioners, which could be reinforced if initial dental experiences require serious treatments. Healthy teeth, mouth and gums are all important aspects for a person's general health and well-being. Good dental health means you can eat, drink and speak without pain or discomfort. Dental health has been something successive Australian governments have made a focus over the past three decades. Adding fluoride to drinking water has helped reduce tooth decay in both children and adults, 
but statistics from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare show we can still improve. For example, in Australia, three in ten people delay or avoid seeing a dentist because of the cost. One in four children aged between five and ten years have untreated decay in their baby teeth, and one in 25 people aged 15 and over have no natural teeth left. The Commonwealth works with state and territory governments to fund dental services, like the Child Dental Benefits Schedule, to improve dental health. Each of these governments has agreed to the National Oral Health Plan 2015 to 24, with the goal of improving health and wellbeing across the Australian population by improving oral health status and reducing the burden of poor oral health. This plan sets out six foundation areas. Oral health promotion, covering a range of initiatives to reduce the occurrence and impact of oral disease, such as community water fluoridation. Accessibility of oral health services, and I note that in my home state of Tasmania, oral health services, Tasmania services 29 clinics across the state. Systems alignment and integration, integrating oral and general health systems supplied by public, private and non-government organisations to improve effectiveness and health outcomes. Safety and quality, the National Oral Health Plan argues for stronger consumer engagement in developing performance standards and collaborative monitoring of outcomes. Workforce, and having the capacity to meet the community's needs for prevention and treatment of poor oral health now and in the future, including in locations where oral health services are needed. And finally, research and evaluation, to inform the development of appropriate, effective and sustainable oral health services. The National Oral Health Plan shows that oral conditions are the third highest reason for acute preventable hospital admissions in Australia. More than 63,000 Australians are hospitalised due to oral conditions each year, with many of these requiring dental treatments under general anaesthetic. These cases include young children with high levels of dental disease and adults with complex medical conditions. The Dental Benefits Amendment Bill increases access to prevention and treatment services for children which supports parental promotion and modelling of good oral hygiene from a young age. All this helps to prevent serious dental decay as children develop their full adult teeth, as well as promoting healthy dental habits into adulthood. The Child Dental Benefit Scheme provides initial dental benefits such as examinations, x-rays, cleaning, fillings, root canals and tooth extractions. It was established in 2014 and has de delivered more than 38 million services to over 3 million children. This represents more than $2.3 billion in benefits over seven years. When the indexation rate is updated on 1 January 2022, the benefit will increase from $1,013 to $1,026 per eligible child, applied over two calendar years. The scheme is available in both the public and private sector to support the broadest range of services, provider choices and locations. The Dental Benefits Amendment Bill will add an extra 300,000 children to the scheme and will cost $5.4 million over four years. This is a significant contribution that supports dental access for children from a very young age. The Australian Government will continue to work with public and private providers to improve the delivery of dental services to our children. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator Rice. Deputy President, getting dental care for kids into Medicare is something that we Greens achieved when we were in balance of power with the Gillard Government in 2010. And getting dental care for everyone, for adults as well as children, is something that the Greens are continuing to campaign for, continuing to push for. And indeed, as Senator Askew's contribution just told us in great detail the benefits of everybody being able to access dental treatment under Medicare are outlined there. Huge benefits. It just makes sense. Getting dental care for kids included under Medicare in 2010 shows the fundamental change that you can see when you put a genuinely progressive party into balance of power. And we know that that achievement then has stood the test of time, hence this bill today that is extending um, dental care 
free dental care for kids now down to the age of zero. And in fact, what is very clear for exactly the same arguments as to why dental care should be included under Medicare, should be available for free for kids, all of those arguments hold for adults too. The impact of, of poor dental care had massive impacts on people's ability on their health and people's ability to contribute to society. When we talk about our platform of putting dental care under Medicare, being able to go to the dentist with your Medicare card and get your dental treatment, when, I talk, when we talk to people out in the streets, on the doors, people say, that just makes sense. Yes, that's what we need to do. Because people realise that the impact on their lives of not being able to afford dental care are significant. I remember when I was first a, a when I was a councillor in the city of Maribyrnong and working and supporting and representing a lot of people who were really doing it tough, tough living on, on um, income support, living in public housing. There's one woman I remember in particular who we got to know each other quite well and she talked to me about the issues that she was facing and I was there advocating for her on council. Every time she talked to me, she would talk to me with her hand over her mouth like this because she was incredibly embarrassed about the fact that she didn't have any teeth anymore and she couldn't afford to get dentures. She couldn't afford to go to the dentist. She was on a waiting list for public dental treatment, but it was going to be years off. So the impact on her life, a feeling of just that embarrassment that she had every time when she was out in the street, that she couldn't actually participate and feel proud of, of, of the way that she looked, that she felt that she had to cover her mouth like this every time she, put, she spoke. It really got to me. I've recently I've got another friend who's long-term unemployed, a man in his um, late 50s, who has just told me he's just managed to get to the dentist and he's had a, teeth rem a tooth removed, which has been aching and giving him the most amount of pain for well over 10 years. And so, you know, the waiting lists at the moment for public dental care are extraordinary. And I think, in fact, he, he saved up his money from living on, on JobSeeker, which is a really difficult thing to do in order to be able to afford to get a, prival, a private dentist to remove his tooth. This is the impact that poor dental care has on people. It, and this is why, I mean, this um, bill that we're talking about today, great, you know, extending dental care for kids down to zero from two. But we need to be going far further. We need to be actually genuinely looking after the health and the well-being of people. And that's what the Greens are fighting for, to actually saying, yes, you know, if you are concerned about the well-being of ordinary people, we need to have measures like getting dental care included under Medicare. And the reality is that doing that, it actually fits into a broader push for social justice, for fighting poverty, and that's what the Greens will always be fighting for. I mean, it's why we are calling for the government to be lifting income support payments above the poverty line so that people don't need to be struggling, caught up in the whirlpool of poverty. We saw what happened, the experiment during the COVID outbreak last year when um, job seeker was doubled and suddenly people realised that they could afford to spend things on what the rest of us just consider the basics. They could afford to put food on the table for three meals a day. They could afford to put shoes on the feet of their children. They could afford for their kids to go off on school excursions. So the need for government action it is more urgent than ever to be not just extending dental care for kids down to the age of zero, but to be taking real action to be lifting people above poverty, real action to be able to give people the basic building blocks so that they can be living happy, successful, meaningful lives. So, I mean, on the issue of that broader public income support, for the, the, broad, the broader need for income support, I want to highlight a, couple, a number of figures from a recent report from the Australian Council of Social Services, which just puts it starkly the situation that so many in our community are currently in. Their report, Faces of Unemployment 2021, finds that 80 per cent of people receiving job seeker payments, a record high of 826,000 people, have had to rely on income support for more than a year. And the current figure is more than double the previous peak of 350,000 after the 1991 recession, which prompted a billion dollar investment in employment assistance, including wage subsidies and training. 
And among people on in income support for over two years, over half have a disability and almost half are over 55, underscoring widespread discrimination in the labour market against people with disability and older people. And people's chances of securing full-time paid employment within the next year falls from over 50 per cent when they are unemployed for less than three months to less than 25 per cent once unemployed for over two years. So we have got an inequality crisis in this country, and that inequality crisis is something that can be fixed because poverty is a political choice. Just like we could be making the political choice now to be putting dental care into intermedi care so that you could get free dental treatment by showing your Medicare card, by using your Medicare card at the doctors, we can be choosing to be lifting people out of poverty. We can be choosing to raise our income support so that people aren't struggling like they currently are. We could be choosing, as our inquiry into the disability support pension has shown, to be supporting people with a disability to be able to be getting the support they need to be living a good life. And it's, as the inquiry is showing, the government at the moment is leaving people behind. It's leaving behind people on the DSP who are facing enormous challenges. And it's a government that's continually trying to, not to improve the lot of people on the DSP, not to actually enable people with a disability to get onto the DSP, but actively trying to force them off. And we know that these actions by this heartless, cruel and callous government and leaving people in poverty has a devastating impact. I mean, Anglicare is asking those who know it report. What that means is not just that people can't afford dental treatment. That means that 44 per cent, or almost half of people on, on JobSeeker reported skipping seven or more meals a week, and only 38 per cent said they felt supported by their government. So this is horrifying. It's not the Australia that I want to live in. It's not the Australia that most Australians want to live in. We can make that choice. We can choose to be supporting people across the country, to be lifting income support above the poverty line, to be putting dental care into Medicare for everyone. These are the choices that we should be making instead of spending billions of dollars on subsidies to fossil fuel companies, instead of cutting corporate tax rates, instead of allowing billionaires to get off without paying any tax at all. We could be making a difference to the lives of ordinary Australians, allowing them to be living their lives, living a decent life, rather than having people in the desperate straits of living in poverty. Thank you, Senator Rice. Um Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to um, provide a short contribution to this piece of legislation. I think it's an important step forward to make sure that we are uh, expanding the number of people, uh, those uh, children below 18, from zero to 18, to have access to uh, good quality dental health care. Um, being able to use your Medicare card when you go to the dentist is something that should be available for everyone. We've seen throughout uh, COVID-19 just how important universal health care has been. And we know, if you listen to your doctor, that dental health is an extremely important part of making sure the rest of our body is healthy. But of course there is a disparity between what is accessible under our universal health system and what isn't. You can go to the doctor if you've broken your jaw and use your Medicare card, but you can't go to the dentist to get the tooth fixed. That is just bonkers. This is time for Australia to move forward and to ensure that we fund dental health care for everybody properly. The Australian, Dental, uh, the Australian Dental Association each year has a look at the average cost of dental health care and uh, totals it up. For a regular checkup, for a regular Australian, the average cost of going to the dentist to get an examination, a scale and clean and some fluoride treatment, the average cost is $215 a pop. $215 a pop to make sure you stay healthy so that the rest of your body doesn't start to deteriorate. It is just crazy that under our wonderful medical health, uh, Medicare system and health system here in Australia that we don't allow dental to be included. 
So $215 on average, some is more than that, of course, depending on what dentist you choose, just to go and have a checkup and make sure everything's okay. And in, and in fact, if then things aren't okay and you need a filling, well, that might cost you an extra $250 on top of that. If you need a tooth extraction, we're talking about another $200. If you need root canal, we're talking $425 on average. The bills keep going up and up and up. By the time you get out of the dentist, you might be paying $700, $800, $900. $900. Australians deserve better than that. We have a tax system in this country. We have a system of universal health care, and it is time for dentistry to be included. You should be able to go to the dentist and whip out your Medicare card and have your dental health covered. You can go to the doctor with your Medicare card. You should be able to go to the dentist. It's as simple as that. It's important that we do this for children, of course, but every Australian deserves to be able to use their Medicare card to go to the dentist and to keep their teeth and their mouths healthy. And boy, you wouldn't want to be in a situation of emergency because if you need a crown, the average cost for a crown is $1,500. You can't put that on Medicare. You can't, that, you, you can't ride that off on tax. That comes straight out of your pocket. And as we know, there are many, many Australians in this country who simply can't afford that. And so what happens? We either don't go to the dentist, your teeth get worse, you get, it starts to have other health implications, or you have to go into debt. And the Greens have been arguing for a long time that we need to put dental health into Medicare. You should be able to use your Medicare card at the dentist just like you can at the doctor. Everyone knows it makes sense. We just have to get it done. Thank you, Senator uh, Hanson Young. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. I thank all senators for their contributions to the debate and I commend the Dental Benefits Amendment Bill 2021 to the Senate. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. Um, is it the wish of the committee? Of Sorry, I'm, um, is it the? Let me start again. Uh, Minister, move to move the second reading of the bill. The bill now be read a second time. Minister, all those in favour say aye. All those against, sorry. The ayes have it. Good. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Dental Benefits Act 2008 and for related purposes. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. I believe uh, Senator um, uh, Steelejohn uh, has a contribution to make to the amendments that he's moved in the committee as a whole. Yes. Uh, Sorry, Senator I'm just asking Steelejohn. the call go to Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Could I just get clarity that that amendment has indeed been moved on the floor by one of my colleagues, or do I need to do it now? No, you need to move it, Senator Steelejohn. Uh, okay, lovely. Then I, I'll do that. Um, so I move amendment on sheet one uh, three eight nine, um, standing in my name. Thank you. Lovely. All right, fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, as we've heard from uh, some of the contributions from um, my my colleagues, particularly uh, Senators Rice and and Senator Hanson Young, um, there are so many members uh, in our community who are really struggling because of the impact um, of the absence of public funding um, for dental care under the Medicare scheme. What we've heard from so many community members as representatives um, of our particular communities is that their inability, the barrier to getting the dental health care supports that you need is, is a life of pain and suffering, sometimes for year on year, decade after decade. 
The amendment before the Senate that I bring today on behalf of the Greens reflects our movement's commitment to the achievement of universal dental care under the public health system. Dental care for what you need, when you need it, for every person. What that would do is support so many members of our community who right now, as Senator Rice referenced, are doing that almost Herculean task of not only surviving on Job Seeker, but also trying to put some money aside to save up to see a dentist because the wait list on the public a dental service that currently exists, patchy as it is uh, throughout the states and territories, simply takes too long. The opportunity that we have in passing this amendment, the opportunity that we have in supporting the Greens bill, uh, the Greens amendments as put to the Senate today, is to end the pain and the suffering of so many of our members of the community that while struggling with all the very many terrible effects of trying to make ends meet, while this government stands by supporting po policies that force people so much to struggle in economic hardship, also have to try to do that while dealing with an infected tooth, with an abscess, with a wisdom tooth that needs removing, with gum disease that needs treating, with complex procedures that will enable them to speak properly. And worse than that, there are so many more who know the great value of preventative dental health care, the value of regular checkups, the value of regular cleans, the value of fillings, the value of being able to go, do you know what? That feels a bit odd. That hurts, that throbs. Let's get that checked before it escalates into something that means that I have to take a week off work, 10 days off work. I lose my job. I can't pay my mortgage. That is the practical impact of not being able to get dental health care which is to say nothing of the mental health implications of having unresolved dental illness. When you have chronic pain of the type that comes with untreated dental issues, there is very little else you can do with your day. It is such an all-consuming feeling. And I suspect many of the members of the major parties right now who are weighing up whether or not to support uh, the Greens amendments proposed here today uh, to create a fully, uh, to expand all the eligibility criteria to enable adults and children to get access uh, to publicly funded dental care under Medicare. I suspect everybody weighing that up today knows the pain of unresolved dental issues. I suspect you have had the wisdom tooth that needs removing, that you have had the filling that's gone wrong, that you've had the cracked tooth. I suspect all of the members of the Liberal and Labour Party, consciously or subconsciously, know the value of preventative dental care. I suspect you very regularly get yourself to your local dentist, overwhelmingly probably a private dentist, to get work done. Because you know the value of it. You know the value of going and getting something sorted when something doesn't feel right. The opportunity that sits before the Liberal and Labour parties today is whether to take this opportunity to, expect, to extend the ability that you have, the privilege that you have, to the rest of your communities to make dental care accessible under Medicare, to enable people to go to the dentist as easily as they would go to the doctor. That is the chance that you now have. That is what this amendment would enable to come into place. 
And I hope not to hear, in response to this proposal, any carping, any moaning, any hand-wringing from either side of politics in relation to cost. Because we all know, the community all know, that when the big corporations rock up to this place with their shiny-shoed lobbyists and they ask for tax cuts that will cost tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars over the decade, that when the defence manufacturers and the arms dealers rock up wanting to sell the government yet another project that by the time it's built will be totally obsolete, the government and the opposition both line up next to each other and say, well, thank you very much. Where do we sign? So I hope not to see any of that nonsensical contribution from the major parties. Let us put aside the idea that there is not the resources in our community to address something so basic as universal dental care, to free all members of our community from the pain of untreated dental issues, to enable people to eat and drink and talk without pain and suffering. There are enough resources to do that. There is simply a need for the major parties to grow a spine and be willing to make the choices necessary to make that a reality for people, to extend the privilege and the ease enjoyed by so many members of this place on both sides of politics when it comes to getting dental issues treated. Let us do that now. Let us get it done now. Let us have that be the legacy of this parliamentary sitting before Christmas. That we recognise the basic medical reality that the mouth is part of the face and the face is part of the body. And if you have pain, you should be able to get it treated. And you should be able to take the preventative steps that so many people know are necessary to prevent the worsening of dental medical issues. That is the opportunity before the chamber today. Let us take it up with gusto. We know the Australian people support it. It is something the Greens have always championed. We've got the beginning of the program that we need uh, in the 2010-2013 uh, time in, uh, in power sharing arrangement. Uh, I'm not sure what planet the members of the Labour Party are on when they talk about uh, this scheme as it stands as a legacy of the Labour government. This wasn't anywhere near their legislative agenda before 2010. It is a direct result, a direct result of the Gillard government having to sit down with the Greens after the 2010 election. And that is what came out of that. That's why the child dental benefit scheme exists, because people voted for the Greens. And we went into those negotiations with the ALP and said, this is one of the things that our community wants to happen. That's what created this scheme. And on the back of that, we continue now to champion the creation of universal dental care in Australia. A basic that every member of our community should be able to expect. That their government takes action to ensure that such a kit scheme and such support exists, particularly in the context of the full knowledge of the failed and broken nature of our current publicly funded dental system, with waiting lists that are utterly beyond belief. Let us turn words into actions, passion into program. Let's vote for these amendments today and get this done for our communities. Thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, just before I go to you, Senator McAllister, I'm going to just read a statement of reasons with the concurrence of the Senate, So, with, because this is a request amendment. So with the concurrence of the Senate, the statement of reasons accompanying the requests circulated for this bill will be incorporated in the Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate. Uh, is there any objection to that? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, uh, yet another delusional rewriting of history from the uh, Greens political party. Um, I can recall in 1998 the first occasion where I played a, some sort of leadership role in a local campaign, campaigning on 
dental. Labor has always been clear that dental and public dental was immensely important for the people that we represent. Uh, dental health makes an enormous difference to people's overall health. It is ludicrous to argue, as Senator Stilljohn has just done, that this is somehow owned by the Greens. We did it. Another one for the Facebook page for the Greens. We achieved something, notwithstanding the fact that they were not in government. They were not the government, and everybody by now surely understands that the only way to get progress on social justice is, in fact, to elect a Labor government and the endless attempts by the Australian Greens political party to undermine the Labor Party for their own narrow political and electoral interests does not serve them well. Labor won't be supporting this amendment from the Greens. Yet again, we have a situation where the Greens are coming up with an amendment that would have a significant cost and also, and also, for the reasons I just explained, stands no chance of passing in the other place. And do you know why? Because what we need for real reform is a Labor government. We need a Labor majority. This is another green stunt that has no chance, no realistic chance of ever becoming law. And as my colleague mentioned in the second reading contributions, Labor supports this bill as an extension of Labor's legacy. We are glad that the government has come around from its previous attempts to cut or abolish the scheme and are now proposing to expand it. And we shouldn't stand in the way, we shouldn't delay this welcome reform of the child dental benefit schedule by supporting something that has no chance. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And the government will also not be supporting the amendment moved by the Australian Greens. Uh, the Dental Benefits Amendment Bill that we are currently debating uh, will seek to provide access to the child de dental benefits schedule for eligible children from birth, which is zero years of age. Um, this is, in other words, designed to support the delivery of essential child oral health services. The proposed amendment moved by the Australian Greens seeks to remove all age limitations and means testing requirements. Uh, this would therefore completely change the parameters of the program and it would no longer be a specific program targeted at children, uh, which is what it is. Thank you, Minister. So the question is, the, motion, the request, uh, um, as moved by uh, Senator Steele-John, that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So we're dealing with request one on sheet 1389, and the question is, as moved by Senator Steele John, that the request for an amendment be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes. Order. There being eight ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Just allow senators to get back to their seat and we'll proceed with the bill. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Dental Benefits Amendment Bill of 2021 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. There you go. Bill for an act to amend the Dental Benefits Act 2008 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Crimes Amendment Remissions of Sentences Bill 2021, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. <clears throat> Labor supports this bill. The bill would amend the Commonwealth Crimes Act. For starters, it would repeal section 19AA of the Crimes Act, which applies remissions granted under state or territory laws to head sentences for Commonwealth offences. For clarity, a remission is a reduction in the term of a prison sentence. By way of example, a state or territory law may provide that a prisoner's head sentence can or should be reduced if the person's time in prison is harsher than had been anticipated at the time of sentencing such as where a person is detained in his cell 
uh, or herself for longer than usual because of a fire or other emergency situation or because of an industrial dispute. More recently, the requirements for lockdowns as a consequence of COVID-19 have resulted in prisoners being detained in their cells for long periods, without the usual access to exercise yards and to other activities outside their cells. The upshot of Section 19AA in the Crimes Act is that any such reduction under a state or territory law is applied automatically to the head sentences of individuals who have been convicted of Commonwealth offences. The laws and uh, the states and territories vary in this area. That means that individuals who are handed the same sentence in different states may ultimately end up having a different term of imprisonment depending on the state or territory in which he or she is sentenced. My apologies, sentenced. <coughs> the other aspects of section 19AA of the Crimes Act, subsections 2 and 3, would also be repealed. Subsection 19AA2 applies any state or territory law crediting clean street time as a reduction of a federal offender sentence in the same way as clean street time would apply to the reduction to reduce the sentence of a state or territory offender in the same jurisdiction. Subsection 19AA3 ensures that clean street time is taken into account where an offender breaches their parole in a state or territory that does not provide for reductions in sentences based on clean street time. Clean street time is the period between when an offender is released on parole up to the time when their parole order is revoked because of non-compliance with the order. In most states or territories, clean street time is taken into account in determining consequences for an offender who has breached his or her parole order. The bill would replace subsections 19AA2 and 3 with a new subsection, and it's in a different part of the Crimes Act. The upshot of these amendments would be that courts could still consider clean street time when dealing with federal offenders who have breached their parole conditions, but state and territory laws in relation to clean street time would no longer automatically apply to federal offenders. As a number of those opposite have noted in the debate, this bill was prompted by some recent high-profile examples of federal offenders being granted emergency management days in Victoria, with the effect that their sentences were substantially reduced. It is disappointing, but perhaps not surprising, that some in the Morrison government have sought to politicise this bill by pretending that emergency management days were a new thing. As I've already mentioned, under the Victorians' Correction Act, the Corrections Commissioner may reduce a prisoner's sentence if the individual demonstrates good behaviour while suffering disruption or deprivation during an industrial dispute, emergency or other circumstances of a special or unforeseen nature. These reductions are referred to as emergency management days, and they are not new. The current Victorian regime in relation to emergency management days was introduced in 1992, and every Commonwealth government, including the current government, have been aware of those arrangements ever since. So it's a bit rich and more than a little concerning for those opposite to feign surprise over the fact that emergency management days have been applied by the Victorian Corrections Commissioner in recent times. Australians are entitled to expect their federal government to be on top of these matters. This bill was the subject of an inquiry by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. <clears throat> the primary concern raised by submitters about the bill was that the measures in the bill would apply retrospectively, with the effect that reductions in sentences that have been already applied under Victorian law in particular would be removed by the bill. In response to that concern, the Attorney-General's Department submitted that remissions and reductions are not an entitlement and it is not unreasonable to expect that changes may be made from time to time to discretionary benefits such as these, while also noting that the changes in the bill would not impose any additional punishments or change the sentence imposed by the sentence in court. Labor understands and takes very seriously the concerns raised by submitters about this aspect of the bill. However, on balance, we do not think those concerns outweigh the clear advantages associated with ensuring greater certainty and consistency when it comes to the length of federal sentences and in the interests of community safety. Thank you, Senator McAllister. <laughs> Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Crimes Amendment Remissions of Sentences Bill 2021. The Australian Greens will definitely not be supporting this bill, and I'm sure it comes to no surprise um, that we won't be supporting this bill, given 
uh, takes away people's human rights, which is what this government is very, very good and clever at. The Crimes Amendment Remission of Sentences Bill 2021 seeks to amend the Crimes Act to repeal Section 19A, A, which applies remissions or, or reductions granted under state or territory laws to federal sentences. Remissions or reductions in sentences are usually granted in recognition of restrictions placed on imprisoned people that are necessary in emergency circumstances. Usually remissions are automatically applied to reduce the federal offender's head sentence as soon as they have been granted. Victoria is the only jurisdiction with laws providing significant remissions or reductions that apply to an imprisoned person under a federal offence. In Victoria, these remissions are known as Emer Emergency Management Days, or EMDs. This bill would repeal Section 19AA of the Crimes Act of 1914. <laughs> so old. Uh, so that it would no longer apply reductions or remissions in sentences granted to imprisonment, imprisoned people that are serving periods of imprisonment for federal offences. The bill would apply to imprisoned people imprisoned for a federal sentence who are serving that sentence in a state or territory jail immediately before the date of commencement. However, this bill would retroactive, retrospective and it would take away remissions or reductions to people that have already received them. Therefore, any remissions or reductions they had already been granted are taken to be of no effect. As of June 2021, 1,151 people were imprisoned for federal offences around this country. 317 of these imprisoned people are imprisoned in Victoria. In Victoria, emergency management days are granted to reduce the sentence of imprisonment, imprisoned people for good behaviour or to imprisoned people who suffer a disruption or deprivation during an emergency or an industrial dispute in the jail where the sentence is being served as well as for other unforeseen circumstances, like COVID-19. Generally, emergency management days provide an incentive, an incentive hello, for imprisonment, imprisoned people to maintain good behaviour. But you don't want that. You want to cause riots. This could or would result in them being further deprived of their liberties, so those get they'll, they'll get punished for being on good behaviour. Makes makes a lot of sense, right? This in turn helps to maintain security and good order in prisons. Secondly, emer emergency management days compensate imprisoned people for the impacts of increased deprivation and disruption during their imprisonment. This has been really important during the current COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted in even greater restrictions and deprivation of further liberties in jails. Not to mention that many of these jails didn't even do the minimum, the minimum to prevent COVID infection. Some didn't even have soap. When this country was running around telling everyone to wash their hands, prisons didn't even have soap for people to wash their hands. So when we say minimum protection for prisoners, we mean minimum. And now this government wants to kick imprisonment, imprisoned people even further with this bill that would apply retrospectively. So the prisoners that have been told because of the COVID-19 lockdown, uh, we said that you're going to get out earlier and we're going to compensate you for that time, but actually, no, we're not going to do that no more. Uh, tell me how you'd feel if you were locked up. 
The Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills in Scrutiny Digest 15 of 2021 reported, and I quote, the committee has a long-standing scrutiny concern about provisions that have the effect of applying retrospectively as it challenges a basic value of the rule of law. To the lawyers, you hear that? The rule of law. I'm not a lawyer. You should know better. In general, laws should only operate prospectively. Don't go backwards. The committee has a particular concern if the legislation will or might have a detrimental effect on individuals." End quote. In its Human Rights Scrutiny Report of the Bill, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights also noted that, and I quote, questions remain as to whether the measure is arbitrary, noting that it does not only apply retrospectively to ensure future grants of remissions will not apply to federal offenders, but also applies retrospectively so that those who have already had remissions applied will no longer receive them. And prospectively is what I meant um, in that first sentence. This government is as committed to not upholding basic human rights as they are committed to not being accountable for their many, many failures. We see that this government is doing what they're doing. They're trying to ram through these nonsense law and order bills so that the country won't see how dysfunctional they really are. This bill should not proceed. Instead, the government should enact a human rights charter, but they're too scared to do that. We don't want people in this country to have human rights, do we? because you want to keep abusing them. We need a charter of human rights in this country to ensure no one is blocked from asserting their rights and dignities. For example, by preventing the retrospective enacting of laws. Instead of bringing incredibly problematic legislation, and that's all you've done all week, Talk about unity in this country. You bring in disgusting, racist, punitive legislation that ain't going to win your votes at the next election. You're kidding yourself. You got half your half your bench and half your party just absolutely disgusted in some of your behaviours and are quietly saying, "Oh, I know it's really bad," you know. Instead of bringing incredibly problematic legislation, as I said, have a look at the serious impact on people's human rights and dignity. Because you, you care that you care about that in your lives. You walk around free, privileged, very privileged, might I add, and you make up laws that hurt people, that discriminate against people. That's what you're doing. How do you, how do you sleep at night knowing that? How do you sleep at night knowing a, a person in prison has been locked down because the prison went on strike? The prison went on strike because you didn't give any favours to your mates run in the private prisons like Serco, because you're in bed with them too. How do you sleep at night being buddies with Serco, who are hurting people in prison and detention centres, black refugees? It's horrible. It's a horrible thought. But you can sleep well at night in your privileged little bed while that prisoner who got locked down because the prison went on strike last week, what happens with this bill? That prisoner thinks that they're getting out and, and they've been in good 
They've been on good behaviour. They've been doing all the right things. They're looking forward to getting out a bit earlier because, you know, the prison went on strike. But no, this government's saying, "Well, sorry, uh, we've changed our mind. We're going to introduce some legislation that takes all your rights away now." We know that you've been on good behaviour, but we're going to take them away anyway. Bad luck, buddy. If that was your family member, and I know you know you live in a privileged bubble, they're all protected. If you had a person in your family that got told that the government just made a decision that takes away your rights. Even though you've been doing the right thing, we've just made a decision in this government that's just going to screw your life up even, even more because we just want to keep locking you up and keeping you locked up so you stay away from my little white privileged family so I can live my perfect little life, not believe in climate change, not believe in... Uh, working for the people who really, really need them. Don't worry about people's human rights. We're just going to make decisions because that's we're so privileged that we don't care about those people. We don't care about black fellas. We don't care about people in prisons. We don't care about refugees. We don't care about climate change. We don't even care about uh, people voting for us no more because we're, I can't say the word, pretty effed. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I'd ask you Is that a bad, that. I didn't say the actual word? No, but it, it, it's implied, so please withdraw. With, I withdraw that. Thank you. But I think you get the sentiment. Um, it's absolutely disgusting what you people are doing to normal people out there that don't have your privilege. You haven't struggled like these people have in this country, but you continue to make laws that hurt people and keep them locked up and keep torturing them. You talk about mental health, but you're happy to take someone's dignity and liberties away. How do you think that affects someone's mental health? How dare you do this to people imprisoned in this country? How dare you backdate this decision? I hope the person or the minister responsible, I hope you deliver that message personally to every prisoner who's been on good behaviour, doing the right thing, who you decided uh, you're just a pleb to me because I'm so privileged and I don't have to care about people like you in my world. My world is so plastic and privileged. I don't really care about anybody else because I'm a politician. I'm right. I've been here for a decade or so. I've got my mansion. I've got my white privilege. Why should I care about people? that are in jail? Why should I care about people in detention? Why should I care about this so-called climate thing that you keep uh, denying? What do you actually care about besides yourselves? Seriously. You prance around here, so privileged, so privileged that you don't even know it. I urge you to get rid of this bill and while you're doing that, check your privilege. Check your privilege. Instead of giving me little smirks and raising your eyebrows, which, you know, that's what privileged white people do to black people like me, check your privilege, get rid of this bill and give people their human rights and dignity. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The need for this bill can be best summarised in relation to a case study which the Australian Federal Police provided as part of the review of this bill 
in relation to the sentencing of Mr Adam Brockman. And I'll quote from the Australian Federal Police's submission. On 23 June 2021, Mr Brookman was sentenced to six years and eight months imprisonment with a non-parole period of five years after pleading guilty to the charge of performing services in Syria in support or promotion of the commission of an offence against the Crimes, Foreign Incursions and Recruitment Act 1978. But for his guilty plea, Mr Brookman would have been sentenced to imprisonment for eight years and six months, with a non-parole period of seven years. At the time of sentencing, Mr Brookman was expected to serve an additional nine months in custody, noting he had been in custody on remand for five years and 11 months. And note that this is an individual charged with respect to performing services in Syria in, in relation to and committing offences under the Crimes, Foreign Incursions and Recruitment Act. It is important to note also that the sentencing judge in her remarks already considered and accounted for hardship caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So what happened in the case of Mr Brookman? On 23 June 2021, the same day Mr Brookman was sentenced, the AFP was advised that Mr Brookman had been granted a total of 342 EMDs, pursuant to section 58E of the Corrections Act 1986 Victoria, resulting in a reduction of Mr Brookman's overall sentence and his release into the community. This person who went to Syria, who went to Syria and was convicted under the Foreign Incursions and Recruitment Act, resulting in a reduction of Mr Brookman's overall sentence and his release into the community late on the evening of 23 June 2021. And note the date, Madam Deputy President, the same date that he was sentenced, the same date that he was sentenced within a matter of hours because of this extraordinary grant of 342 EMDs, on the same day he was sentenced, he was released. And as the AFP says, the time between sentencing and Mr Brookman's release was a matter of hours. As a high-risk terrorist offender, as a high-risk terrorist offender, Mr Brookman was a risk to community safety. From the time of his release till 6 July 2021, when an interim control order application was determined by the Federal Court of Australia, there was a short period of time. Count the days, 23 June 2021 through to 6 July 2021, there was a short period of time where a control order was not in place against Mr Brookman. As a direct result, Madam Deputy President, as a direct result of the fact that the extraordinary total of 342 EMDs had been granted and Mr Brookman's sentence had to be released by that amount, if nothing else, if nothing else draws into stark relief. Thank you, Senator Scar. The time for this debate has now expired. You'll be in continuation. We'll now move to Senator Statements, and I call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, today I want to have a talk about Autism What Next. It's a website that's recently been launched to assist families who are going through an autism diagnosis, have received an autism diagnosis, but also for adults who receive an autism diagnosis. Now, it might seem strange as something that is as prevalent as autism that a resource like this has not existed in the past. Families and adults, when they were diagnosed, were very much left to their own devices, um, all too often falling into the trap of Dr Google, where we all are aware on the web there is a lot of misinformation and pseudoscience that would confuse parents and would place them in danger of perhaps looking at therapy options that are not evidence-based, that are not based in science and will end up having detrimental or, at best, no effect whatsoever. So this website, Autism What Next, has been made possible by an ILC grant funded by DSS to Autism Awareness Australia. Autism Awareness Australia is a parent-run organisation that has well over 15 years' experience around autism. And it is reflected in the quality of this website and the advice that is available for parents to help them navigate at what can be an incredibly tricky and devastating time for families. So the website itself, though, is important to remember, is put together by either autistic people themselves or families of a child with autism. 
This is real lived experience and it's backed up by clinicians and uh, therapists who provide evidence-based therapy for these families as also for adults who are diagnosed later in life. And the guide to best practice therapies is where it's really important that we see children begin a pathway as soon as possible with evidence-based therapies. It's those evidence-based therapies that are going to give the best outcome for that child and that family in the long run. And it provides information for families that emphasises the importance that it's never too early to start and that there should be therapies that are effective and intensive. And the sooner you can get onto those, the better. But including uh, the information in there is also helping parents understand that therapy is not just to be conducted in a clinic setting. It's not enough to go to a speech therapist, sit across a desk, have a session and move on. These therapies need to be conducted across a range of environments and this allows the child to generalise those skills that they're learning so they can use them at the home, they can use them at preschool or school and that they can start to generalise and move more into the community. We know for children that the best therapy types will ensure that that child's communication skills are developed but also that they're play-based, that the child starts to understand the importance of turn-taking and playing games. For neurotypical children, these skills come very, very easily. Children move from parallel playing next to each other to engaging with each other. A lot of children with autism need to be taught this skill. It doesn't come innately to them to learn how to turn take. And probably something that could be taken as a lesson in this place sometimes, uh, turn taking is a very big part of conversations. Uh, you wait for the other person to stop speaking before you start your own conversation and start saying what you want to say. Uh, so it is important that we start looking at these things through a play-based environment. And you know, one of the things I think that demonstrates how needed this resource uh, is uh, across Australia is that within the first three weeks of it being launched, there were over 7,000 users of this site. And I have no doubt that the awareness of this site as it gets out there will continue to grow and parents and families will start to utilise more and more of the resources on there. And some of the resources that are on there, um, including a lovely photo of me with my beautiful Freddo in one of the sections, uh, but uh, there are over 75 videos of people with autism, our parents and carers of a child with autism, to share real life experience, to share what uh, autism means and how parents and how families can be best supported and provide those resources. Um, so it's, it is such a great initiative to see that this website has been rolled out, that families will be able to get access to information when they need it, that the information is in a centralised place, it's been endorsed by clinicians and experts in the field, and hopefully as we move forward, We'll see less and less families uh, being seduced by the charlatans and the snake oil salesmen who far too often operate in this space. They take advantage of families at a time when they are most vulnerable. Uh, and one of the, you know, this is a free resource, and at no part of it is it trying to sell families anything. There is no direction to particular clinics, there's no direction to particular providers. So families are provided with information. They can use that information to make effective choices, to find good centres around them uh, and to understand better how they can support their child and put them on a pathway. And it is also, and coming back to autistic adults, it is important that for adults that are diagnosed later in life, and this is we're seeing this happen more and more as uh, we better understand how autism presents itself, particularly in women, uh, and what it looks like. It is important that adults are receiving that support and there is a great level of information and support for those diagnosed uh, and what, what their next steps are because it's very difficult for sometimes people to understand where do they turn to, what do they look for and where are those supports available. Um, so it's a fantastic free resource. It's exactly what the ILC grants were set up to do. They're about providing that tier two support. They're about providing information to the community and Autism What's Next is absolutely one of the best resources to do this that I've ever seen, but we are very lucky to have it here centred in Australia, supporting Australian families and how uh, we can continue to support them through that journey. 
Uh, obviously, this is still based around diagnosis and the early stages. Um, I sincerely hope that we get to a stage where we have future resources that help parents through the different stages of autism. Um, and I particular shout out to Nicole Rogerson, who uh, is the CEO of Autism Awareness Australia, who does an outstanding job for this community. Um, and honestly, I can say without Nicole and her clinic, the Lizard Centre, my family would not be uh, in the position it is today, uh, which is uh, Fredo going off to his high school induction day yesterday. He had a great day. I'm not sure Mum is coping as well as Fredo, uh, but from all reports, he had a great day. The cafeteria was the highlight, uh, and uh, as only Fredo could pull, uh, he met a classmate who has a PlayStation, which was a good thing. Uh, but also found out he had a pet blue tongue lizard, of which Fred decided that was a hard no on becoming possible friends. So, uh, if anyone could work out some of these things, hopefully, when Autism Awareness start to do some more work for the next stages, uh, you know, for those of us parents that are now looking to tackle all the joyous things that we do for all our children, including puberty, uh, when you put that with an autism frame on it, uh, it certainly makes for a very interesting family life. Um, the, also on the website, though, there is uh, information there provided by Andrew Whitehouse. And Andrew is a leading expert in autism, uh, recognised globally. Uh, he has recently released a study which I think has significant impacts uh, for the autism community that gut health does not cause autism. We do know kids with autism can be very picky eaters and that can create problems for them when it comes to their uh, gut health and gut bacteria, uh, but what we do know is that that does not cause autism and it's not uh, a linkage that we need to keep providing funding and supports that, uh, again, some of this pseudoscience that's been around that if you fix the gut health, you fix the autism, um, that's absolutely ridiculous and something that hopefully we can start to see the end of those claims being made. Some of the therapies around there uh, are just quite frankly dangerous and uh, it's good to see that this very strong research has been done to assist families and make sure that those pseudosciences aren't supported and that children aren't being subjected to these horrific kinds of therapy. Uh, but you know again, just to take the opportunity in the last minute uh, to say thank you to Ryan Norn who started working with us when he was uh, at the Lizard Centre. Um, and is still with us 10 years later. He has been Fred's shadow at school and he is now working with him to teach daily living skills. If I'd have had a resource at the beginning of our autism journey that could have mapped out a pathway for me, it would have been just such a relief because you really don't know where to go and more importantly, you don't know what the future holds. And our kids can achieve so much. He cooked dinner last night after peeling potatoes begrudgingly. Um, these are skills that are important to learn that they're taught in the right way uh, and it's without the intensive early intervention that we received, we would never be where we are at the moment. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise today to speak on one of the motivations which drives me most to be here in this position representing South Australians, and that is the importance of supporting, uplifting and standing side by side with South Australian families of advancing their aspirations for themselves and for their children. Family is everything. It is the most important thread that runs through most of our lives, whether it's the family we are born into or whether it's the family that we choose for ourselves and that we build for ourselves. Building, protecting, growing and providing for family of whatever size, whatever shape, whatever makeup is what drives all the South Australians that I speak to because for these South Australians, family is everything. But when family is broken, when it is strained, when it is under pressure, we find that family failure becomes the source of what goes wrong for too many in our communities, for too many individuals and for our society. And today I want to talk about an issue that is putting many Australians under strain and that has for many families worsened during this pandemic and that is the challenge of balancing work, care and their family responsibilities. But before I do, I want to acknowledge that this Australian family unit has changed drastically in recent decades. Blended and step families are more common 
as are extended households, where more than two generations live under the same roof. This is sometimes in order to address a lack of access to care for younger ones or the elderly. Other times it's there to facilitate better care of those in need, those with disability, those who need extra support. And in this place, we should be aware of the way the family unit is constantly changing and evolving and how that impacts and interacts with how we craft policy responses to these changes, to take into account the needs of all people, of all families, when it comes to balancing work and care. But today, especially, I want to speak with a particular focus about the work and family and care situation of workers in an industry about which I am very passionate those in the retail, fast food and warehousing industries. Because we have found that over the past two years that along with, of course, doctors, nurses, other hospital staff, among many others, these workers are truly essential workers. During lockdowns, they went to work. They fronted up each day. Many endured the most vile abuse and were expected to manage crowd control on top of their usual duties. Some were expected to somehow manage amongst all of this, amongst all of this stress and pressure during times where the communities were locked down, the additional caring responsibilities that they were responsible for as well. Those caring responsibilities which didn't go away when schools were closed, but they still had to turn up to work, cobbling together a mix of formal and informal care, an incredible strain and pressure on many of these families. And many worked in lockdown parts of our country without having access to vaccines, in part because of the government's appallingly slow rollout. But yet, despite these sacrifices, which we know are so great from these workers, they were given the recognition they deserved as essential workers far too late, the support they needed far too late. Too often, our retail workers, our fast food workers, those working in warehousing, haven't been rewarded for their heroic contribution during this pandemic. And they certainly haven't been rewarded when it comes to their wages. They aren't being recognised when it comes to managing the competing demands of work, family and caring responsibilities with this essential work. 55 per cent of participants in a recent University of New South Wales Social Policy Research Centre study into the work, family and care responsibilities of workers in these sectors said they regularly provide some form of care to another person. That could be in the form of caring for a child, a grandchild or for an older person, a person with disability or a person with long-term health conditions. This rate is much higher than the broader population. Indeed, ABS stats of the broader population suggest that one in nine Australians, or 11 per cent, provide unpaid care to people with a disability and older Australians. Now, this report of members of the union representing those, these workers, the SDA, found that, number, that the number of workers in this field was 24 per cent. This report finds that many workers in retail, fast food and warehousing are struggling to balance the responsibilities of their work, care and their families. Deputy President, we need to drastically rethink the way we think about care in Australia and the way that we make and deliver policy about care. Because care, whether for a child, for our elderly, for those with disability or otherwise, cannot be an afterthought in the design of either social or economic policy. Providing care is one of the most important jobs a person can have. Those in formal care work should be recognised as such, with good wages, good conditions and real security in the work that they do. And we must do more to value and recognise informal care, that care that our parents, friends, aunties, uncles and, for an increasing number of Australians, grandparents do, to raise children in particular. It is clearly an emotionally rewarding experience for many, and I feel that in our family very deeply. But it can be exhausting. Many will call it the hardest job they ever have. These are things governments can, there are things government can do to make life easier for these Australians who are supporting our society, who are supporting those in the workforce and supporting our essential workers. And for our essential workers, we can help give them better choice when it comes to their care arrangements and how they are managed around their employment. And we can ensure that the benefits that come from the now celebrated increased flexibility in workplace arrangements are felt not just by employers, 
but employees who deserve and who are entitled to balance to life outside of their work and to manage and maintain their responsibilities outside of work. We can also minimise the amount of workers in these industries, as well as the caring industries, who are kept on rolling casual contracts for years by giving them security and a stronger hand when negotiating rosters. The UNSW report I referred to earlier highlights a number of key findings when it comes to managing work and caring responsibilities. And first, and this will come as no surprise to anyone paying attention to this sector, that access to formal early education and care is one of the most significant barriers. Of course, this matters not just in terms of supporting care arrangements, but also in terms of supporting the early development of children, which I have spoken about extensively in this place. But when it comes to supporting care arrangements, to enabling parents to participate in work, to participate in essential work, they are hampered by the cost of childcare, which is preventing too many families from participation. Childcare fees have skyrocketed under this government, in fact, by almost 40 per cent since the Liberals were elected. And for many families, this is holding back their aspirations and their opportunities in work. Of those surveyed in the UNSW report, 43 per cent of mothers and 35 per cent of fathers with children under 12 or under wanted to work more hours but were unable to because they couldn't access care. Many reported turning down shifts because care was so expensive they were better off staying at home. And this is a crucial point to consider when we hear about labour shortages, as we have in recent weeks. And yet, knowing all of this, the Morrison government has proposed a childcare policy which doesn't go nearly far enough, which rips any extra support away from families with two children in care once the older child goes to school, and completely leaves out parents with one child in care—74 per cent of families. Australian families pay some of the highest rates of childcare in the world. And that's why Labor has a plan to relieve this pressure. We have a plan to increase the childcare subsidy rate for every Australian family earning less than 530000 But beyond the issue of access to childcare, we know too that while so many workers have benefited from Labor's nation-changing reform of paid parental leave, there is still more work to do in this project. We know the gaps in superannuation, including things like the fact that superannuation is not paid on paid parental leave payments contributes to the super gap, contributes to the fact that women in their older years, in their older age, are contributing to the far, uh, uh, part of the fastest growing cohort of people experiencing homelessness, of people experiencing poverty at that stage in their life. And there are things we can do about that. There are policy choices we can make to fix that and to enhance it, just as there are in care. We owe our essential workers who have endured so much during this pandemic, who have taken on not only the additional burdens of the stress of this work during these difficult times, but who have still had to manage and balance their care and family responsibilities with their work and have felt so unsupported in doing so. These workers deserve better. They deserve a clearer look at our policy levers to make sure they are supported, and they deserve acknowledgement not just in thanks, but in their pay, their conditions and the support we give them. Senator Wish Wilson, remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me OK? We can. Fantastic. Well, it's been nearly 10 years since I gave my first Senator's statement uh, in this chamber. And the most important thing I wanted to talk about that day was one of the key reasons I came into Parliament, which was to tackle I think one of the largest pollution issues on the planet with plastic in our oceans. Uh, and uh, throughout the last 10 years, we've made great progress, Acting Deputy President, right around the country at a state level and at a federal level. Um, I was actually the first person, according to Hansard, to have actually spoken about plastic pollution uh, in the Senate, which is quite extraordinary when you think about what a big issue it is now. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we've still got a long way to go. And actually, it was almost exactly a year ago uh, to today that this chamber had a colossal debate about fixing the waste crisis when the government brought their waste reduction bill to the Senate. And the Greens proposed two significant amendments to that waste reduction bill, which the government claimed was the biggest reform to waste policy in this country 
uh, in a generation. Now, the Green Amendments were based on uh, two very big Senate inquiries uh, that ran, uh, each of them ran over about 18 months. The first one was to ban single-use plastics. And the second one was to mandate packaging targets for the big packaging companies around the country. Um, under the Australian Packaging Covenant, over many, many years, in its various forms, um, voluntary targets were set and, of course, were never met. In fact, uh, the Packaging Covenant failed miserably to uh, increase recycling rates or uh, compostability or recycling content, a number of key things that we need to actually address the waste crisis. Now, the Greens worked with um, environment groups, um, social uh, groups, a whole range of stakeholders around the country. We had nearly two million Australians lobbying their local MPs last year to support the Greens amendments in this chamber. A very significant campaign to actually take some solid steps to fix the waste crisis in this country. Um, and our message was very clear, Acting Deputy President. We said the time for voluntary targets for big packaging companies is over. This is a significant opportunity to mandate uh, the kind of recycling targets that we want to see if we're actually going to fix the waste crisis in this country. Now, we had had a, uh, a short, sharp Senate inquiry uh, into uh, a Greens bill prior to that, which our amendments were based on. And we received evidence from the Packaging Covenant uh, and from companies like the big retailers like Woolworth, Woolworths, the Australian Food and Grocery Council, that they were confident that they would meet their 2025 targets and that they didn't need uh, mandatory targets. Now, I thought we had the Senate support to amend the government's legislation and send it back to the House. But as they so often do, uh, One Nation backflipped at the last minute and it was a tied vote and our amendments went down. Well, one year later, um, Acting Deputy President, um, I could say, uh, I told you so. Uh, we just received a report uh, in the last week from APCO called the Collective Impact 2021 Report. Uh, and that revealed their progress towards uh, their 2025 targets. Now, I was hoping to talk with APCO this morning before this speech, but uh, for technical reasons, we're unable to. So I plan to speak to them in the next few days. But what, it, what is very clear is that APCO are struggling to meet their 2025 targets under their current voluntary arrangements. So APCO is part of a collective approach to managing packaging through the Covenant. Um, and these 2025 targets were set some time ago, but this 2021 report has highlighted uh, a lack of progress in some very significant areas and demonstrates some very significant challenges. APCO themselves clearly state there are significant gaps to achieve the 2025 targets for recovery and recycled content. And the current trajectory indicates that without further intervention, not all of the 2025 targets are achievable by 31st of December 2025. Now, we're not clear what that further intervention actually is. Um, and some of the uh, specific gaps that they identified in their 2025 targets include uncertainties about the compatibility of packaging items, with current and future recovery systems, recyclable materials that are lost in the sorting system due to size or format type, loss of recyclable materials due to poor source separation by households and businesses, inconsistent state definitions, policies and product scope, undermining investment confidence, and capital costs of new processing equipment when changing materials. Now, part of the government's overall approach to their waste reduction bill was to introduce uh, you know, a number of funding platforms to try and solve these problems. But clearly, progress hasn't been made, which is very disappointing. Um, now, APCO do put this down to a rise in consumption during COVID in 2019-20, especially with takeaway containers. Um, however, um, while they don't explicitly, obviously, call for a mandatory uh, program in the future, because remember, APCO and others uh, lobbied very hard not to get mandatory schemes put in place, um, they have raised the prospect of limited mandatory targets if industry fails to achieve through voluntary commitments. Uh, the Boomerang Alliance, um, who I've worked with over many years, and I know you have too, Acting Deputy President, 
They represent over 50 community organisations around the country. They issued a very strong statement. Uh, Jeff Angel uh, wrote, the report is a shocking indictment of the voluntary nature of the targets, which should be met by 2025 and reinforces our call for mandatory targets. This is the only re rational response to the revelations that recovery of plastic packaging will miss the 70% goal by a large amount and recycled content of, pla of plastic packaging is only 3%, way below the 20% target uh, that these companies had set themselves. Uh, the Australian Marine Conservation Society also issued a statement uh, and one of their quotes was, the evidence is clear, voluntary targets are not working. Without real incentives and clear penalties, it is too easy for companies to put this in the too hard basket. Now, um, APCO were a little bit more upbeat, uh, as you would expect. They said the core message of this report is clear. If we're going to achieve the 2025 national packaging targets, we all need to do more, but the time to act is now. We have seen plastic progress, sorry, we have seen fantastic progress so far towards the targets, but we must accelerate our efforts if we are to be successful by 2025. Now, I found out at the last Senate estimates that APCO have applied to be a voluntary product stewardship scheme accredited under the new Act. Um, once they become accredited, and I'm hoping to follow that progress with them and with the department, once they become accredited, the minister, uh, in this case, Minister Evans, can put them on a priority product list if they're not achieving their voluntary targets. Once they've been on that priority list, the minister can then uh, legally implement mandatory product stewardship schemes to make sure that they do meet their targets. And if they don't, they face severe penalties. Um, this has been over 20 years of collective failure under this covenant, this plastic packaging covenant, where some of the biggest uh, companies and corporations on the planet that made very significant profits uh, have failed to come anywhere near their promises for recycling. This is a major significant matter of public interest uh, and only the parliament can solve this problem, Acting Deputy President. Uh, every time I talk to people about any environmental problem, I say to them, first and foremost, it's a political problem. Because only parliaments can actually fix these systemic issues. And while we have a lot of Australians out there trying to do the right thing, uh, putting things, you know, putting uh, all sorts of packaging in their curbside bins at home. Uh, we have states now rolling out container deposit schemes. I'm very optimistic that my home state of Tasmania will have a container deposit scheme legislated by the end of this week. That is if state labour stop playing political games with it and actually get behind the community and the environment. Uh, we're also seeing bans of single-use plastics at a state level. Now, a lot of this leadership has come from this Senate uh, and from the Greens in the Senate working with community over the recent decades Acting Deputy President, and I'm very proud of what we've achieved so far, but we can't fall at this final hurdle. Uh, without mandatory product stewardship schemes that hold big packaging companies to account, especially those packaging companies that are free riders on other companies that are doing the right thing within the covenant, without strong incentives from government, without strong regulation and penalties, we will never fix the waste crisis in this country. And I think that would be letting down the millions of Australians that deeply care about this issue. So we've got a long way to go, uh, and the Greens will be bringing legislation before this parliament to fix the crisis if Minister won't do this. Senator Daniel. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm pleased to uh, speak today about one of Australia's traditional strengths, and that's the forestry industry, an industry we as a country should be very, very proud of. Uh, with regard to the men and women right across this country that work so hard, so honestly, uh, and at the cutting edge of innovation and technology. It's an industry we need to do uh, more to support, I think, uh, to ensure that it has the bright future I believe it can have. As they say, wood is good, and it's the ultimate renewable. Trees grow. You cut them down, you use them for beautiful products like the ones that adorn this chamber, and another tree is planted in its place and the cycle continues. And Along the way, of course, uh, it abates carbon. It absorbs carbon. It is a big part of the answer to the issue we as a globe face, as a planet, and that is offsetting our emissions. The forestry industry will play a huge role uh, as we move forward, and that is on top of the fact that we produce these quality products and, of course, in this country, we do it to world's best standards, something I'll come back to a little bit later on. But for context, of course, 
Here we are, 2021, with unprecedented demand for timber products, uh, for housing and construction, uh, for appearance grade products, for furniture, for all manner of timber products. We have got unprecedented demand, in part because of that fantastic scheme, uh, the Home Builder Program that was announced during the pandemic to stimulate the housing and construction sector, and boy, has it done its job. That demand is set to quadruple by the year 2050, and that is something we need to cater for and plan for, and that is what we are in the process of doing. As a government, we've contributed $150 million to support this industry. That's on top of what industry itself has done and what state and territory governments have done uh, with regard to that need to grow and plan this great industry. Federally, we've removed impediments uh, when it comes to accessing carbon credits for new plantations through the Emissions Reduction Fund by uh, amending the water rule. Uh, we've provided support for industries that were hit by the bushfires. Uh, we've uh, backed in the regional forestry hubs, which are doing a great job of focusing that industry in parts of Australia where it thrives, where the right conditions exist, where we have processing capacity and also logistics support for the industry. And of course, to keep ourselves at the cutting edge, a space where a lot more work can be done, we invest heavily in research and development and will continue to do that into the future. Obviously, though, we face significant challenges in this industry. Uh, for, in terms of growing the plantation estate, we compete against other land users, uh, farmers, graziers, uh, recreational pursuits, urban development. All of these things compete for that finite resource, which is acreage, to be able to plant out trees. The bushfires of 2019-20, the Black Summer bushfires, had a massive impact on the forest estate, both plantation and native further putting pressure on our capacity to meet demand. But also there are some things that are in the power of lawmakers across this country that have also contributed to the challenges. The decisions by both the Victorian and Western Australian Labor governments are what I'm talking about here. In both of those states, they've made a decision to end native forest harvesting, to put an end to that industry. That's a decision I've declared is a bad one. It is a bad one because it is not based on science. It is one that is based on politics, and those who have made the decision know that. The problem is, when we draw a line under such an industry, demand for the products that come out of that industry will continue. Timber, like the timber we are surrounded by here in this chamber, comes out of native forests. We need to continue to supply it. Consumers still want to buy it, and they will be able to. The only difference is, as a result of the decisions of both the Victorian and Western Australian Labor governments, people will be sourcing this material from markets that, of course, don't have world's best forestry standards. We'll be importing this timber from places uh, offshore, overseas, where, frankly, they don't care about the environment, where standards of environmental protection and management are not important, where deforestation occurs, something our government along with over 100 other countries declared should stop, they will contribute to the deforestation problem this world has. Uh, and that is what the net result of these decisions by these governments have done. For what it's worth, though, in Australia, we do and have conducted recently DNA testing of imported timber to determine whether it actually meets up to the claims being made by retailers and importers. Uh, and it is alarming to see the amount of wood being sold as a certain type from a certain location not actually being that type of timber from that location, and indeed perhaps illegal. And retailers should expect more of this to come, because it is upon us to make sure that we only source responsibly and sustainably grown timber, just like Australian producers manufacture and provide to market here. Of course, the Western Australian government, only oh, less than two years ago, talked up how important uh, the native forestry sector was. It was on 3 December 2019, not even two years ago, that the then and still Forestry Minister Dave Kelly said, uh, in uh, reference to this industry, the native forestry sector is an important employer, an economic contributor that supplies our community with sustainable, renewable building materials and other timber products. He then went on to say the native forestry industry injects $220 million into the Western Australian economy each year and supports more than 800 jobs. We fast forward the clock two years and apparently this stuff that was said doesn't matter. How can an industry so proud, so sustainable, 
bank on anything the Western Australian Labor government should say. Then we move across to Victoria, where we were in the middle of negotiating the renewal of the Regional Forestry Agreement, the agreement between the Commonwealth and the state that govern how we manage this industry, without notice, without even a hint of an announcement coming down the pipeline. They announced, too, that they'd be phasing out this industry. Now, both ministers in each of those jurisdictions I've written to and I've asked them to provide me the science that they are basing their decisions on. I've given them till this Friday. They've had a couple of weeks to provide it. It shouldn't be hard. It was there to take to Cabinet to make the decision. And if it doesn't come to my desk, if, it doesn't be, if it's not returned to me and I don't have that as a basis to refer to, I can only assume that there was no science behind this decision and I have a fair hunch that is actually the case. In terms of science and evidence, I do point to the work of Responsible Wood Australia, a group who are absolutely concerned, and they are custodians of our forests, they certify our native forests, and they've pointed and highlighted uh, some of the concerns we have with regard to decisions being made. Um, they do make the point that in Australia, all of Australia's public native wood production forests in New South Wales, in Queensland, Victoria, Tasmania and Western Australia are independently certified as complying with the responsible wood forest management standard. This means natural and cultural values are identified and protected with independent audits, audits which are conducted annually. And this is a practice that we've seen in other parts of the world where they continue to harvest native forests. Indeed, they also point out that the uh, fourth assessment report of the UN IPCC stated a sustainable forest management strategy aimed at maintaining or increasing far, uh, forest carbon stocks while producing annual sustained yield of timber, fibre or energy from the forest will generate the largest sustained mitigation benefit when it comes to carbon emissions. So scientists, the people who actually assess the numbers, who look at the facts, who do the work to understand forests are saying we should back this industry in. I do want to applaud one of my Labor colleagues from Victoria, Senator Raf Ciccone, who in this place last night talked up the need for that industry to be backed. And he made the point that in Victoria they need to reverse the decision. That is something that I agree with him on, to reverse the decision uh, undermining the native forest industry. He also, in his contribution to the Senate, concluded by saying, I look forward to continuing to support timber workers and their communities because federal labour is on their side. Now, one senator does not make an opposition. One senator does not make an entire party. And I do look forward to seeing what the federal opposition say about native forestry and forestry more broadly in the lead up to the next election. It's a challenge for them. In Tasmania, they have formed, they shut it down in the last Labor Green government. We know that at the next election, the only pathway to the Treasury benches for the Labor Party is if they do deals with the Greens like they did after the 2010 federal election. And heaven help us if that happens again. So to the shadow minister for agriculture, who has responsibility, who is a Tasmanian, Ms Julie Collins, I challenge her to commit today to support forestry in all its forms, plantation and native, and to call on her state counterparts in Labor governments in Victoria and Western Australia to reverse their decision. If she does not, they do not stand behind this industry. Raf Ciccone is on the right side of history, and I hope his colleagues follow him, but I doubt they will. Senator Billick, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting De Deputy President. Recently, I met with Hobart-based flight attendants who have been stood down without pay, and I'd like to really thank those workers for coming to speak with me. We all know the border restrictions introduced as a result of the COVID pandemic have substantially reduced domestic travel, and this has had a dramatic impact on airlines and their staff. One of the big concerns when border restrictions are raised and previously cancelled flights resume again is that the airlines will have the capacity to deliver those services. There's a great deal of time and expense involved in recruiting and training new staff, so it's important that the airlines be supported to retain staff so they can quickly resume flights when needed. The Morrison government have introduced two grant programs to help the airlines retain their staff. But like many support, um, COVID support measures introduced by this government, a number of people have fallen through the cracks, and this includes the flight attendants I met with. 
the grant only assists staff directly employed by the airlines. 28 flight attendants in Tasmania and hundreds more across Australia receive no support because they are employed under a labour hire arrangement. And this makes no sense, absolutely no sense. These flight attendants do the same job as their directly employed colleagues and they wear the same uniform. If the purpose of the government's grant program is to retain trained staff and the airline's capacity to fly, why does it matter what the employment arrangements of those staff are? Another program the Hobart-based flight attendants have looked into for support is the $750 per fortnight COVID disaster payment. This payment is available to workers who lose income due to a state or territory public health order. But you have to be working in the state subject to the order to receive this payment. So people working in Tasmania could not receive the payment when they were financially impacted by lockdowns in Victoria and New South Wales. The Hobart flight attendants did have some minor relief from this payment when Tasmania went into lockdown for a few days. But for most of the time they've been stood down, they haven't been able to access the disaster payment, even though they've been just as heavily impacted by the pandemic as their colleagues in the other states. These workers are struggling to pay rents or mortgages, put petrol in their cars and food on their tables. It's unconscionable that the financial relief from the Morrison Joyce government has not even come close to covering their financial losses. And if relief does not come soon, it's going to put a significant financial and emotional dampener on their and their family's Christmas celebrations. One of the flight attendants I spoke to had been in the industry for 20 years. Surely they deserve better treatment than this. I understand the need for state and territory governments putting in place the restrictions needed to keep the public safe from COVID, including border restrictions. We know that the economic impact would be far worse had they not responded and simply allowed the virus to spread. My criticism today is squarely aimed at the Morrison-Joyce government and its design of economic support programs in which people fall through the cracks. Not only do people suffer financially as a result of these decisions, but if people are not supported financially to follow public health me measures, then it undermines the effectiveness of those measures. Remember the refrain when the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, introduced the JobKeeper bills into Parliament? I do. He said, Australians know that their government has their back. Well, those words rang hollow for one million casual employees not covered by the scheme, and they ring hollow now for hundreds of flight attendants not covered by the current schemes. The consequences of the government's lack of support does not just fall on the flight attendants, but they're employing airlines as well. If any of these flight attendants can get other employment and are forced to leave the industry to do so, I'm sure they will take up that option rather than continue to suffer financially. Given the considerable time it takes airlines to recruit staff and the further time it takes to train them, the airlines may struggle to meet the demands for flights when border restrictions ease. The airline that employs these flight attendants has written to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport, Mr Barnaby Joyce, calling on him to fix this problem, which he could do with the stroke of a pen. They've also had representations to Mr Joyce from the Union, the Flight Attendants Association of Australia, and my federal parliamentary Labor colleague, Senator Ca uh, Carol Brown, Member for Franklin Julie Collins, and Member for Lyons, Brian Mitchell. Now, a few weeks ago, I had an opinion piece published in the Mercury, which also called on Mr Joyce to act. But all of these calls have fallen on deaf ears. So I once again call on Mr Joyce to act immediately and extend Commonwealth support to all flight attendants impacted by the pandemic. And if Mr Joyce won't do it, then the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, should direct him to. I urge them to act for the sake of these workers and their livelihoods. I urge them to act for the sake of the travelling public who will need access to flights when border restrictions ease. And furthermore, I urge them to act for the sake of all the businesses that rely on travel and for the broader Australian economy. 
This financial support is particularly needed for the tourism industry in my home state of Tasmania. Tasmania has suffered greatly through the COVID pandemic and we will need interstate visitors to arrive as soon as they possibly and safely can. We are supposed to all be in this together, yet once again we have a federal government that continuously and consistently leaves people behind. Now, while I have the call, I also want to talk briefly about an issue that has been raised with me by medical specialists in Hobart. And trust me, I've seen a few over the past 12 months. There are three magnetic resonance imaging or MRI scanners in Hobart eligible for Medicare, uh, for Medicare benefits. All three of these scanners have a magnetic strength of three Tesla or three T. While modern three T scanners are the best option for many patients, some patients need access to a 1.5 scanner for safety or medical reasons. And this includes patients who have shrapnel in their bodies or have certain medical implants, such as an aneurysm clip or spinal metal wear. Unfortunately, a 3T scanner cannot be adjusted to provide the magnetic strength of a 1.5T scanner. And I'm aware of at least one 1.5T scanner in Hobart. The scanner is safe, it's effective, and around 15 to 20 patients access it every day. But because of the lack of licences for Medicare eligible MRI scanners, those patients who access the scanner don't receive any Medicare benefits. Hobart patients who need access to a 1.5T scanner can end up hundreds of dollars out of pocket. And their only other option is to travel to Launceston, Burnie or Devonport, a round trip of at least 400 kilometres and possibly up to 650 kilometres. So this is especially challenging, as you can understand, for patients with mobility issues and will substantially increase patient transport costs for the Tasmanian government. Even if patients can get to 1.5 scanner in the north of Tasmania, this will feed, of course, into demand for these scanners and increase waiting MRI, MRI, sorry, MRI waiting times for northern Tasmanian patients. Demand's already high for Medicare subsidised MRI scans in Hobart. The Royal Hobart Hospital's Medical Imaging Department has recently written to referring doctors to advise that they're placing a cap on bookings in some specialist imaging modalities. So I'm fairly concerned, in fact, I'm extremely concerned that MRI cost and access barriers could lead to delays of diagnosis for some Hobart patients. And of course, delays in diagnosis could lead to delays in treatment, increasing the burden of disease in Tasmania and adding cost to a health system which is already under strain. Given MRIs are often used to diagnose serious illness such as cancer, for some patients, delays in getting a scan could literally be a matter of life or death. I've been corresponding with the Health Minister, Mr Greg Hunt, over this issue, and I've yet to receive a response to my latest letter, which was sent over two months ago. I remain extremely concerned about the health consequences for Tasmanian patients being forced to choose between paying hundreds of dollars out of pocket and having timely access to MRI scans when they need them. I'm also very concerned about whether similar issues are faced by MRI patients in other parts of the country and the consequences for the health systems of those states and ter territories. Mr Minister Hunt and the Morrison government Need Senator to take Billick, this your time has expired. Service. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I want to talk today about a few facts that need to be um, cleared up. Now, yesterday on the floor of Parliament, Senator Jackie Lambie made, Lambie made comments in a speech with regards to, to the vaccination that One Nation is doing it for money and power. This is as far from the truth as it possibly could be. Our stance is about the rights of the Australian people to have a choice, a choice of whether they actually get the vaccination or not. Many Australians have been forced to have this vaccination against their will in order to keep their jobs. That is the fact. Also, Senator Roberts and I would have I highly regard it for our integrity and our honesty. Through, Jack, Mr, um, through Senator Lambie's comments, 
she's also made a statement yesterday that we released one nation senator roberts released her phone number well let me just state the facts because the media aren't prepared to do it and also um it was stated that we released her private number well it's not the case you see that was number was put out on a letterhead in 2014 that number was used in a Facebook page post on April the 17th and April the 19th, posted by her on her Facebook, calling for people to contact her on that number in order to put signage up in their house yards. That was a public number. It was a number that she used to tell a constituent that she totally opposed COVID vaccinations. It was a matter of choice. Well, what a flip-flop she's done, because that's not exactly what she said on the floor of Parliament yesterday. So she's telling her constituents something t different in Tasmania to what she says in the Canberra bubble. So I believe that Ms. Senator Lambie has misled Parliament. And I won't wear it because I will not be accused or allow Senator Roberts for an untruth to be told. And I expect the media to get their act together and print the truth and put it, tell the people exactly what happened. I, of all people, I understand the privacy of a phone number because I've been through a hell of a lot more over the years than what Senator Jackie Lambie has been done. And I see this as nothing as crocodile tears and having a go at one nation again. And I won't stand for it. What happened yesterday, I'm disgusted with Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham because I believe it was colluded to allow her the time to actually make her statement. We had no idea what was happening. And there, we were actually try they tried to deny us access to actually respond to this so it was stated on the floor of parliament. Although I've got to say that Senator Birmingham did um, allow um, and he got the case across for Senator Roberts to have a stay. But that's not what they wanted. They wanted to try and discredit us. Let me also now go to about the COVID. Now, yesterday, the public saw the rantings of... Um, uh, can, um, I, I've got to say, um, going back to the Facebook page with Senator Lambie, and it's very important for people to know this. She put her speech up on her Facebook page. She said over 17,500 comments. And isn't it interesting, about 85 to 90 per cent of the people are absolutely disgusted and call her statement as unhinged and childish. Not my words, their words, but I can't disagree with them. But then again, one post said, absolutely saddened by your display today, Senator Jackie Lambie, could just, uh, just, you just showed how divisive, hypocritical and prejudiced you really are. That's only one post. I suggest people go and have a look at the post because people are absolutely furious about their rights being taken away from them. And who doesn't understand this whole debate? I would say, is Senator Jackie Lambie when she talks about choice. And I will inform her, people are not given a choice. People are denied the right to work. They're losing their jobs, losing their businesses. They can't go in the health profession. These are the heroes of last year that were patted on the back for the work they did, unvaccinated, mind you, but now they can't. Let me also go to now a medical health centre um, in South Australia, it says we'll, it will continue to offer our services to patients who are, who are fully vaccinated. But it says those patients who are not vaccinated will need to book a phone consult and pay a gap different of $20. So, you know, it doesn't matter what your health issue is. You, you possibly need to see a doctor, but don't come near us. You're not vaccinated. This is the vice of in our, in our society. Let me also go to the fact, and I would like to congratulate and thank those senators um, on the floor of parliament who supported my bill. Senator Sam McMahon, Senator Connie Ferravanti-Wells, <clears throat> Senator Rennick, Senator um, Antic, and um, Senator Matt Canavan. Thank you very much. 
for your support and your common sense in standing up for the rights of the Australian people. But let me also tell you now of Keneally's rant that went on the floor of Parliament and carrying on. Guess what? She didn't even vote. No vote recorded. She didn't put in her, her money where her mouth was, is it? Did she? And also, I'd like to tell Queenslanders that Senators Amanda Stoker and Senator James McGrath were there. They didn't vote. So where's their stance on this? And they're both up for an election. I'd like to... Um, Senator Rannick made in his speech a statement that doctors are being um, told that they can't um, talk anything that's divisive or anti-vax or whatsoever. And he was uh, ridiculed in the Brisbane Times article by APRA chief, APRA chief Martin Fletcher stating, oh, well, that's not really true, um, saying the agency did not have the power to do register health professionals and adding that its vaccine stance was in line with that of the government. That may be true. But then again, if you read their paperwork, which I have here, and it states here that practitioners must be careful not to discourage their patient or client from seeking vaccination. Practitioners authorised to prescribe and or administer vaccine, but who have a con conscientious objection must ensure appropriate referral options are provided for vaccination. So if you can't give it, give it to someone else who is going to give it to them, regardless of doctor patient. And then we go on to say here, any promotion of anti-vaccination statements or health advice which contradicts the best available scientific evidence from who? What scientists? Are we listening to all sides? No, we're not, because they shut down. Or seeks to actively undermine the national immunisation campaign. This is what the politicians want for you including via social media, is not supported by national boards and may be in breach of the codes of conduct and subject to investigation and possibly regulatory action. So that means that it states that they will be actually fined or in fear of losing their licences. Why do you think these doctors are in fear of coming out? They will tell us personally behind the scenes, but they don't want to lose their licences that they've worked so hard for to work in the best interests of the public, but they're shut down to have an opinion over all this. That is disgraceful that this is allowed to happen. You're covering, covering up. Let the true science be said. I would like to read now just a, a short thing from um, Nick Cater that was put in, and he's talking about the number of people infected in the past four months of the pandemic in Victoria is four times larger than the number infected in the last 14 months. Neither have vaccines provided the immunity from infection we were led to expect. It provides personal protection against severe illness but will not slow the spread or remove the risk of death altogether. Victorian health authorities remain coy about how many of the 330 people in intensive care were double vaccinated, but the data from more open jurisdictions such as Britain suggests many of them are. The same data also suggests vaccinated people are more likely to spread the virus than the unvaccinated because they might be asymptomatic and not know they have it. The exclusion of the unvaccinated from public places is untenable on public health grounds unless the object is deterrence through humiliation. That's what we're up against. And I say to the members of parliament, go and get your facts, know what you're talking about, stand up for the rights of the Australian people, and we actually have to find the answers, but don't deny them the right to their freedoms to choose, and don't stop them from working in this nation, open, wanting to open up the borders, allow millions to come into the country to take their jobs. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In my maiden speech, I called for the introduction of the Australian Defence Veterans Covenant, which I was extremely, extremely proud to see be introduced by this government in 2019. I've spoken in the Senate before about the significance of such legislation to ensure recognition and thanks for the men and women who serve this country. Recognition is one thing, action is another. The Australian Defence Veterans Covenant states in part, we undertake to support all military veterans as respected and valued members of our community. All Australians should be reassured that the government not only says what it will do, but will do what it says. 
There is no greater expectation than in defence and veterans' affairs. Many times the Australian government, on behalf of the Australian people, has sent Australian men and women into combat to fight for our freedoms and the freedom of other countries and other people. We sleep safe in our beds at night because of these men and women who give their all. Meanwhile, too many times government and bureaucrats have dismissed genuine claims by veterans for rightful recognition. The men and families of rifle company Butterworth Review Group have been tirelessly representing the men and women who served at the Butterworth RAF base in Malaysia before and during the communist insurgency war from 1968 to 1989. Australia took responsibility, jointly with the Malaysians, for the defence of the airbase from 1970 to 1989. For decades, the review group has fought for rightful recognition of the service and sacrifice they have rendered this great nation. I am deeply concerned at the likely cost the taxpayer has paid for successive governments and bureaucrats behind computers to dispute their claims. Rather than give fair attention to the nature of the claim, the attitude by some has been to assume that the claim is invalid before even beginning to consider the alternative. Military service is not the pursuit of someone seeking to amass a fortune in funds or other resources. Many of our veterans are doing it tough because they put aside pursuits that they may have been more rewarding in favour of serving our country. Too many gave their lives and too many have given their physical and mental health in that endeavour. That is moral and that service should be recognised. Australia's history has been forged on hard work and sacrifice, no more than through the blood of our Anzacs at Gallipoli and every defence involvement since. Right beside us have been our New Zealand brothers and sisters. When the need arose to defend our way of life, our values and customs, we have fought side by side with those New Zealanders. Australia paid a terrible price in World War I, with 62,000 killed and over 156,000 wounded. From a population at that time of just under 5 million, that is a substantial proportion. Since then, Australia has never missed an international call for help, sending troops and accepting refugees at a per capita rate amongst the highest in the world. We are a moral people. We are seen by others as being good, decent people from a peaceful country. We have good laws and we believe in a fair go for all. Our veterans continue to equip themselves in all endeavours regardless of the risks required of them or the threat we expose them to. We don't know them all, but we owe them all. It is time to formally recognise Rifle Company Butterworth. The members who served between 1970 and 1989 made a pivotal contribution towards protecting the airbase. Their deployment provided such a deterrent that the communist terrorists preferred softer targets than the airbase at Butterworth. They knew the retaliation expected on them by the rifle company in defence of the airbase would have been both substantial and significant. Many times these communists planned to attack the airbase, but equally as many times they did not. Incidents took place, but no substantial attack was ever launched. People in the surrounding areas slept soundly in their beds because our troops stood watch over them. Previously secret, and top secret documents reveal the intention of the communists. Those documents were sourced from the intelligent resources of Australia and our allies and subsequently located by Australian veterans from the National Archives. Don't forget, we trained these men to prevail in times of adversity and we should be rightly proud of their efforts. Now, in the first week of November of this year, the government of New Zealand, following an independent investigation, determined that their veteran service at Butterworth was indeed warlike in nature. They cited the volumes of empirical evidence collected by the rifle company Butterworth Review Group 
and shared with their New Zealand counterparts in a spirit of brotherhood and support for a common cause. At this point, the question is obvious. If the Malaysian government is grateful for the service of our RAF and Army personnel, including New Zealanders, and considers their service in defence of the airbase as warlike, and the New Zealand government is grateful to its veterans for their service and considers that service as warlike, then what are we doing here in Australia? Is this what is meant in the Covenant when we say support all military veterans as respected and valued members of our community? Historically, governments of Australia have sadly ignored those veterans, denying them a voice, sometimes not willing to meet with them to hear of their claim, even going so far as to create a deception to cover up the denial of the warlike nature of the service at Butterworth. Is that moral? At their own expense, the veterans of the rifle company Butterworth Review Group commissioned an independent ethicist to, to examine their claim. That ethicist group's findings support the claim and purports a breach by the Australian government and the Australian Public Service in denying this recognition. This breach has spanned decades, denying our diggers what is rightfully theirs. The effort applied to denying the claim has been far greater than the value of the claim. Sadly, a great many of the veterans who served at Butterworth during the period 1970 to 1989 have passed away, and the remaining number is less to be than 2,000 who served for the period of the communist insurgency war. The Morrison government is in the prime position to do what many governments should have taken the opportunity to do so previously. It is time to recognise rifle company Butterworth. Not only do the RCP, RCB members deserve it, but it is the right thing to do. It is the moral thing to do. Again, I restate my calls for the government to correct a wrong that has been perpetrated on our veterans for over 50 years. I thank the members of RCB for their service. I thank and honour the service of all defence personnel, both past, present and future. And I'd also like to recommend the devotion of the rifle company Butterworth, Butterworth Review Group and their families for their tireless advocacy. Wouldn't it be great if those surviving veterans could proudly wear the medals in recognition of their warlike service next Anzac Day? The brothers across the ditch will be, as will those who now call Australia home. Now that will be a moral and just outcome. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, the ABC really has been taken over by a cabal of wokists who are in an axis of, of power sharing with first nighters who love going to the opera. And I think it is time for there to be a review, not just into the ABC and the SBS, but a review into the future of public broadcasting in Australia. We have a $1.1 billion woke corporation who are out of control, a $1.1 billion corporation who sneer at mainstream Australia, a, a corporation who fail to understand where the quiet Australians are at. We have a chair of the ABC who believes the ABC is a country apart from Australia. It is time for a commission of inquiry into our Senator public broadcast. Senator McGraw, your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to update the Senate on the developing COVID outbreak here in the Northern Territory. While other parts of Australia start to come out of the other end of this pandemic, hopefully, the Northern Territory is facing its biggest threat since the pandemic began. We've just heard news of 11 new cases here in the Northern Territory, bringing our numbers to over 50 cases. On Saturday, the remote bush community of Binjari, with a population of around just 190 people, recorded nine new cases of the virus. 
We're now seeing the consequences of the Morrison government's failure to roll out the vaccine in the Territory and provide appropriate information to vulnerable communities in the time that he had promised he would. As a result, misinformation is absolutely rampant on social media, and I condemn these dangerous, dangerous lies that are taking place across social media. The vaccine is safe, and no one here in the Northern Territory has died from the vaccine. And I need to reiterate that. No one here in the Northern Territory has died uh, from taking the vaccine. And it's important uh, that our communities in particular are aware of it. In fact, the vaccine has saved many lives. I'm frustrated to also, Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy President, with the failure of the Morrison government in ensuring priority groups were sufficiently vaccinated here in the Northern Territory and elsewhere. More work needs to be done to combat uh, those dangerous misinformation on vaccines. Indigenous people were meant to be a priority. We were supposed to be one of the first lot to be vaccinated. And here we are near Christmas with a major pandemic on our hands and largely First Nations people who are infected. But the Morrison government failed in achieving their own target. And it must be said, it must be realised, Madam Acting Deputy President, that that failure leaves us where we are today. Yes, we should certainly celebrate achieving broad vaccination targets across Australia as a whole. The government should be ashamed that some of our most vulnerable communities here in the Territory have doubled those vaccination rates as low as 20%. The government has dragged its heels in providing effective communication strategies to educate and encourage Indigenous people to protect themselves, their community and the wider territory by getting the vaccine. The government took months to listen to community groups and provide funding to First Nations Media Australia in particular to produce and distribute culturally appropriate messaging in language. Unfortunately for some, it is too late, as this vacuum has been filled with dangerous misinformation on vaccines, which are reinforced by some of the Prime Minister's own backbenchers. It's embarrassing to see Coalition members turn their back on science, truth and the life-saving work of our nurses and doctors. Already here today, we're at 41 degrees in the Northern Territory, we have health workers out there in heavy PPE gear to try to protect our most vulnerable. They are out there in the humidity, the top end humidity of the wet season and in 41 degrees. These people need our support, not our con condemnation. So I'm incredibly grateful for the tireless work of our Territory healthcare staff who are bearing the brunt of this pandemic. Many nurses and doctors are working far away from their families. We've seen millions of people die from COVID overseas. We've seen hundreds of people die here in Australia, in Victoria and New South Wales. We do not want to see the same disaster unfold here in the Northern Territory. Order. Senator McCarthy, your time has expired. We now move to two minutes statements. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, as last two years of rolling lockdowns across Australia have shown, access to reliable, high-quality internet connection is essential. Now, it's not a luxury, it's a utility, and it's important that we get it right in this country. And yet what we have seen from the government is failure after failure. And as, as is so the, often the case, the coalition is neglecting regional areas which have been impacted the, the worst. Mr Acting Deputy President, there is no getting away from the fact that the Liberal and National parties have left regional Australia behind where over 1.8 million homes have been dotted with copper-based fibre to the node. Now, for instance, in the electorate of Wannon, in Warrnambool, just over 400 homes enjoy a fibre-to-the-premise connection. And that's compared to over 15,000 that are on the government's low-rent fibre-to-the-node scheme. In Hamilton, a nearby town, not a single home has fibre-to-the-premise, not even one. While the Morrison-Joyce government continues to leave regional Australians behind, Labor has a plan, a plan to deliver them the same high-quality internet access that those who live in metropolitan areas often take for granted. 
Our plan will deliver regional Australians the broadband that they deserve and need by providing full fibre access to almost 2 million homes by the year 2025. This is a significant investment in the future growth potential and network resilience of our regions, as well as for small businesses, an investment that will deliver 12,000 jobs for construction workers, engineers and project managers in our regions and in our suburbs. It is clear the Liberals and the Nationals cannot be trusted when it comes to modern technology. Senator Betts. And you, with its own funds and extra taxpayer funding and support from the three tiers of government, local, state and federal, has been transferring from an idyllic park-like Sandy Bay campus into the inner city of Hobart. Whilst initially generally agnostic, if not slightly favourable to the proposal, I admit that I'm beginning to harbour some real doubts. The cost of the move is concerning hundreds of millions of taxpayers' dollars. The aesthetics and surrounds of the move from the park-like campus to an asphalt concrete inner city site makes it less attractive. In recognition of this glaring deficiency, there is now talk about greening up aspects of the city. Again, it is right to ask at what cost and why when a perfectly good site is already inhabited. During the term with students in the city, there will be a rich coffee, McDonald's fast foods economy. During the vacation, the city, one assumes, will be a ghost town. The move into the city has seen the purchase of hotels for student accommodation, which in turn impacts tourism accommodation, which in turn sees conversion of rental properties into B&B, &B, which puts even extra pressure on our housing market. One of the reasons for the move was to provide equity or ease of access to the campus by those from the northern suburbs, a very worthy concern. But would an enhanced public transport system help overcome that issue at a lot lower cost? For students from the south of the city, access will be commensurately more difficult. The Sandy Bay site and buildings are dated, but I'm advised are basically functional and capable of retrofitting and upgrading. In raising these doubts, I remain to be convinced, but suggest a genuine independent analysis be undertaken as to the effectiveness Senator and appropriateness of the move. Senator Sir, Acting Deputy President, I am concerned about the Minister for Education's recent attempts to incite a culture war over the draft national curriculum created by the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, or ACARA as they're known. I find his comments on the draft curriculum offensive, pathetic and ahistorical. They should be challenged by everyone who cares about the integrity of our education system. As part of the changes, students will be asked to debate the difference between commemorating and celebrating Anzac Day. Minister Tudge claims this would present Anzac Day as a contested idea that could lead to students being taught a negative view of our history. The minister has also criticised the emphasis on invasion theory in relation to January 26th. To him, First Nations perspectives should be included, but not at the expense of dishonouring our Western heritage. Minister Taj claims he wants students to learn proper, accurate version of our history. To him, this means a curriculum that doesn't allow students to question the idea of our society, which might not be as free, egalitarian and tolerant as he likes to think. He wants students to never think about Australia's history as full of injustices. He doesn't want students to be given the full facts so they can come to their own conclusions. He obviously doesn't think that students should be taught critical thinking skills. We should all be very concerned. Minister Tudge's gloves-off approach to pushing an overly nationalistic, sanitised version of Australian history will undermine the quality of education in this country. And we shouldn't, attempt, we shouldn't stand for his attempt to whitewash the history of this country. Senator Green, remotely. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be joining the Senate today I'm from Cairns um, and to talk about the wages of workers in Queensland. 
Uh, what we know at the moment is that rural wages are going backwards under the Morrison government. Uh, it is built into their budget predictions that wages will not increase. And we know that wages have been stagnant for many years under this government, not just through the pandemic, uh, but well before the pandemic started. Rural wages are going down and yet the cost of living is going up. People are seeing childcare costs go up. They're, trying, they're seeing petrol prices go up. Insurance costs in North Queensland particularly are increasing year on year. And yet real wages are staying the same. Well, one way that the Labor government and Anthony Albanese Labor government will fix this issue is about introducing legislation to make sure that if you work the same job, then you get the same pay. And I'm very pleased to see uh, that Anthony Albanese introduced this bill uh, in the House of Representatives this week. This is a bill that can't wait until the election. This issue is so important. We need to put a stop to dodgy labour hire companies being used by big companies in central Queensland, in regional Queensland, to undercut the wages of working people. We know that this leads to more casual work, more insecure work, insecurity in our regional communities. We know that this leads to safety issues on site where people are afraid to speak up when they see a safety issue. Uh, we need to put a stop to these bad practices and only our Labor government will do that. And it is not surprising to have already learned that some government members have said that they won't support this legislation. Uh, Phil Thompson, the member for Herbert, has outright refused to support this legislation and I'm sure that we'll see the same from those like George Christensen, Warren Ench, um, throughout Order. regional Queensland. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you. Yesterday, Senator Lambie falsely claimed under parliamentary privilege that I had leaked her private personal phone number. Senators Birmingham and Wong falsely implied I had published private information. This ambush was coordinated for the start of question time in front of journalists, with no warning so that I could not fully address the false claims and ask Senators Lambie, w Birmingham and Wong to withdraw them as I now do. The phone number in question was not private. Senator Lambie herself had posted the number to her Facebook page multiple times as far back as 2019. It's already available on the internet in letters and posts Senator Lambie previously published. The criticisms made yesterday were based on the claim that this number was private and confidential. This is evidently not the case. The phone number was already in the public domain and remains so. It's not possible to leak a phone number already in the public domain, nor is it private. The phone number was in the periphery of a post that I reposted and that focused on a reversal of Senator Lambie's stance against injection mandates to now supporting injection mandates. The post did not emphasise the phone number nor call on anyone to contact Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie's own Facebook followers condemned her speech against Senator Hanson's bill on Monday. Senator Lambie needs to take responsibility for her own comments, those of her Facebook followers, and for repeatedly posting her phone number. Breaches of privacy should be condemned. Senator Lambie's front number was not leaked. It was not private. It was already in the public domain. I ask that Senators Lambie, Wong and Birmingham withdraw any comments accusing me of leaking a private number and to apologise for them. Both Senate leaders showed yet again that decisions, policies and legislation are all too often in the Senate based on opinions and hearsay, not data and facts. And sadly, for that, the people of Australia pay needlessly, heavily, repeatedly, every day. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. After months of dealing with snap lockdowns and border restrictions, Queensland is finally set to reopen on December 17. This will come as a huge relief to many, but it is the source of great anxiety for hundreds of thousands of Queenslanders. That's because December 17 will trigger the introduction of the Palaszczuk government's harsh new restrictions on the basic freedoms of unvaccinated Queenslanders. People who remain unvaccinated after this date will be banned from all hospitality, cultural and entertainment venues. They'll be banned from restaurants, cafes, pubs, stadiums, museums, libraries, public transport and almost every other public place. On top of this, the Palaszczuk government's mandates will see around 100,000 Queenslanders lose their jobs. 
This isn't just workers in high-risk occupations dealing with vulnerable people. It includes around 31,000 retail workers, 23,000 hospitality workers and 16,000 transport and postal workers, all losing their jobs just before Christmas. Let me be clear. Vaccination is incredibly important. It's the best thing individuals can do to protect themselves from serious health consequences that COVID can cause. It's also our pathway to living safely with the virus. But there are some people who, for their own reasons, choose not to get vaccinated. And that's inevitable with human choice. People who make this decision voluntarily accept the increased health risks that come with catching the virus. How we treat these people is a mark of our society. We might not agree with their decision, but it is simply wrong to relegate them to the status of second-class citizens. It's callous and divisive, and it will push many to the fringes of our society, Order. feeding the your extremism that Labor and the Greens Please claim to be. Please your seat. Senator Griff, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I was very pleased when the Australian government recently threw its weight behind protecting generic Australian names that could be registered by US corporations. Australian Leather is a manufacturer who sold a dozen Ugg boots to American buyers. In doing so, they violated a US trademark owned by American conglomerate Deckers. Incredibly, Deckers own the rights to the word Ugg and claim that it's theirs to use exclusively around the world. For selling just a dozen Uggs, the Australian Leather Company is facing millions of dollars in penalties and legal fees. But the fight continues and it is now headed to the US Supreme Court. And now I'm proudly, very proudly saying that it is headed there with the backing of the Australian government. The case turns on a legal anomaly. In the US, you cannot trademark generic terms in a foreign language, but you can trademark generic English terms. Go figure. This is an inconsistency, but it also cuts against the whole rationale for trademarks. They exist to prevent confusion between real brands and imitators. They should not exist to give conglomerates an exclusive right to use common words and prevent competitors from being able to describe their products. This is the very definition of unfair competition. It's great government understands why this matters to Australian businesses with a quality product that some will also hope to export. Nobody should be able to stand in the way of that at all. So it's absolutely appropriate the Australian government fights to protect that right, and I sincerely thank the Attorney General for doing so. Senator Sheldon. Yeah, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of thousands of FedEx workers and their families. Their livelihoods have been put at risk by the ideological and callous actions of their employer. At a time when delivery companies like FedEx have made record profits, FedEx reported a record profit of five billion American dollars in June. Yet they are refusing to come to the table in Australia. FedEx workers presented a very reasonable offer to provide their families with basic financial security. And FedEx not only refused to consider that offer, but FedEx has also begun locking their own workers out of their workplace. So when this government, and I'm looking at Ministers Fletcher, Minister Hume and Minister Stoker, love to get up in this place and talk about union thuggery and worker thuggery, here's your thuggery right here. Thuggery is a multi-billion dollar multinational company refusing to negotiate in good faith with their workers and locking them out for engaging in legal protected industrial action. And when a multi-billion dollar company and a multinational company attacks Australian workers and the Australian government refuses to say, to say a word about it, the Australian government is complicit in that thuggery. When is the Morrison government going to, to stand by and give a damn about Australian workers and stop taking the side of thugs like FedEx, Amazon and Qantas? Senator Steelejohn, are you online? 
Thank you, Council. We'll go to Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. In September uh, 2020, uh, I raised with the Minister uh, for Finance and his department about infrastructures, uh, infrastructure projects being scoped and packaged so that their value meant that only Tier 1 contractors could bid for the work. Then, as is the case now, there are no Australian Tier 1 contractors. That means Australian businesses are unable to be considered for these projects. Australian companies are locked out of bidding for Australian government contracts. This uh, continues to be the case uh, here in Australia and, of course, it's a great disadvantage to uh, those businesses. Uh, we see the foreign companies squeeze the supply chain and then transfer money off to their home jurisdiction, paying very little ta tax. The department's position was that there was no requirement under the procurement rules uh, that projects be of a certain size um, or delivered by a certain type of uh, company. Uh, and they also pointed out they're, that they're often delivered through states and territories. Now that's a cop out. The Commonwealth rules should apply to all Commonwealth monies. We should test the economic benefit that flows from the expenditure of taxpayers' money. That, that involves Australian jobs, Australian investment, Australian supply chain activity. Now I note that uh, Snowy Hydro is a government-owned uh, GBE, and it has the Minister for uh, Energy and Emissions Reduction uh, and the Minister for Finance on the board. They're now scoping packages of steel. Uh, fabrication on Snowy 2.0, uh, which rule out Australian suppliers. Seven, more than 70 per cent of Snowy Hydro steel will be produced overseas, and that is a tragedy. Nothing like a nation-building project of Snowy 1.0. Time has expired. Senator Still, John, remotely. Thank you, Chair. Whether the major parties like it or not, people choose to use drugs. It is up to the people in decision-making spaces to decide how we manage that reality and to craft policy that meets that reality, not to ignore it. The Greens believe that it is time to take a health-based approach to drugs policy. Now, what this looks like in practice uh, is first of all the full legalisation, uh, regulation and taxation of cannabis. The federal funding um, of pill testing facilities across Australia so that when people make the decision to take a pill, they have the opportunity to know what is in it. And a doubling of the national funding uh, for alcohol and other drug rehabilitation services. All these elements are at the centre of the Greens' health-based uh, approach to drugs policy uh, that I was very proud uh, to launch a couple of weeks ago. This meets the reality of where the community is at and focuses on getting people the help they need uh, and getting people the contact with health professionals that they need when they use drugs, when they make that choice. This policy clearly and proudly rejects and moves away from the old idea of prohibition that has been championed by the major parties relentlessly for decades in the face of all evidence to the contrary. This policy is supported by medical experts across the board, as well as people that work in law enforcement institutions, because uh, so many of us know Order, your that time health has expired. Senator McCarthy, drugs. remotely. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I'd like to speak about a book that was launched recently called Writing in the Sand by Matt Garrick, and it's the story of Yoffa Indy. It's a, it was a wonderful and significant moment uh, when this launch took place because you had Yoffa Indy, current and former band members, who were there in force along with their families. Uh, the famous band, so well known and loved, achieved what no one had ever done before them. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about them through music that combined traditional Manake, Vilma and Giraki with contemporary rock and roll. They shared the stories, language and culture of Yongu 
from northeast Arnhem Land right across Australia and the world. Yothi Yimbi had started as a bunch of Yolngu and Balan playing rock and roll together in the top end in the mid 80s. And they ended up touring this country and the world and were inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame, won so many awards and became a household name both here and overseas. The late lead singer's wife, Yama Yunapingu, spoke of Dr M as a builder of bridges between all races, a legend of Australian rock and roll. He was also a human rights advocate as well as a pioneer educator. As principal of Yedekala School, he had the vision to implement both ways education. He always talked about balance. Balance was his universal weapon, his message of hope, truth and peace. His unique vision extended further with the establishment of the Yothi Yimbi Foundation, along with other clan members in 1990. And this foundation has presented the annual Gama Festival since 1999, a significant cross-cultural event which many of us have attended and learned from. We remember those who passed, especially Dr Yunapingu, a recent death in 20. 17 and Order. Your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thank you. Let me take you on a journey into tall, wet forest in far eastern Victoria. Rain is falling, filtered through massive trees towering above us. Birdsong echoes around. There's clear water in a creek nearby. And look, there are some small fish and freshwater crayfish holes along its banks. We're standing amongst massive tree ferns, moss hanging from tree trunks, a thicket of shrubs hiding us away as we sit down, breathe deeply, feel at peace. Last night and tonight, gliding possums appear, the fluffy greater gliders known as the clumsy possums for their size and habits, and yellow-bellied gliders, sometimes called flying shovels, who are known for their piercing cries. And there are far, far fewer of these threatened animals alive today than there were a decade ago, especially after the Black Summer fires and especially after the ongoing logging of their homes. These animals die when their homes are logged. That's the brutal truth. This is Old Forest, sacred country of First Nations peoples. Yet Vic Forests, the state government logging agency, didn't even survey this forest for the presence of these animals before beginning to clear fell it. So it's great news that community groups Environment East Gippsland and King Lake Friends of the Forest this week won an injunction against this logging. So it's stopped for now. And I salute these brave campaigners and the forest protesters who are putting their bodies on the line to protect these special places. We do not need to be logging our precious forests. Almost 90 per cent of the wood produced in Australia comes from plantations, and we can easily shift away from native forest logging into plantations and farm forestry. It is a political choice to do so. We must end all native forest logging in Australia now. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I ri rise to make some remarks about the discussion we are about to have about religious discrimination. I think it is important that we pursue this through the lens of seeking freedom for all Australians. Uh, and if this parliament is to grant Australian schools with more scope to act in accordance with the ethos of that institution, then I think we need to look at the long-running issue, uh, which is that too many Australian teachers uh, are being sacked for being gay. Uh, and I do think that the existing uh, exemptions in the Sex Discrimination Act uh, are not fit for purpose. I think that we need to look to separate the question of uh, ethos from raw discrimination. Uh, I don't think that someone should be sacked for being gay. Um, I don't think that teachers will be sacked for being Jewish or a particular ethnicity. But I do think and I do know that teachers are being sacked in New South Wales for being gay. So um, if we are going to uh, go down this path of looking into providing schools with more authority to act in accordance with their ethos, which is an entirely reasonable proposition. Uh, I do think we need to clean up this issue where too many teachers and indeed students uh, are being excluded from schools. Um, I think that we need to align the processes so that this can all be dealt with at the same time. It's a very important uh, principle uh, and we want all Australians to be able to have access to these institutions 
uh, free from discrimination in all forms. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak on the proposed Veolia waste incinerator uh, and in support of the locals who really don't want this toxic project approved in their community. Labor is, has firmly uh, stated its opposition to dirty and polluting waste uh, in terms of energy projects. And this proposed incinerator would be a disaster for the local community. It's only five kilometres away from um, Tarago uh, Public School, and a school that is already suffering from an epidemic of lead pollution and contaminated drinking water. This is not too far from here, Mr Deputy uh, President. Currently, in that town, uh, there is no reticulated water, and all water is collected from rainwater. Can you imagine the effects of water on, of, on water of a waste incinerator belching fumes into the air in, um, in the drinking water of that particular community? Veolia are not on the community side, and in a petulant reaction to a council motion opposing the incinerator, Veolia decided to withdraw its previously promised $2.5 million grant for the local performing arts centre, uh, which is currently under destruction, and which the council had already borrowed against. So they are absolutely not dealing in good faith with the community, not only imposing their will without adequate protection for the health of the community, but using their power to destabilise the local uh, economy and walking away from a commitment that was to support the benefit of uh, the, those who are interested in performing arts. This is a type of appalling corporate citizenship and just a sign of how little this company regards that local community. To be clear, the community doesn't want this toxic project, and I'm proud to stand with local Labor candidates Jason Shepherd and Anna Worth against the waste. Uh, to energy incinerator and for a clean and healthy Goulburn. If only the local member would stand up for the local community instead of spending your his time here. Senator O'Neill, your so time excited. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the ABC are a bunch of sanctimonious hypocrites who are protected by this mob over here who are running a protection racket with the Greens to stop examination of them. I want to talk about the complaint handling process. I want to mention someone who served our country with valour, good Heston Russell. Now, Heston Russell has issues with the ABC, and he has, the ABC has treated him and his fellow veterans with appalling, appalling in an appalling manner, and Heston Russell has written to the ABC, has got very poor responses from the ABC. Mr Russell has indeed said that he's asked for a live interview with the ABC to go through the issues because he distrusts the ABC, ABC so much. But sadly, Mr President, uh, Mr Russell just informed me moments ago that he has not even had a response from the ABC, and yet they're doing a review into their complaint handling process. This is an ABC who didn't want their, their review in the 2019 election a release. We had to have a vote of this Senate to have that document released. The ABC are hiding from the Australian people. It is time for there to be a royal commission into public broadcasting in this country to ensure that the ABC charter is fit for purpose. Because under Ida Buttrose, the ABC is another country, but it is not Australia. It is time that the taxpayers got value for money. It is time for the ABC to stand up for mainstream Australia. Thank you, Senator McGrath. We will now move to question time. Senator Wong, I will just address the issue you raised yesterday before we start. S Senator Wong, you did raise a point of order and you did ask me to come back to the chamber on it. Yesterday, I undertook to review the Hansard in relation to a point of order raised by the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Wong, and come back to the Senate. The point of order related to the requirement in Standing Order 72 that answers must be directly relevant to the questions asked. Previous rulings make clear that a minister cannot simply answer the question at the beginning of their response and then talk about matters that are not directly relevant for the remainder of their time. Every part of an answer must be directly relevant to the question. It is my intention to continue applying those rulings, and I have done so. I have also previously observed that a glancing phrase in an answer is not going to make someone not directly relevant, but that an answer that consisted of simply attacking the opposition would not be directly relevant. After points of order on the first supplementary question, I brought the minister back to the question. 
However, the point of order I undertook to review was taken in respect to Senators Wong's, Senator Wong's second supplementary question, which asked the minister, in his representative capacity, his opinion on the views of his colleagues. Past rulings have indicated that where a question is politically loaded, a minister is entitled to some wider latitude to address the terms, assertions and imputations in the question. I would view a question asking for an opinion in a representative capacity of the views of others is also allowed a similar latitude. A point of order was also taken on the Leader of the Government not facing the Chair when answering questions. Uh, as I said at the time, there was no point of order. The requirement in the standing orders is about language, not body language, requiring remarks to be addressed to the Chair. I am perfectly comfortable with all senators looking to the Chamber whilst addressing their remarks to me. Senator Wong. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did the Morrison-Joyce government this morning refuse to pass a motion in the Senate which noted with concern, and I quote, increasing reports of threats of violence from an extreme element of society towards health workers, health officials, premiers and other parliamentarians? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr President, let me deal firstly with the uh, specific facts in relation to uh, the motion. And Senator Wong has uh, carefully worded her question around uh, why did the government refuse to pass, not why did the government oppose. And, uh, and that is, of course, because the motion itself was never actually put to the chamber. Uh, the motion itself was not put to the chamber because the government, as we have consistently done, uh, as we have consistently done uh, since uh, the temporary orders in relation to motions were put through this chamber, uh, opposed an attempt to vary the order of business at the commencement of proceedings. Uh, we have consistently done that uh, each and every time, I believe, uh, there has been a move to do so uh, since the change of those temporary orders. Uh, that is uh, simply the government's position in relation uh, to, uh, to the way in which Senate business is managed. Uh, had the opposition uh, sought uh, by other means to raise those issues, uh, then, uh, then no doubt the government would have been in a position to consider the motion on its merits and in terms of the content of the motion, Mr President, uh, can I say uh, that the government does condemn all acts of extremism and violence. The, do the government does condemn acts that seek to incite violence in any way uh, towards any of those uh, engaged in our public debate, towards any of those engaged in public service, towards any of those Australians going about their ordinary lives in a peaceful way. Can I say, Mr President, on such topic that in this place the content, the tone, the manner in which we all engage is important. Much of the debate this week seems to have centred around issues of extremism but also issues of personal attacks uh, around this chamber or across the parliamentary body. They do not help to Minister, elevate the debate. Minister, they do not help us to stay on the issues. Your time has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question? Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I, I also uh, say to the minister that the motion that he, he and his party refused to pass included this. Uh, condemned those in public office who have, for tho their own political gain, sought to diminish the collective achievements of Australians by dividing the nation, stoking anger and fear, inciting violence or lending sympathy to the actions of ideologically motivated extremists. Why did you refuse to pass that? And I invite you to indicate what would be required for you to Senate. enable you to support such, a, such a motion. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. And Mr. President, uh, I do, as I did in the previous answer, uh, condemn those who engage in violence or who incite violence, whatever walk of life they come from, be they, uh, be they public officials, members of parliament, or indeed others uh, who do so. Mr. President, uh, in relation to the motion itself, uh, I was very clear uh, in the primary answer. Uh, that uh, the government was simply operating with the same convention we have uh, for uh, any motions that have come forward uh, at that time. The opposition has taken a different approach, sometimes supporting suspension, sometimes not, sometimes proposing it. 
That is the opposition's perspective. Uh, the government's view was when we took the motions policy reforms in this place, uh, we ought to then also ensure that we are held to a consistent approach in that regard, and we have done so. Uh, of course, motions put through the normal processes uh, the government will consider uh, in terms of when they Minister, come up in this chamber. Minister. Senator Wong, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister agree to jointly move and debate this motion next week? Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, I'm always happy to, uh, to engage in discussions with, uh, with those around the chamber uh, in relation to matters that have progressed in good faith. I'm always happy uh, to, uh, to ensure that we can, where necessary, come together to make unifying statements um, on behalf of the parliament uh, and the nation. Uh, that's important that we do that. Uh, I don't uh, much like a uh, process that engages in stunts. Uh, I do think, Mr President, that it is also important uh, that in doing so uh, we work cooperatively in relation to the text of such matters. That has been the case on many, many occasions in relation to statements that are sought to be pursued in a bipartisan context. Uh, and of course, I would respond constructively uh, if we wanted to, uh, to work through that process. Uh, I do think, Mr President, that whilst celebrating Australia's enormous achievements in relation to COVID, uh, we do need to acknowledge there have been debates around policy responses to COVID. Uh, it's legitimate to debate policy responses, Minister, but never Minister, to do so in a violent way. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. How is the Liberal and Nationals government boosting the capacity of frontline domestic violence services? Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for that question. This government, the Morrison-Joyce government, is absolutely focused on making sure that we have an Australia that is free of violence. And that's why in the budget this year, the 21-22 budget, we committed the largest amount of money, $1.1 billion package to ensure women's safety. Um, this is a historic package. It's a, a down payment to make sure that we move towards zero violence in this country. But we know every Australian has a role to play in ending violence, and that's why we have committed a $260 million package to work with the states and territories to make sure that they are able to provide frontline services making sure that they are providing opportunities for their frontline workers and also developing an increasing capacity in the family and domestic violence sector. Uh, in providing this commitment as a partnership to the states and territories, this $260 million partnership over two years, that's a lot more than $153 million over four years, ensures money goes to where it needs to be on the ground. This commitment builds on the $130 million that we provided states and territories to get them through the COVID pandemic this year and enable them to be able to deal with the unfortunate increase in demand that we saw during the COVID pandemic. Um, this has supported 450 frontline operations and employed hundreds of new people into this sector to make sure that women and children across the country are receiving the services that they need. We know that the next national plan to end violence against women and their children must be more than words, which is why I was disappointed this morning to hear Senator McAllister claim the government had shown little energy or interest in this issue. That is blatantly untrue. I give you my commitment that this government will work and continue to work in a non-partisan way to make sure that we end all forms of violence against women and their children in this country. I urge you to do the same. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Minister for her response. Minister, how will the government ensure accountability under the next national plan? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the next national plan will be an ambitious blueprint to end family, domestic and sexual violence, mm -hmm. and it must be more than words. Yeah, yeah. That is why we're investing $22.4 million over the next five years to establish a domestic family and sexual violence commission. The Commission will oversee the implementation of the next national plan, with the responsibility for monitoring and reporting on accountability and making sure that we are measuring and evaluating the outcomes that we seek in this space. It will be to support the government in developing and fostering relationships across the whole sector, between governments of all levels, state and territory, mm -hmm. local governments and making sure that we are working with the sector, but most importantly, that we are working with victim survivors so that we can understand 
exactly what they need. It is vital to ensure the next national plan delivers real and tangible outcomes on the ground for women and children in Australia who are the victims of Minister. this violence. Senator Chandler, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the government ensuring the next national plan to end violence against women and their children is inclusive for all victims of family, domestic and sexual violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, we have embarked over the last 18 months through the COVID pandemic with a multi layered consultation approach to ensure all Australians have the opportunity to participate and be involved in ending violence against women and their children, in fact, ending violence, gender based violence across Australia. Uh, there was an inquiry conducted in the, the House of Representatives, uh, the Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, which received over 300 submissions into their inquiry. We have conducted two public surveys, workshops and interviews with stakeholders and established the National Plan Advisory Group as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Advisory Group. The National Summit on Women's Safety brought together as a culmination all of these forms of consultation and brought together representatives of over 200 organisations so that they could take part in the discussions to inform the next national plan. Most importantly, victim survivors were invited to participate in this because it their voices must be front and centre of the next national plan. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On Monday, I asked the Minister about a photo posted by LNP MP George Christensen of Victorian Premier Dan Andrews on his Telegram account, inciting violent comments threatening Premier Andrews' life. These posts were drawn to the attention of the AFP. The Minister took my question on notice. I asked again yesterday, but the Minister still did not have an answer. Can he today advise what action Mr Morrison has taken in response to Mr Christensen's online activity? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, I can, uh, can certainly confirm to the Senate uh, that the Prime Minister has, uh, has discussed uh, online activity and the need for responsibility in online activity with the member for Dawson. Uh, as it is well known, the Prime Minister has, uh, has indeed um, in national and public comments urged all Australians to show uh, responsibility in relation uh, to their engagement online, Mr President. Uh, the, uh, the, um, as I understand it, uh, the type of comments uh, that, uh, that Senator Keneally refers to um, were posted by others uh, in response uh, to uh, the senators as in response to the member for Dawson's uh, posts. Uh, as we all know, uh, sadly, uh, in maintaining um, uh, social media accounts with avenues for people to make a comment, um, there are uh, times in which people make comments that they should not make. Uh, if those comments have been referred to the AFP, uh, then it is rightly a matter for the AFP uh, to conclude, to conclude uh, the uh, investigations that uh, they are undertaking if they are doing so in relation to any such comments. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Uh, first, Mr President, I seek leave to table the post from the member for Dawson. Is leave granted? Thank leave you. Leave is granted. On Monday, the minister said he was unaware that Mr Christensen had posted a video of Catherine King, MP, which incited threatening comments directed at Ms King, and that post was drawn to the attention of the AFP. I asked again yesterday, but the minister still did not have an answer. Has the, can the minister advise that whether Mr Morrison has taken any uh, action in relation to Mr Christensen in relation to these threats against Ms King? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, I would draw the senator's attention to the answer I just gave. Uh, that answer uh, covers um, the posts in question uh, and uh, and the uh, discussions that have been had and the actions that are rightly in the domain of the AFP. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary question. Uh, again, I, I seek leave to table documents relating to the issue regarding Ms. King. There's um, leave granted. The post from Mr. Do the member Dawson. Thank you. Leave is granted. Thank you. Given the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police revealed on Monday he has been investigating various threats against parliamentarians, and yesterday WA Premier Mark McGowan disclosed threats to behead him and his family were recently made, why has it taken this minister two days to answer questions on this serious issue? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, um, uh, it is. It is completely 
uh, unacceptable uh, and right of condemnation uh, and worthy of condemnation uh, when uh, threats are made against any Australian, including, of course, those of us you know, who serve in public office uh, and public life. Uh, far too many of us have, uh, have seen uh, such threats, violent action, have had to engage with those who work so hard uh, to, uh, to help to protect us as they do to help to protect uh, the nation through our different law enforcement agencies. And, uh, and I place on record my thanks, and I know the thanks of all senators who've had to engage uh, with the AFP uh, or with any other uh, home affairs or other agencies in relation uh, to uh, protection on such matters. Uh, uh, in, uh, in relation to uh, the issues uh, that Senator Keneally raises, uh, as you indicated, the AFP uh, may be looking into certain Minister, matters there. They're the Minister, right authority to do so. Your time for the answer has expired. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Can the Attorney General inform the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is protecting the Australian way of life and ensuring Australians remain safe from ever evolving threats of terrorism? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan for his question. And of course, I acknowledge uh, his service in helping to keep our country safe. Uh, Mr. President, the coalition government's first priority is to keep our community safe from those who seek to do us harm. Since September 2014, when the national terrorism threat level was raised, 144 people have been charged as a result of 71 counter-terrorism-related operations around Australia. 21 major counter-terrorism disruption operations have been undertaken in response to potential or imminent attack planning in Australia. And sadly, nine Australians have lost their lives. Mr President, we know our law enforcement and security agencies are among the best in the world, but we have to ensure that they have the powers that they need. That is why, since 2014, our government has now passed 29 tranches of national security legislation. And this legislation, of course, has been crucial in providing our law enforcement and security agencies the framework and powers needed to identify, target and disrupt those who seek to do harm to Australia, Australians and our way of life. However, we now have a significant challenge that has been facing our counter-terrorism efforts in recent years. Currently, there are 18 convicted terrorists who are due for release over the next five years and can still pose a very significant risk to the Australian community. But that is why our government has methodically built a world-leading framework to effectively manage those persons over the coming years. We can't eliminate entirely the risk of terrorism more than we can eliminate the risk of any serious crime. However, we can Minister, take appropriate Minister, action. Your time has expired. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, to, to the Attorney-General again, uh, how does the recent passage of high-risk terrorist offenders legislation build and expand on the framework that is provided to our law enforcement and security agencies to manage high-risk offenders and protect Australians? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. President. And as we know from our security and our law enforcement agencies, terrorist offenders are typically highly radicalised and often do not change their extremist views whilst they are in prison. Recent tragic events in New Zealand and the United Kingdom remind us of the real and present threat that these offenders do indeed pose. The high risk terrorist offenders legislation introduces extended supervision orders as another tool to keep Australians safe from terrorists. The extended supervision orders will ensure offenders are subject to close supervision and specific conditions tailored to the level of risk that they themselves pose. These will complement the current regime of control orders and continuing detention orders that are used to ensure the community is kept safe by managing terrorists after their jail term ends. Senator Molan, a second supplementary question. In addition to managing individual offenders, Attorney, what is the government doing in relation to the that organisations that plan, 
finance and carry out terrorist acts? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. President. And the Morrison Joyce government continues to keep Australians safe from terrorism and from violent extremism. And today, we would have seen Minister Andrews announce the intention to list the base and the entirety of Hezbollah as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code. Listing the base and Hezbollah as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code sends a clear message that the Australian government condemns the actions of groups that use terrorism to achieve their political, religious or ideological objectives. The listings will enable the application of terrorist organisation offences to these groups and align Australia with international partners such as the United Kingdom and Canada. By listing the terrorist organisations, it enables penalties of up to 25 years imprisonment, including if you are a member of training with or providing Minister, terrorist support your time to the organisation. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Mackenzie, representing the Minister for Agriculture. Minister, in the first week of November, state and federal agricultural ministers met and considered the recommendations of the Pet Food Working Group. This meeting came a staggering four years after dozens of dogs started dying after consuming a brand of dry kibble and exactly three years after the Senate handed down its report on regulatory approaches to ensure the safety of pet food. As usual, there was no outcome from the November meeting. Apparently, ministers are now going to wait on a cost-benefit analysis of some kind. Minister, why is the federal government and the state and territory counterparts not acting with greater urgency and instead acting like an errant new puppy by chewing up the paperwork, dropping the ball and running away from taking urgent action? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I do thank Senator Griff uh, for his question and for his ongoing interest uh, in this serious issue. My advice from uh, the Minister for Agriculture <laughs> is that there does uh, remain a high level of community interest in the safety of pet food following the pet food incidents in 2018 and more recently in Victoria. Um, there was a pet food working group established with agreement of all agriculture ministers and they welcomed the Senate inquiry into the pet food industry in 2018. That working group has developed a range of regulatory and non-regulatory options for consideration, as you say, by state and territory <coughs> governments. Um, ABARES has also updated its 2012 report on the economic assessment of policy options to manage pet food safety in Australia. And the report includes options for self-regulation, co-regulation and uh, full government regulation. The reports of the Pet Food Working Group and ABARES were considered by agriculture senior officials on 16 September 2021 and again on 30 September 2021. It was agreed that a cost-benefit analysis of all po the policy options would be undertaken before making recommendations to ministers on which options should be pursued. And Senator, as you would, be, as you would appreciate, decisions of this nature that do go to uh, state and territories' regulatory frameworks do need to be able to assess how much it will cost, what are going to be the unforeseen circumstances of uh, regul if we go the full regulatory option, uh, who's going to bear the cost for that? And what are the implications for state and territory ministers as they consider uh, adopting those regulatory frameworks? So, given your um, usual concern about the efficient use of taxpayer spending, I'm. Minister, the time for your answer has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, four years is a very long time to get to the point of even considering a cost benefit analysis. And I'm not sure how a cost benefit analysis will be accepted by people who've. Uh, lost uh, uh, many pets over many years, but can you detail what reforms are actually on the table and what changes pet owners can expect to see? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator, I do recognise the grief uh, that is caused by losing pets, particularly uh, around this type of um, issue uh, that could be avoided. Um, and I assure you that the Commonwealth is taking its uh, role in this very, very seriously. But as you would appreciate, working with states and territory uh, ministers um, 
can have its challenges in harmonising regulations across uh, the different areas of government. Um, so the other uh, issue that I'm advised has been undertaken is a review of the Australian standard for manufacturing and marketing of pet food. Um, that was also supported by the agricultural senior officials, as well as jurisdictions, industry and other key stakeholders. I think it's important to note that this process has been conducted in a careful and considered matter, manner uh, in consultation with all the relevant stakeholders, and there's not been consensus on the best option uh, for uh, state and territory ministers Minister. to pursue. Your time has expired. Senator Griff, a second supplementary. Uh, Minister, would any of the measures currently undergoing this cost-benefit analysis, uh, in your view, actually prevent future deaths of pets from unsafe food? Minister. Uh, well, as you know, Senator Griff, I, I represent the Minister for Agriculture. Um, I'm not the minister themselves, so I'm acting on advice, but I'm confident that all ministers involved uh, want to see a positive resolution to this. Uh, my understanding is uh, the Commonwealth Agriculture Minister has written to state and territory ministers and asked that they consider the outcomes of that review into the Australian standards of manufacturing, um, that they consider that uh, and that the desire of many for a positive outcome for pets and pet owners when deciding the best way forward. Um, he has also concluded the Pet Food Review Working Group and thanked all the members for their participation. And he anticipates that the reports from that working group and ABEARS will be made public by the end of this year, um, as responsibility for the domestic oversight for pet food sits with the jurisdictions. This will ultimately be a decision for state and territory ministers whether to adopt a mandatory regulatory framework or continue Minister, to operate under the current contract. Minister, country. your time has expired. Uh, we now go to Senator Macdonald. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister outline how the Liberal and National Government's plan is contributing to the economic security of regional and remote Australia by supporting jobs, businesses and investment? The minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Macdonald for her question. As she knows from her on-ground experience in Queensland, particularly the North, Regional Australia is experiencing a once-in-a-generation surge in economic growth. And this is all the while these communities are recovering from the effects of the COVID pandemic, drought and other natural disasters over the recent period. A combination of high commodity prices, strong overseas demand for our agriculture and resources, uh, a good rainfall in most of rural Australia are factors that are contributing to a positive economic outlook which translates into jobs and a higher standard of living for all Australians. But while this economic recovery is good news for the people of rural and regional Australia, this success didn't just come about by accident. The Liberal and Nationals government has been investing and delivering in thousands of projects on the ground to help lay the groundwork for our farmers, fishers, foresters, miners and small businessmen and women for the great work they do in the country. And we are ensuring our economy, economy continues to grow with low interest rates, low taxes and high, higher and higher employment. We're also experiencing an unprecedented population shift from our congested capital cities to regional areas that has set a net migration of 45,000 Australians moving to regional towns and cities. And this means stronger, more resilient and more vibrant regional centres. Our government's investment includes a record $110 billion in infrastructure projects in road and rail and the 1,700-kilometre inland rail to better connect our regional communities and shift product to capital cities, ports and overseas. We spent $3.5 billion on building dams and pipelines and weirs so that we use our precious water resources more efficiently. And we've put $5 billion back into communities for drought resilience. In my own areas of responsibility too, we as a government have made available $2.5 billion to support Minister, those communities impacted Minister, your time by black has expired. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline how this will support Australia's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. We know that much of Australia's economic output is as a result of the hard work, ingenuity and commitment of the men and women who live and work in remote and regional Australia. Our investments in infrastructure, connectivity and resilience support these communities to prosper not only in the short term but for many, many years to come. 
eight out of Australia's top 10 exports are produced in regional, rural and remote areas. Ag exports alone have grown to $306 billion a year when we came to power uh, in 2012 to $476 billion in 2019-20. Australia's resources and energy export industry grew from $178 billion when we came to power uh, to $310 billion uh, in 2021. That represents a 74 per cent increase over this period. And sovereign manufacturing, from food manufacturing to defence manufacturing, are also growing at a record levels. Our government economic management and regionalisation Minister, strategy is making a significant Minister, contribution to expired. our economic Senator Macdonald, a second supplementary question. Can the minister outline any risks to our economic recovery if our regions are not supported to prosper and the impact this would have on the broader Australian economy? Minister. Well, unfortunately, Mr President and Senator Macdonald, I can identify a risk, and it is the risk of electing Anthony Albanese and the Labor Party, who hand in hand with Adam Bant and his green eco-warriors, who will choose to decimate not only our agriculture and our mining industries, but the ultimate renewable industry, the great Australian forest industry. The timber workers and the timber processing workers right across this country have much to fear from the election of the Labor Party, led by Anthony Albanese and Larissa Water, Nick McKim and all their mates with Adam Bant, uh, the green policies that will be adopted as a result of their coalition government. So when you talk to the millions of people that live out in rural and regional Australia, the, great, the greatest risk to the economic recovery to the regions and indeed to the nation is that side of politics that has no respect for the regions or Minister, the industries that underpin our economies. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Minister Rustin. The Women's Safety Summit statement was clear. Affordable and accessible short- and long-term housing is fundamental so that women aren't having to choose between violence or homelessness. Commissions may be useful, but how many additional houses or crisis accommodation places will the Domestic Family and Sexual Violence Commissioner announced overnight create? Where is the funding to put a roof over people's heads and ensure that victim survivors have somewhere safe to go when they escape? And does the government support national tenancy protections for victim survivors? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank um, Senator Waters for her question and for her ongoing interest in this really, really vital area of Australian policy. Um, the coalition government, of which I am the Minister for Women's Safety, is absolutely committed to put in place a range of measures to make sure we support women who are making that extraordinarily brave decision to leave a violent relationship. Part of that package obviously has to make sure that there is a safe place for them to go. Um, so far, in both the 2021-22 uh, the budget in the fourth action plan, we have actually provided um, support to the states and territories, particularly in rural and regional Australia, um, a program called Safe Places, which has provided uh, accommodation for 6,500 women and children escaping violence every year so that they can have a safe place to go. In addition to that, we are also working with the states and territories around a program called Keeping Women Safe in Their Home, because we need to change the dial here. Instead of making the victim survivors the ones that are the ones that suffer the pain, we need to make sure that the perpetrators are held to account. And the best way to hold a perpetrator to account when it's safe to do so is make him leave the home so that she and the children can stay there, so they can stay with the support mechanisms of their family, their friends and their school, and they don't have to leave with nothing, but only when it's safe to do so. We also announced as part of the 21-22 budget the Escaping Violence Payment. Uh, it's a two-year program that we're trialling to make sure that we get it right, uh, but that $164 million-plus program provides $5,000 to women who are leaving a violent relationship so that they can have the necessities to be able to set up a safe new home for themselves and, in the case of when they have children, their children. Um, and one of the things that we have heard very, very clearly is the fact that putting down a bond on a new place to be able to rent sometimes is the most important thing that women are requiring that assistance for. We will continue to work with you, Senator Waters, and everybody else.
to Minister, end violence against women and their children. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The second edition of Our Watch's toolkit, Change the Story, was released today. It confirms the need to address the drivers of violence against women. Will the government fund comprehensive, expert-led, respectful relationships programs from early childhood education onwards to dismantle the rape culture and gender stereotyping at the heart of gendered violence? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Senator Ward is one of the absolutely fundamental things that we have to do as part of the next national plan is not to just provide support for response. Um, albeit a very important component of what we do in addressing um, gender-based violence. But we have to stop it before it starts. That's absolutely the, it, it, prevention is the number one thing that we must do. Because if we genuinely are going to end violence against women and their children, we actually have to stop it from happening in the first place. So it's extremely important that we put in place a number of programs. And to your point in relation to um, consent and respectful relationships, they are the absolute fundamental underlier on making sure that we have a country that is free from violence. Because, as we all know, that whilst all disrespectful behaviour does not end up in violence, we can be absolutely assured that every single circumstance of domestic, family and sexual violence mm -hmm. starts with a disrespectful action. We must address that in the next plan. Senator Waters, a second supplementary question. Thanks, President. The women's safety sector have been calling for an investment of $12 billion over 12 years as part of the new national plan to meet existing demand as well as projected service demands. The government's commitments to date and overnight fall well short of that. Can the minister confirm whether the government ever intends to lift its contribution so that family, domestic and sexual violence services are not for forced to turn people away when they seek help? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, very much Mr. Mr President. Well, I think that the, this government's um, record um, stands very strongly in that uh, in May this year, the 2021-22 budget uh, made a down payment on the next national plan of $1.1 billion, the largest ever investment in women's safety that this country has ever seen. And that is running in parallel to the final stages and the expenditure of the fourth action plan, as well as ongoing measures, for instance, 1800 Respect, which is an ongoing measure that's funded into the future. So I think this government um, has shown a very strong commitment to making sure that the resources are available, uh, not just, uh, as you talk about, in terms of responding to the horrible situation in relation to uh, domestic violence, but making sure that we deal um, with prevention, early intervention and also the recovery so that we make sure that we're providing the resources on the whole journey Order. that we see through domestic violence. Because I'd like to think, Senator Waters, that you and I were on a unity ticket to end violence against women and, Minister, and their children. Minister, your time has expired. I would remind senators on my left that interjections are always disorderly. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Earlier this month, the community of Woodner in South Australia were advised by their local doctor, Dr Scott Lewis, that he was leaving, no longer able to tolerate working in a system, and I quote, with so little respect for its frontline medical and nursing staff. He'll be relocating to Adelaide at the end of the year. What is the government doing to remedy his concerns about the lack of respect and the lack of support? What is the government doing to ensure continuity of service in Woodna after Dr Lewis leaves? What will the cost of that continuity of service be to the government? And what is the uh, government doing to replace Dr Lewis? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator, for the question and uh, of some notice of the topic of the question, given its very local specificity. Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I can understand the concern of the residents of Woodner uh, losing their local GP. My understanding, having had a conversation with the uh, very, very good member for Grey, Mr. Ramsey, uh, this afternoon, that uh, uh, the, the, doc the doctor, uh, Dr. Lewis, actually only came for a short period of time to Woodner uh, and stayed for 15 years. Uh, he's given great service to that local community, and I'm sure that the community are very sad to leave him, Mr. President. Uh, and the issues in relation to attracting doctors to uh, regional areas is 
uh, a difficult one. It's many faceted, uh, and I have to say I'm really quite proud of the work that this government's done in support of attracting doctors into regional areas. In the 18-19 budget, we put $550 million into the Stronger Rural Health Strategy uh, and followed that up in last year's budget with another $123 million uh, supporting the implementation of that strategy, Mr President. Uh, and in that particular area, I'm aware that Mr Ramsey's been very active in working with his uh, colleagues, uh, Minister Hunt uh, and Minister Gillespie, uh, to work on local solutions. And I'm advised, Mr President, that uh, Minister Gillespie's ha also had a number of conversations, direct conversations, with the South Australian Minister, Minister for Health, Mr Minister Wade, to see what the, the two governments can do together uh, to, in support of providing GP services in that local area. Uh, Mr President, I'm also aware that uh, Minister Hunt, following a conversation, provided $300,000 to support a report that's being done by the Northern Air Health Alliance, which will be handed Minister, to Minister Hunt very soon. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Sounds like a lot of uh, talk and not a lot of action at this point. Kimber has, own, uh, has had a, a doctor for only two of the last six years. Currently, they are being serviced by locums when those locums are available. Mayor Dean Johnson tells me that they have no doctor in Kimber this week, a week where South Australia is opening up its borders to COVID. What is the government doing to remedy this situation in Kimber? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can I say I do reject the allegation made at the outset of that question. Uh, I have to say Mr Ramsey has been uh, very actively working with his ministerial colleagues uh, and minister, minister, well, ministerial, ministerial colleagues working again closely with the uh, South Australian government. As I was just saying towards the end of my answer, um, Mr Ramsey secured $300,000 for the Northern Air Health Alliance to uh, undertake a piece of work to see what would be the most effective things in attracting and retaining doctors specifically in the Kimber region, Mr. President, uh, and so he's actually out there doing the job and working hard for his constituents. And I acknowledge Senator Patrick your concern for the community as well. Uh, and this is an important issue, but it is complex. Uh, and so we are working with that community, uh, providing them with resources to help uh, come to solutions and facilitate the attraction of doctors into those particular Minister, communities, because we understand Minister, it's important. Your time has expired, Senator Patrick. A second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Woodner and Kimber, 100 kilometres apart in the centre of the Eyre Peninsula, soon won't have a doctor in sight. Does the minister accept that there is a real potential for death to occur from an incident or accident and the direct inability to respond with a qualified doctor in short time? Does the government accept that it will be responsible for deaths in these circumstances? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Senator, I think it's really unfortunate that you try and portray uh, any tragic incident that might occur in a local community in those circumstances. And there are other provisions that the government in place, including uh, specific arrangements with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, for example, that provide support into regional areas. But as I've said in my two uh, initial answers, there is direct action and act activity being undertaken by the local member uh, with local communities, with his ministerial colleagues uh, and the state government in efforts to attract doctors to the region, Mr President. Uh, Dr Lewis um, has not left yet, but has, has, I think, quite responsibly given the community some notice uh, that he is going to go. It gives the community, uh, uh, the government, state, federal and local, the opportunity to work together to see what they can do to attract uh, additional Minister, services to the region Minister, in a very complex your time and uh, climate. has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did Mr Morrison tell the March for Justice protesters that they were lucky not to be met with bullets, but when protesters marched across Victoria, threatening to hang the Premier, including one with gallows, he spoke about how he understood their frustrations. He did say that. The Minister representing the Prime Minister. Order. Order. 
Minister, Minister, just resume your seat. We'll wait till the chamber is silent. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, it is a problem in this place in relation to the way in which uh, questions are put and conduct occurs uh, when statements are taken significantly out of context. Uh, I do reject the premise of this question, Mr. President, uh, and in doing so, uh, I note very Order much uh, that the leg. Prime Minister, at the time, if my memory is correct, uh, was noting indeed in countries like Australia, which indeed is what makes the right of Senator all to Ayers. protest in this country a safer one and should be a safe Senator one, unlike, unlike in so many other parts of the world, so tragically. But that, Mr. President, shows, in terms of the context of this question, the extent to which those opposite seek to take the low road uh, in politics, the low road in politics. While on this side, on this side, Mr. President, I note, I note, Mr. President, the appalling absence of questions on Senator policy Wall. issues from those opposite. The appalling absence, Senator the appalling absence of questions right. related to policy on Senator that side. Wall. We are proud as a government. We are proud as a government uh, to be leading a country that has achieved some of the lowest fatality Senator rates from COVID-19, some of the highest vaccination rates in relation to COVID-19, and some of the strongest economic outcomes in managing through this disaster and challenge. We're proud as a Senator government, Ayers. Mr. President, to have seen some 700,000 jobs come back from the worst stages of the COVID-19 economic hit. To see record numbers of apprenticeship commencements occurring as a result Order. of our policies. These are the types of policies those opposite could choose uh, to ask about, but don't ask about. Uh, because for them, for them, they choose uh, to make it personal Minister, and they choose to take the low Minister, road. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Walsh, your sub Sen Senator Walsh, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, I'm attempting to give one of uh, the opposition's members the call, and you are interjecting across the chamber. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. On the weekend, the protesters whose frustrations Mr Morrison said he understood heard from one speaker, and I quote, are we willing to go to the absolute end? Is it fair to say that we Order. will go to any length necessary to rid our parliament Order. of those traitorous politicians? Order. Are these the frustrations Mr Morrison says he understands? Of course they are. It, uh, sorry, just before I call you, Minister, interjections are always disorderly. I was, I was trying, no, I was trying to listen. I was attempting to listen to the content of the question, which presumably you want me to do, Senator Wong. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, the comments that were quoted clearly deserve condemnation. They have been condemned, uh, such comments, by the Prime Minister, by me, by many others, many times, continuously uh, during the course of events uh, since those protests occurred, Mr. President, and again, it's an example of those opposite, uh, in terms of the type of character destruction they're trying to undertake, in terms of the personalisation of politics they're trying to undertake, uh, all to, of course, uh, cover up for the policy vacuum uh, that they have. Uh, Mr. President, those opposite, those opposite should reflect on the fact uh, that you know, they uh, are continuing to try Order. to seek to exacerbate uh, and to highlight. Uh, the types of problems and divisions that do not help us as a country uh, in terms of sensibly dealing with the challenges we face. And as a country, we have overwhelmingly, through COVID-19, dealt with issues sensibly and successfully as a nation. Oh, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Walsh, a second supplementary question. The same speaker said at the protest, and I quote, there is no doubt in my mind that we are winning. Would protesters who are willing to go to any length necessary still think they were winning if they hadn't been backed by the Prime Minister of Australia? 
order. Minister. Well, Mr. President, I again reject the premise uh, of that question. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, was very clear, very clear in relation to his condemnation uh, of violence, very clear in relation order. to the fact that it has no place in any protest, in any other such activity, uh, nor uh, those seeking uh, to, uh, to provoke or promote acts of violence in any way. Uh, now, for those opposite who want to keep repeating and repeating and repeating a falsehood and an assertion, uh, that is a matter for them to explain why it is that rather than wanting to come into this place and debate uh, the issues for Australians around uh, their jobs, their lives, the, the many challenges that people face, which we pleasingly have seen them come through COVID-19 uh, in such a successful way, as I say, and some of the lowest fatality rates around the world in this country, some of the strongest economic outcomes, some of the highest vaccination rates. This is a testament to Minister, Australia's success. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Brake. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's director ID program is making it easier for small business to engage with government as we reopen the economy? The Minister for Superannuation, Senator Hume. I thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Bragg for his question. Mr President, businesses large and small are at their most productive and competitive when they spend less time on paperwork and more time focused on what they do best. That's why the Morrison government's modernising businesses registered program will deliver a single entry point to streamline how businesses register, view and maintain information with the government. This new fast and easy to use platform announced as part of the Morrison government's digital business plan will bring together more than 30 ASIC registers and the Australian business register onto a new modern system at the ATO. A major component of this program is the establishment of director IDs. As of 1 November this year, Australia's 2.7 million company directors can now quickly and easily apply for their new director ID online using the Australian Business Registry Services website. This unique 15-digit identifier only takes minutes to apply for, but it will stay with a director for life, even as directors move between different roles, different businesses and even different countries. In a world of increasing identity theft and cyber security threats, Director ID offers far greater identity security than is currently available. More importantly, Mr. President, Director ID will help to level the playing field for honest businesses. They will present the use of fictitious directors, help regulators trace directors' relationships with companies over many years and over time, and better identify director involvement in unlawful activities, such as illegal Phoenix activity. To apply for a director ID, directors can very simply log on to the Australian Business Register service online using the MyGov ID app. It's free to apply and available to directors within Australia and overseas. Applications can be made by phone, they can be made by paper and for those who need it, but the online application form takes only minutes to, just to complete and their director ID is issued instantly. Senator Bragg, a supplementary uh, question. Thank you very much, Mr President. Order. I, I can't hear with the masks on. It's hard to hear the interjections. Well, interjections um, are always disorderly, Senator Well, there Bragg. you go. So See? That's, let's, how, let's, silence that, on my left, Senator what a, Bragg. What a tremendous time. Order. Can't hear you either, sorry. <laughs> Order. Senator Very good. That's a good zinger. Sen well done. Senator O'Neill. I, I can't hear that either, sorry. Senator Bragg. Send us an email. I think this is your time. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. Senator Keneally. I've got enough time to read the question, so it'll be okay. Don't worry. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister detail to the Senate the uptake of director IDs to date? Minister. 
Thank you again, Senator Bragg. Mr. President, since the 1st of November this year, in just the first two weeks of the rollout, we've seen more than 70,000 director IDs issued. 96 per cent of director ID applications have been digital. And the Australian Business Registry Services website has had over 500,000 unique page views since the beginning of November alone. Mr President, these are extraordinary figures, especially given the rollout is still in its public beta phase, and they're a testament to industry and the community's support for this particularly important program. And with 96 per cent of applications made digitally and online, it highlights businesses' support for this government's efforts to improve the efficiency of registry service transactions in online settings. Indeed, while the opposition will talk about illegal Phoenix activity, only the coalition government will actually address it. Senator Bragg, a second thanks, supplementary question. Thanks very much, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate which stakeholders have said what about the measure and how it will help secure the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Bragg. Mr. President, the Australian business community has wholeheartedly supported and embraced the Director ID program as part of the Morrison government's commitment to cut red tape for business. The Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry said that the consolidation of business registers will simplify businesses' interactions with government and reduce duplication. Businesses need only tell government once. Similarly, the Australian Institute of Company Directors recognised the program's value as a flexible and technology-neutral modern business registry, registry regime and its potential to stop criminal behaviour and illegal Phoenix activity. Director ID is just one of the many business-focused solutions that the Morrison government is implementing to make doing business easier, fairer, faster and safer. And it's part of Australia's commitment to being a leading digital economy and society by 2030. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I rise to ask a question of the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. O on what date did Mr. Morrison first become aware of Mr. Christensen's posts, which incited threats of violence against Premier Andrews? And Catherine King. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, a few things in relation to, uh, to uh, this question. Uh, I'm not uh, aware of, uh, of precise dates in relation to those posts. As I said earlier in this week, uh, I certainly was only aware of them uh, when Senator Keneally asked. Um, uh, the next point I'd make, uh, Mr. President, is, uh, is that uh, I think it is. Uh, uh, it is important that we are clear in relation to these matters. Uh, it is uh, apparently, and I've not seen the comments that Senator Keneally has been asking about during the week, but these are comments that have been made uh, on uh, Mr Christensen's posts, uh, not, uh, not, of course, the posts themselves in relation uh, to, uh, to uh, acts of violence. Um, Mr. Mr President, I also uh, wish while I'm on my feet uh, to correct the record in relation to the answer I gave Senator Keneally earlier today. Uh, I understand, as I indicated at the time, of course, the Prime Minister has publicly uh, urged all Australians to show responsibility in relation to social media platforms and the like in relation to conversations with uh, the member for Dawson about responsibility on social media platforms and the like. Those conversations have been had by the leader of the National Party, the Deputy Prime Minister. The minister has completed his answer. Do you have a supplementary question, Senator O'Neill? I would hope that the minister might take the last question on notice, seeing as he was unable to provide an answer to a very specific question. Um, my next question, uh, Deputy President, is another date. On what date did Mr Morrison discuss these posts with Mr Christensen, and was that via telephone or face to face? Minister. No. Um, Mr. President, uh, I refer to the um, correction on the record I just gave to, uh, uh, to Senator O'Neill. Um, if there's uh, any information around uh, dates uh, of knowledge or the like, uh, I'll seek to bring that to the House. Senator O'Neill, a second uh, supplementary question. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I actually couldn't hear Senator Birmingham's response. I was listening. I, I, I simply couldn't hear his response. I, I don't want to put words into the minister's mouth, but I believe he took it on notice if he could get you further information. Um, 
Well, that was because there were interjections. So. Senator O'Neill, a second supplementary question. So, uh, thank you. I do have a further supp supplementary question, um, and is that that is will Mr. Morrison ask Mr. Christensen to remove his incendiary posts, and if not, why not? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, as members of Parliament, uh, we are all responsible uh, for our own actions. Uh, and for those actions in terms of the way in which we engage. Mr. President, Mr. President in relation to uh, the member for Dawson, Order. it is well known that the member for Dawson uh, is a vocal participant in public debate. I again, Mr. President, I again, Order. Mr. President, do draw the distinction uh, between um, uh, the Comments that Senator Keneally alleges Senator Keneally. Uh, have been posted, and of course, uh, on I'm sure nearly all of our different social media platforms, we have had cause at times to delete uh, comments uh, that uh, that have been made that are completely inappropriate Order. and that deserve Senator condemnation. Keneally. And I would urge all of us, including the member for Dawson, uh, to be so vigilant in doing so. Notice. <laughs> Senator Cash, uh, Attorney General. I just need to correct a figure that I gave to Senator Mollen in relation to an answer I provided. I said nine deaths. I meant nine attacks. Thank you, uh, Senator uh, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I table a document relating to the order for production of documents oh, concerning the sorry, income compliance. Sorry, Sen sorry, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a personal statement in relation to comments made earlier today by Senator Scar. The, the minister was on her feet. She can continue. You I can... was on my feet for ages. The minister was on her feet pursuant to an order of the Senate. I saw the minister on her feet before I saw Senator Faruqi. If, if if, if the minister wants to yield, she can. Uh, Senator Birmingham. If it may help, uh, Mr. President, indeed. Uh, I mean, Se Se Senator Reynolds is uh, is responding to an order of the Senate and uh, an attendance at the time that was so specified, and so Senator Reynolds is not doing anything wrong. Uh, Mr. President, I would uh, ask if it's Senator Reynolds is uh, is willing uh, that uh, that you grant the call to Senator Faruqi. Uh, she uh, she had um, requested to make a statement at the commencement of question time um, uh, under discussion. She had agreed to do so following question time, and I appreciate that cooperation. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Um, thank you, Mr. President. What Senator Scar did earlier today was sorry, a textbook sorry, exercise. Was, was leave okay. granted for a short statement? Two minutes has been granted. What Senator Scar did this morning was a textbook exercise in gaslighting and condescension. It should be condemned, and Senator Scar should be ashamed. At a time when far-right extremism is on the rise, when there has been a refusal by members of this government, including the Prime Minister, to unequivocally and directly condemn the far-right racist extremists embedded in the recent protests, Senator Scar instead chose to directly patronize me and call my motives into question. Senator Scar's assertions and insinuations that I and we on this side are dividing the country are absolutely contemptible. But this is what usually happens when you call, or call out far-right extremism and racism, as if we are the problem rather than racism and far-right extremism itself. We need to wake up to the harm that this is causing so many who live here. Senator Scar's assertion that bringing a motion such as this is playing politics, or constructing a straw man, is equally contemptible. This is an extremely serious matter. Just because white privileged men in here don't face abuse day in and day out doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Believe me, I wish I didn't have to get up here so often to talk about my community being under attack. I wish I didn't have to get up week in, week out and call on the government 
to reject racism and extremism rather than indulging in it. I wish I didn't have to talk about the abuse I face every day because of who I am, but it is the reality of my existence, and this is the reality of what is currently being normalized and, in fact, encouraged in this country. And it has to be addressed. Senator Scar should apologize for his gaslighting and his condescension. And the leader of the government in here should show leadership and make it clear that this is not acceptable. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the income compliance program. Uh, Deputy President, the government does not make public interest immunity claims lightly and without careful consideration of the particular harm to the public interest. As I've previously advised the Senate, I have carefully reviewed the claim of public interest immunity and I recognise it would not be in the public interest to disclose the information over which the claim has been reiterated uh, to, in relation to the legal advice and also to the deliberations of Cabinet that relate to the income compliance program. And I will again summarise the basis on which this claim was made. As noted by the Federal Court, there remains individuals whose potential claims against the Commonwealth have not been extinguished. I'll say that again. Their claim has not been extinguished. This may include over 5,000 people who have opted out of the class action. Disclosing the information requested would obviously, obviously have the potential to prejudice the Commonwealth's ability to defend the claims. The claim over information relating to legal advice has been made on two grounds. Firstly, the long-held practice of claiming privilege over legal advice and associated documents obtained in the course of normal decision-making processes of government. And secondly, the possible prejudice to the Commonwealth in relation to its conduct of litigation relating to the income compliance program. The claim is grounded in the importance of government being able to obtain legal advice in relation to the normal decision-making functions without the risk of that advice or the information relating to that advice being disclosed. The availability of frank legal advice to decision-makers within government should be protected as a fundamental principle of good government. And to this very point, I note that the Federal Court has previously found the advice that are subject of this public interest immunity claim to be privileged legal advice. In fact, His Honour Justice Lee upheld the Commonwealth's claim of legal professional privilege in connection with every one of those documents subject of the challenge from Gordon Legal. Providing a copy, or, uh, sorry, providing a copy of or information about the minute requested would or could reasonably be expected to disclose the deliberations of Cabinet. By making a public interest immunity claim in respect of the minute, the government is doing no more than standing by well-established right to protect the public disclosure of cabinet deliberations in the same way as has been done by past successive governments, including by those opposite. In interlocutory hearings in the class action, the federal court upheld claims of public interest immunity in relation to cabinet materials, including, including this minute. Further, as recently as 4 August this year, the Freedom of Information Division of the AAT found that this document was properly the subject of a cabinet exemption under the Freedom of Information Act. So, in closing, the letter from me setting out a detailed explanation about the basis of the public interest immunity claim was provided to the chair of the Community Affairs References Committee in August. These reasons continue to apply. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. A Senator Senator Rice? Yes, yes. I wish to take note of the minister's answer. And I'm sad to see that the minister has chosen to avoid scrutiny, transparency and accountability and instead just sent another letter, which is not going to cut it. The committee did not make this further request for documents lightly either. And it is essential to get to the bottom of what went on with this appalling failed robo-debt scheme that caused such damage and such harm. It is essential that the Senate sees this information. Because, and the legal advice goes to the heart of what the government knew about robo-debt, how they, what they knew about its illegality, what they knew about the impact it was having on innocent Australians. This illegal 
robo-debt, which has now been acknowledged. I spoke yesterday as we gave the Community Affairs References Committee fifth interim report on the robo-debt debacle and the damage it has caused to so many innocent Australians. Yes, the fifth interim report. And we are pursuing this, and we are pursuing our claims and our desire to see this core information because it matters. It's important to remember why it matters. It matters because it affects people's lives. I want to quote from a powerful piece in the ABC today where a Port Lincoln woman is calling for a royal commission into the government's unlawful robo-debt bungle in response to her brother's suicide after he repaid Centrelink payments while also experiencing financial hardship. Jessica Webb said their mother was contacted by Centrelink this year who, in the, trying to locate Mr Webb in order to repay the Centrelink payments he made in 2017, with the department not knowing Corey had died a few months after the repayments. Mum was confused and had to go through that process to explain he'd passed away, Ms Webb said. She said the Centrelink staff member explained that Corey had been given an illegal robo-debt and he can now be given compensation through a class action. So to Jessica Webb and to her family, I want to say how sorry we are to hear about your story. It's awful. It is unacceptable. It is wrong. And the government must be held accountable about this. This is why we are pursuing the government over the robo-debt bungle, because it matters. As Ms Webb said, I cannot highlight it enough. It is not about money. It does not matter how much money you give us. No amount of money is going to bring my brother back, she said. Compared to some of the other significant amounts, the robo-debt probably wasn't that much. But several thousand dollars when you have other debts is significant. The government must be held accountable. Robo-debt was appalling Liberal Party policy, and it's damaged people across Australia. And that's why we are demanding answers. The minister's answer is not acceptable. It's just continuing profound, callous, cruel indifference about the impact that robo-debt had on innocent Australians. I mean, the Greens, given that we are not able to get the information that the Senate deserves, that the Australian public deserves, the Greens feel that clearly the only way to get to the bottom of robo-debt is to have a royal commission. A royal commission seems it's going to be the only way that we are going to ensure a full and independent review of the robo-debt program and a forensic audit of the mess because the government is refusing to cough up the information that we should be able to see here in the Senate. Clearly, a royal commission is going to be the only way to get to the bottom of how it happened and to make sure it doesn't happen again. This lack of transparency, lack of accountability must stop. It's yet again government hiding information about their failures, denying the harm that their programs have caused, denying reality, covering up, trying to deceive and mislead the public, covering up a legacy of disaster and lies. I mean, we've seen this covering up over and over again in this government's um, operations, this ducking and weaving, this unwilling to be upfront, honest, straight with the truth. We've seen it in sports rorts, we've seen it in the car park rorts, hiding information about their corrupt misuse of taxpayers' funds and refusing to hand over information that we deserve to see. This must stop. We need to get to the we will continue to try to get to the bottom of what went on with this robo debt debacle. But critically, we need to kick this callous, uncaring, dishonest government out. We need a government that's going to support people, not a government that is just doing the business of billionaires and big corporations. We need a federal ICAC with teeth to get to the bottom of this deception. We need a government that cares for people, that, that gives people the ability to live meaningful lives. We need a government that's willing to support people not to be attacking them, and then, after they do, trying to cover it up and trying to pretend that the awful cruelty that happened, that led to people's deaths, was not their fault, because it was. And we need change.
Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator Patrick? Not on the same issue. Oh, okay. I'll just see if there's no other speakers. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Yes, this there is. Point. Thank you thank very you. much, uh, Senator. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I, I've seen the movie uh, with with the repeat and the repeat and the repeat pattern in it. Groundhog Day, I think it's called. A and sadly, that's what it's starting to feel like here in this chamber with a government that is so profoundly committed to misleading the Australian people, to hiding the truth of their shameful behaviour, that they have the gall to show up here now for the fifth time and say it is not in the interest of the Australian people to know what it was that this government found out about the laws when they concocted robo-debt. It, 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 it is amazing, Senator Wong. It's hard to believe that this minister could come in here heartlessly, cruelly and without any care, stand up and say to the Australian people, you don't deserve to know. It is not in your interest. It is not in the public interest to know how we stuffed this thing up so badly. Despite the fact that over a million people were served with illegal debts by this government, despite the fact that people suffered, unbelievably suffered, being hounded by their own government, by legal debt collectors, for debts that they didn't even own. And here we are, the fifth time that this government has the gall to stand up and say, you don't need to know. You don't need to know how we concocted this scheme. You don't need to know. It doesn't matter what the legal advice was. It doesn't matter if it was good or bad. You know, it's fine. We, we, we're through this now. Turn the page, move on. Well, there are people who aren't moving on. There are people whose lives were shattered by what this government did. Families that broke apart under the financial pressure of debts, $18,000, arriving at the door of a family that was doing the right thing, finding themselves with a letter of debt from this government, an illegal letter, an illegal debt found to be illegal arrived into families and they just broke apart under financial pressure. And this minister, for the fifth time, is coming in here and saying, you don't have a right to know about our legal advice and how we constructed this dodgy scheme that has been found to be illegal. It is not, it is not an argument that makes any sense. It is not an argument that holds any ounce of integrity. But it is a reveal, a very powerful reveal, of a secretive, deceptive government that has got a mountain of mess behind it that's trying to cover it up and doesn't want us to pay attention. Well, I've made a promise to a few people about things that I'm not going to allow to be, to be left. This is one of them. And it involves personal conversations with people who this government can never repay. Never repay. And I'm speaking about two amazing women who spoke to me in the course of this inquiry by the name of Kath Madgwick and Jennifer Miller. Each of them in separate reports reported to the newspapers that their sons, Jared Madgwick, who only reached 22 years, and Rhys Cowzo, who reached the ripe age of 28 years, were so overcome by the pursuit of a false debt, an illegal debt, pushed on them by, by their government, that they could not see a way out of it. They could not see a way forward. And those two mothers grieved their sons. Because being a government impacts people's lives. This isn't a game. This isn't a debating society where we come in and we pretend. What we do here has real and powerful impact on the lives of people and, sadly, on the deaths of people. 
And this government shamefully constructed the robo-debt scheme. With his hands in the Treasury, Mr Morrison decided this was a great little scheme that he could cook up and he could get back money from the Australian people. Then he'd be able to go out and make an announcement, Mr Announcement, and say he saved this much money. And in doing so, he chased the Australian people down illegally. Now, this claim from the government that a public interest immunity should apply to this piece of information, the information that we requested, simply cannot be allowed to stand. And I, I alert all of those senators from the government who are in here and anyone who's listening that the Senate has made its wishes clear on four occasions, four occasions already that it says it rejects the government's PII claim. It says you do not have sufficient cause, sufi sufficient evidence and sufficient justification to avoid coming clean. I just want to read to you a little of what happened to these people in the evidence that we received from the Victorian Legal Aid. Ms McRae says, I acknowledge at the outset that I'm on the land of the Wiradjuri people, and I, I, I put on the record this comment from Letitia. Robo-debt feels like a bullying system that affects people who are the most vulnerable. A lot of people don't know their rights or have the capacity to defend themselves when given an incorrect debt. I don't think it's right that Centrelink comes after people for debts without being sure that they owe money especially when it's people who are in need of support who go to Centrelink in the first place. That's the voice of people who are caught up in this. We've got pages and pages of evidence. Teachers, a semi-retired teacher who took up a bit of casual work, never ever had any problems with the law or with the government, never been on welfare, hounded for his illegal debt that the government had to actually undo in the end for three years. People talk about the shame that they felt when this letter arrived because, because they should have a, a right to believe that their government would never do this to them. So while the government makes haste to move on, while the government continues to come in here and ignore the will of the Senate and refuse to reveal the documents upon which Mr Morrison concocted this scheme, they continue to insult every Australian to whom they should be apologising. If this government had any conscience at all, it would be stepping forward and saying, this is where we got it wrong. This was the legal advice we had. This is what went wrong and it doesn't match with what we found out. This must never happen again. But that's not what you're going to hear from a government that feels it's entitled to rule no matter how badly it does the job. And you can't get much worse than raising an illegal a debt against your own people and driving people over the edge. Robo-debt isn't a thing to forget. Robo-debt is a thing to remember. And the advice that the government received, or if it's, if it's perhaps even worse than that, if there, if there is no advice, if they didn't receive proper advice, that needs to become known so that the mistake that was made by this government is never ever made again. We've had this level of refusal to respond to questions at every stage of our inquiry. In hearings, we've asked for facts, we've asked for evidence, we've asked for information, and once the government initiated its first public interest immunity claim, it's just continued to roll out the same claim over and over again. Here, here amongst my papers, I actually have the latest letter that's just come, come in from the minister. And you know, it's not dated. It's not dated because they just photocopy the same letter every time they come forward. It's contemptuous. It's a contemptuous response to a genuine request from the Senate on not one occasion now, but five. The minister's public interest immunity claim, and sadly we're getting a few of these from people, this one is one of the worst ones that I've ever seen. It smacks of self-indulgence and a refusal to take this claim of the Senate to get to the bottom of this matter seriously. And I can say I will not allow this to rest. 
because too many Australians got done over by Mr Morrison and his scam plan, and we will not allow that to go uncritiqued and misunderstood. We need to know what went wrong, Thank and we you, will Senator pursue this. Senator your time has expired. Um, on the same matter, Senator Walsh? Uh, it is the same matter. Thank yep. you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of Minister Reynolds' uh, statement as well. Uh, and this government is at it again, uh, refusing to be transparent, refusing to own up to its own decisions, um, avoiding requests of this chamber as the minister leaves the chamber now, uh, and avoiding accountability accountability for their illegal robo-debt scheme, a scheme that caused hurt and despair, a scheme that caused so much misery that some people tragically took their own lives. I remember the story of Miranda from Melbourne, who was in hospital receiving treatment for advanced spinal cancer when she received a $4,000 robo-debt. She was unemployed and applying for disability allowance, but Centrelink still took $40 a week from her payments when she was literally on her back in hospital. I also remember Nathan's story. He was served with two robo-debts, totalling more than $6,000. He had to move back home and work 50 hours a week to pay it back. Uh, and I remember his words, and his words are relevant to this discussion today, because he said, and I quote, I wanted to know why those ministers felt that it was appropriate to use this illegal system and to target the most vulnerable people. He wanted to ask this government, and I quote, why did you think it was okay? Why did you think it was okay to take money from the poorest people without giving them the chance to argue their case? And years later, here we are, we are still asking the same question. Why did this government think it was OK? That is what the Senate is asking this minister today. And Australians and all of the victims of robo-debt, they deserve an answer. They deserve a real answer from this government. It is completely unbelievable that this question is still being asked, that this robo-debt scheme, this tragic scheme, is still being covered up by this government and that we still can't get the answers that people deserve. Because despite the record of destruction uh, and despair caused by this government's scheme, still today no one has been held accountable. No one, especially not the Prime Minister, who, of course, as we all know, is the original architect of the robo-debt scheme, a scheme that hounded and harassed some of our most vulnerable Australians. This is the same Prime Minister who turned a blind eye to Australia's largest companies getting billions of dollars in JobKeeper despite making rising profits. 20 billion to companies that had rising profits during a global pandemic. Did Prime Minister Morrison or this government hound and harass them to pay back the money? Did they force these companies to deal with the same stress and the same anxiety that they forced on those people, those vulnerable victims of the robo-debt scheme? Of course they didn't. Of course they didn't because this government has a blatant double standard, a blatant double standard. They aren't on the side of everyday Australians. They aren't on the side of vulnerable Australians. They are on the side of keeping their own jobs, not looking after the lives and livelihoods of vulnerable Australians. And despite being the architect of this scheme, the Prime Minister is now saying today that the role of government is apparently to get out of people's lives. Well, it's a bit too late for the victims of the illegal robo-debt scheme. Get out, of our, uh, get, get out of people's lives, he reckons. Um, can you believe it? It is hard to believe the Prime Minister when he says this after hounding and harassing people with this illegal scheme. The architect of robo-debt wants to see government out of people's lives. 
uh, unless, of course, you're poor, because this government is not on the side of everyday Australians. They are only on their own side, the side that avoids transparency, the side that avoids accountability, the side that avoids delivering answers to this chamber properly requested. Australians cannot trust this Prime Minister or this government. They can't, tell them to, to, they can't trust them to tell the truth, uh, they can't trust them to take responsibility, and they can't trust this government to be on their side. Yeah. I'm going to go to uh, Senator Green on the same matter, I believe. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, um, Deputy President. Um, I rise uh, to speak on this very important PII claim and the Minister's uh, rejection um, of the request by the Senate Community Affairs Committee to table documents about robo-debt, about the scheme that harassed uh, everyday Australians for debts that they did not owe. And I want to speak briefly about these PII claims. Um, and about how they're being used to shield, to shield this minister, but also other members of the government from accountability, from scrutiny, from transparency, and from telling the truth to people in the Australian public. What we know about robo debt is very dark indeed, a very dark stain on government accountability and transparency. But we know that Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison has been out there, the Prime Minister, over the last couple of weeks and last couple of days, talking uh, focus group lines about the government needing to get out of people's lives. And every time I heard the Prime Minister say that line, that, that focus group line this, this week, that the government needs to get out of people's lives, well, it brought us all the way back to robo debt, didn't it? Because we know that Scott Morrison was the social services minister, the architect of this scheme. We know that he was the treasurer who was planning on banking the savings from this scheme. We know that as prime minister, he has uh, instructed ministers to continue to hide the details that would give so much understanding and accountability for this scheme to the Australian public. And yet at every step of the way, as social services minister, as treasurer, now as prime minister, he evades the truth when it comes to the robo-debt scheme. The robo-debt scheme was a scheme where everyday Australians were sent debts that they did not owe, a letter demanding payment for a debt that they did not owe. And we've heard harrowing stories, as my colleagues uh, in the Senate today have detailed, uh, of the effects of receiving a letter like that. And I can only speak from my own experience, uh, being uh, living in North Queensland, in the aftermath of the Townsville floods, hearing that people living in Townsville after the floods that had destroyed the city had received these robo-debt letters. It is a stain on our democracy that this happened uh, at a time when the government knew that this scheme was illegal. And that is why we are asking for these documents today. Uh, it is because we need to understand. We need to understand what the government knew and we need to understand what they, advice and information they were given uh, and how they took that advice uh, into their considerations when deciding to continue the scheme. This government has a legacy, a legacy when it comes to the most vulnerable Australians of leaving them on their own. But it gets even worse. The legacy has now become of taking active steps to grind vulnerable Australians into the ground. That's exactly what this scheme did. It's exactly what the cashless debit card is doing right now. Uh, it is exactly what this government uh, will continue to do unless we know the truth about this scheme. So the PII claims, as the government has, uh, has claimed, do seek information about legal advice. But can I be clear, some of the information that the committee is seeking uh, from Services Australia uh, doesn't relate to the actual uh, contents of that advice. The government is refusing, the minister today is refusing again, to provide information that relates to when the advice was sought, 
Uh, we can't even get a date from this minister. Um, we don't know um, uh, who provided that advice um, and we're not able to understand um, the nature of that advice, uh, but also um, how that advice was taken into consideration by the executive at the time. Um, these are questions that do need to be answered. Uh, and, and there is a question about whether the Senate um, is continually being ignored by this government. Um, the Senate has made a decision that these, this information needs to be public. The Senate has decided that this information is crucial for the public to understand. And the Senate has decided that the minister has continued to not make out a public interest claim, to not sufficiently explain the harm to the public of having this information released, to not sufficiently explain how general information about when advice was sought, a date, nothing more than a date, how that information would harm the public. That is what the Senate has decided. And again, today we've had the minister refusing refusing to deliver documents and information as requested by the Senate. It just goes to show that this is a government that will do anything to avoid accountability, to avoid transparency. And what we know is that when you have a situation where the government has done something so awful to its own people, so awful that it has, uh, it has, uh, meant that people have taken, um, uh, have been affected mentally, affected physically, um, stories of people taking their own lives because of this action, then the response to something so extreme and so damaging needs to be utmost transparency. The degree to which this action was taken and the effect that it had means that every effort the government makes in dealing with the aftermath of this situation should be to open up the books and let us see what they knew and when they knew it. The effects of this, uh, of, of this scheme uh, and the extreme nature, the extreme nature of the impacts of the robo-debt scheme should in itself tell the minister, tell the prime minister that this is something that they need to fess up to that they need to make sure that every single piece of information is on the public record now, that they make that information available to people. And that's exactly why the Senate has continually rejected these PII claims. I just want to bring us back to what the government, the Minister, the Prime Minister has been saying the last couple of weeks. He's been saying that the government should get out of people's lives. When he says that, what he really means is that uh, the government, uh, that we should not be asking this government questions about accountability and transparency, that there shouldn't be a two-way street, that when the government asks you to pay a debt that you didn't owe, that you don't have the same right to ask the government for all the information that they knew when they asked you that debt. That this government uh, is a government that has placed people on a cashless debit card, uh, uh, telling those people how to spend their own money. That this is a government who continually tries to tell people what to do with their own lives. And yet, when it comes to what the government is prepared to do, they will not listen to the public. They will not listen to people who have been hurt and harmed by this scheme. And today, what they are refusing to do is to listen to the Senate once again. Well, I think that they should have more respect for the Senate, for the Australian people, and for the victims of this scheme. Because if they had respect for the victims, the minister would be marching in here right now and tabling those documents, tabling every piece of information available publicly so that we understand finally and completely what was when what they knew and when they knew it. And the reason, the reason that she is refusing to do that today is because Scott Morrison was the architect of this scheme. And we know that if we have those documents tabled, we will find out that he was up to his eyeballs in this, up to his eyeballs in a scheme that destroyed people's lives. 
Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Senator Green. And I do remind you uh, to refer to uh, those in the other place by their correct title. Is that on this matter, Senator Kitching? I haven't forgotten you, Senator Patrick. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I'll go to. I mean, really, this is such a cynical exercise. When one looks at the advice, when one looks at the PII claim, um, you can see that. I mean, really, this is just a letter that's just done the rounds for, in fact, for years. So it doesn't just rest with this minister, who's uh, concerned for people on robo debt, concerned for people on the NDIS, are about as sincere as the crocodile tears we have witnessed her cry in this chamber. Um, going to the legal advice, I mean, one might think that the, they could have actually mentioned in this, this letter from Senator Reynolds that they're actually a model litigant. Now, these will be words that are really quite unfamiliar to Senator Reynolds because she wouldn't know what a model of anything is, but they are a model litigant. And as a model litigant, you can't just give a blanket statement in relation to the concerns that the Senate has raised. This is, remember, this is taxpayers' money. So we all pay, everyone out there pays, people who are requiring assistance in some cases pay. This is taxpayers' money, and she's got the temerity to say in this letter that, oh, we can't possibly release anything, anything at all, without actually looking at the requests that the Senate has made. So she's just given a blanket statement, a blanket denial. Remember, the government, when this, was us, when this letter was written, the government is no longer facing legal action. There is no longer any court action. So in relation to the legal advice being sought and the date, the lead, that would say that she can actually give some of that. So she could actually have a proper look at the, requ the request from the Senate. She could actually do that. I know that it might strain her, I was going to say two brain cells, but I'll say 1.5. And she could actually look at it and distinguish those which can be answered very easily, so including the date. But that is, again, the date when the advice was sought is, of course, another cynical exercise. And the reason it is cynical is because the request for the date would, might actually reveal that the government received direct legal advice, that they, that they knew the scheme was rotten. Now, when I look at the, lately the secretary, Ms Campbell, when she was a secretary in the relevant department, she's now gone to foreign affairs, but when she was there, she said, we've talked about the fact that it was legally insufficient. So remember, <laughs> I mean, legally insufficient is a bit mealy mouthed, but that's so much better than the minister. And in our system, it's the minister that is responsible for the very good reason that if the public does not agree with the government, they can vote them out. That is the reason why she is responsible. She should start to act like it. So Ms Campbell says, we've talked about the fact that it was legally insufficient. We have apologised for the hurt to the people on whom the debt was raised. I too apologise to staff because staff were was very, was very upset because you can imagine if you're taking phone calls, and I'll read out one of these instances. The robo-debt has had a huge impact on fellow co-workers and myself. To read the stories of suicide and customers' distress in the news made a lot of us feel sick. I have had nights where I could not sleep thinking about conversations I have had with customers regarding their robo-debts. Some have talked about suicide on the call. To hear a grown man crying on the phone whose wife had died recently and he is the carer for his young children is heartbreaking. Now what a terrible, terrible instance this is that this scheme made not only the people who were being victimised by it because they were receiving false robo-debt notices, Imagine having that and knowing what, your, what the staff are going through and still continuing with it, not actually thinking that maybe there's something wrong in the state of Denmark. But of course, no, because we've got this minister. So Ms Campbell said, we've talked about the fact that it is, was legally insufficient. I hope Minister Reynolds is actually listening to this through you, Deputy President, because she might learn something that her own department can be more generous about this than she would ever dream of being. 
We have apologised for the hurt to the people on whom the debt was raised. I too apologise to staff, but I would note that this has been going for some time. For the staff to say, as they describe it in this letter, that robo-debt was something new, unfortunately, is just not true. Staff in the agency have to deal with very difficult circumstances, etc. Now, the other question, of course, is, and the reason why when the date for the legal advice was sought, is because, of course, it might show not that the government received advice and knew that, that, knew that the scheme was rotten, but in fact it also raises the possibility that the government sought no advice at all. So it would be interesting to know. So funnily enough, the Senate has asked the minister who is responsible for providing answers, but she's just given this blanket statement of, you know, no, you're not getting anything. But it's taxpayers' money, and taxpayers have a right to know that their money is being spent appropriately. Now, let's go to someone who might know something about the law as opposed to the minister. Under questioning, the Gordon legal partner, Andrew Gretsch, told a Senate inquiry on Thursday that there was no reason the government couldn't answer the committee's questions. I'm reading from a media report in The Guardian from Luke Enriquez Gomez. So, the class action settlement has been approved by the court and Gordon Legal is now working to identify and process interest payments to victims. It would be impossible to see how the Commonwealth could legitimately sustain a claim, Mr Gretsch said, while as technically those proceedings are still on foot. It's not as if the parties can go back to court and relitigate the issues. So instead of the minister paying attention to what a Senate inquiry and the evidence before it, she's just issued this blanket letter saying she's not going to answer anything. It's absolute contempt. But really, I mean, what else do we expect from this minister? She is just, it is just ridiculous that she's in that cabinet. She's a terrible person. Now, um, Senator Kitching, I would ask you to. I'll withdraw that. She's Thank a terrible you. person. Yes. Uh, Senator I'll withdraw. Kitching, I'll withdraw. Just withdraw. Now, can I just go comment? to? I'll, I've withdrawn. Um, now, the second ground that she's claiming, the disclosure of the deliberations of cabinet, I think it's a pretty distant claim that she's making here. So she says she can't do it because there might be a claim in relation to any request. So it would be actually really useful if the minister could have a look at ministerial duty. In our, in our system, in our system of democracy, it would be actually useful if she could go and look at that. Maybe I don't want to sort of overburden her, but she might like to have a look at the constitution and read a few constitutional law cases. I, I say again, I don't want to overburden her because that would be far, far too much for her. But she should go and look at that and understand that, in fact, there is a, a duty of transparency and disclosure to the people who are voting for the government. It is an absolute basic fact in our democracy, yet it seems that that minister is unable to actually understand or pay any respect to that. So really, she should have another look at the, quest at the questions that have been asked. She should take her letter and actually read it probably properly, because she has probably hasn't done that. Someone else has probably written it for her. And she should actually understand that she has a duty. But you know, I'm not going to hold my, de my breath, Deputy President. Well, thank you, yeah. Senator Kitching. Uh, Senator Dunning. Madam Deputy President, look, I accept uh, very much this is a um, very sensitive issue, having served on the Community Affairs Committee uh, that examined one of the iterations of the issue we're discussing here. I just would ask you, Madam Deputy President, to ask those who have made contributions to this debate uh, to perhaps draw a line between a minister's professional conduct and personal reflections, be it mental capacity or otherwise, perhaps to uh, temper their remarks and uh, where they've gone beyond what is reasonably expected of a senator in this place, perhaps to withdraw such as comments around brain cells, etc. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Dunning. I'm Senator Kitching. Uh, you know, I'm given that Senator Dunningham is so reasonable. 
you know, I'll withdraw the comments about mental capacity. But the reason that I am so upset about this is remember there are people who have killed themselves, Benedict killed Benedict themselves, Benedict as Benedict Corey Webb did. When you withdraw, you, you, you simply withdraw that, um, that, um, that comment has been made. So if you could just withdraw and not make any comment, I would appreciate that. Thank you. I'll withdraw. Thank you. I don't think there are any other speakers on this matter, so I'm going to put the question that um, Senator Rice take note. So those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise uh, to seek an explanation pursuant to uh, uh, Standing Order 745A as to, um, and I know uh, the representing minister is, is, isn't in here, but um, the duty minister was briefed. So I ask the minister representing the minister representing the Prime Minister as to why question number 4291 relating to AUKUS announcements and submarines has not been answered. Uh, minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy, Madam Deputy President. Uh, look, just on that, um, yes, uh, obviously the uh, Senator Birmingham isn't here uh, and uh, he has asked me to acknowledge the inquiry that Senator Patrick's making now. Um, into the status of those questions that were placed on notice just over a month ago into the sensitive matters around the AUKUS strategic partnership. Uh, and Senator Birmingham has, asked, uh, Birmingham has um, asked me to advise that uh, we'll, he will inquire into the status of those answers and we'll get back to you ASAP on that. Senator Patrick. Well, I rise to take note of the minister's answer. Now, I'll just uh, go to this question. It is about AUKUS, and so it is important uh, and it's important in relation to issues of national security, uh, in relation to issues relating to South Australia, um, and also uh, some issues that uh, have been very, very public. In fact, I, I look at the question and I, um, uh, I see uh, a question like, on what date did the Prime Minister discuss or otherwise communicate about the, ta the attack class submarine project with the French president? On what date did the Prime Minister tell the French President that Australia was pulling the plug? Now I looked at the clerks. I'm not sure that the French President can answer a question on notice uh, through the media. Um, I think that's a no. So you know, this question remains outstanding. The, the, this, this is an important question. It goes to uh, a very important national program that we have about um, submarines. I get a lot of people ask me. Why submarines? Why are they so important? Well, let me tell you. Back in the uh, Falklands War, uh, at the outset of the war, the British media reported, uh, as the Argentinians invaded the Falklands, that they in fact had a nuclear-powered submarine down off South America in the waters around, uh, around the Falkland Islands. Now, it turned out that wasn't true. It was false, uh, but that's the nature of submarines. You can, if you want to, create the perception that they're somewhere where they're not. They are very important or very potent uh, tools. Asymmetric is the word that's often used when we talk about submarines. They have a whole range of things that they can do in, in wartime uh, that allow, uh, that, well, that other assets can't do as easily. You know, they can lay mines covertly. They can uh, insert special forces. They can conduct uh, uh, reconnaissance. They can fire off uh, missiles. They can uh, uh, sink uh, warships. So they can do a lot of things. Uh, now, of course, we never want that to happen, and it's very important that we have a strong um, uh, defence capability, a strong submarine capability, such that uh, no one ever looks at Australia and says, we're going to take them on because the cost would be too high. Now, in order to be able to do that, you have to have a standing submarine force that is highly capable and that people understand to be highly capable. Uh, one, the things that our defence force during, or our navy does during peacetime is to make sure those submarines are, uh, are practiced, or the submarine crews are practiced in what it is they do. So they train, they develop tactics, and in the case of our submarines, they also do intelligence operations as well. So they can go into areas and they can monitor exactly what is going on, uh, and uh, that's a capability that uh, uh, not many other assets can do. You can, you can uh, fly a satellite over a, 
uh, an area of a country. You can fly an aircraft over an area of a country. But persistence and stealth working together are extremely powerful. I, I say to the chamber, if you ever listen to a, ra a police radio scanner for a couple of hours, you'll find out that uh, there might be a, uh, uh, a break and enter taking place th three kilometres down the road, or there could be uh, a breathalyser being set up down the road, or there could be uh, some sort of domestic violence incident taking place if you listen to a scanner for a short period of time. But if you listen for two or three weeks, you can work out uh, the shifts, how many officers are on duty on a Friday night versus how many are on duty on a Wednesday night and what time they change over. And after listening to a few police chases, you'll work out exactly what the criteria is for calling off a, uh, a police chase, what the rules of engagement are. And that's what submarines can do in the context of going into areas and looking and seeing exactly what's going on in peacetime uh, such that you are well prepared in the um, event that you are uh, uh, end up in a conflict of some sort. They are very important. Now, uh, we had a submarine program in place. It was the attack class submarine. And uh, I was one of the first people that raised significant concerns about it. I am of the view that the Prime Minister made the correct call when he cancelled the program. That program was uh, a very expensive program. It was running over schedule. Uh, it wasn't meeting expectation in terms of industry um, involvement, and it wasn't, in my view, likely to deliver a regionally superior submarine. So I congratulate the coalition for cancelling the program. I don't congratulate it, them in the manner in which they did that. Uh, we saw, I think it was on the 16th of September, I hope I've got that date right, but we saw the Prime Minister stand up and make an announcement. Uh, really a big distracting announcement uh, utilising the US President and the uh, UK Prime Minister whilst he shut down a $2.4 billion program that uh, actually had started under this Liberal government and had concluded under this Liberal government. There was no necessity, none whatsoever, to make an announcement about uh, AUKUS on the same day that they cancelled the, uh, the attack class program. What should have been done is that the French should have been brought in, the French should have been told exactly what was happening uh, in relation to the uh, uh, future submarine program. Uh, all of the diplomacy necessary to deal with that particular issue should have taken place. The announcement could have been made to the Australian public that we were no longer continuing with, the, continuing with that program. And then a couple of weeks later, we could have announced the AUKUS arrangements, because you know, the reality is uh, we actually don't know what AUKUS, is, uh, you know, what AUKUS is really about. There's a study that's going on for the next 18 months to work that out. There is no reason why those announcements had to be made together, and that, that was a failing of the government. And my question, the question that hasn't been answered, about communication between the, 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 the Australian Prime Minister and the French Prime Minister, the French President, uh, is relevant to examining what happened in those instances, and it should be responded to in a timely fashion. So, uh, you know, I have a genuine interest in understanding the answers to these questions, and it is inappropriate that the, the Prime Minister has not answered this in, in the required time frame. This is the third day in a row in which I've had to rise and seek an explanation as to why the Prime Minister is not answering questions directed at him um, that come from my constituents who are entitled to know who the Prime Minister works for, who pay the Prime Minister's salary. It's a, it's a, a matter of respect for questions that are asked by senators on behalf of their constituents to be answered in a timely fashion. And I just would remind uh, the duty minister to perhaps pass that on to uh, Senator uh, Birmingham. The, you know, the, the, the announcement that was made is, is problematic in, in many different ways. If I go back to 2009, it was a Labor government then, uh, the 2009 White Paper uh, announced that we were going to double our submarine force. It was going to go from 6 to 12. 
and it was going to do that within three decades. So, uh, from 2009, we would expect that by 2039, we would have 12 new regionally superior submarines. That was the aim. Now, uh, the, uh, what, we've, what we now see with the, with the plan on record is something quite different. If we just go with what has been announced to date, remembering that uh, we have uh, the, the, the announcement saying we're going to do an 18-month study and in 2020, uh, 2040 we're going to get a future uh, nuclear-powered submarine, that means in 2039, when we are required to have, or we were supposed to have 12 regionally superior submarines, we're going to have five, only five, very aged Collins class submarines. Now, that just seems absolutely crazy in the context of uh, the very reason for going to AUKUS, which was the rising tension. Now, in 2009, we, 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 uh, yeah, the, 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 um, must have been the, the Rudd government uh, uh, announced the, the 12 submarines, and they did so on the basis of concerns about where things were going st geostrategically. And it looks like defence got that right. They've actually upped the ante, but they've basically left us strategically vulnerable. The Liberal Party would claim that they are strong on national security, but you're not. You've gone from 12 submarines as the aim, 12 uh, regionally superior submarines by 2039, to five aged Collins-class submarines. And that's not a criticism of the, of the Collins class submarines at all. The, the, uh, the, the men and women down at Osborne do a fantastic job of maintaining those submarines. And I, I'm not suggesting they wouldn't be safe, because that's what our uh, people do down in Adelaide. They make sure those submarines are uh, uh, in tip-top shape before they let them leave uh, Osborne as part of their uh, full-cycle docking program. But that's a very different thing to, to a submarine uh, that is uh, aged and asked to go into combat. You know, taking a, 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 an arrow into a battle with uh, rifles. And that's the sort of problem that's created. No matter how much you try to uh, improve the Collins class submarines, uh, the, the, some of these new regionally uh, uh, brand new regional submarines are very, very highly uh, capable submarines. And I know because I've been on some of, the, some of them. I've been to sea on the South Korean uh, Type 214 submarines on a number of occasions. Well-trained uh, well crews, very highly capable submarines. And uh, you know, I've worked with a number of different navies around this region. So sadly, we've ended up with a situation where uh, the Liberal government, who claim to be strong on national security, have less, left us in a very vulnerable, vulnerable position. And the other thing that's happened in terms of this announcement is we've got a whole bunch of people down in Adelaide and actually around the country that had committed to the attack class program. And again, I support the, I support the closing down of that program, but the manner in which it, was, it, it uh, closed down has had an, a harmful effect on workers down in Adelaide and around the country and companies. One of the companies I've visited recently, and I won't name them because defence can be quite uh, uh, vindictive uh, uh, in, in relation to bad stories coming on from industry, uh, the company that I went and visited, they had two to three years' worth of work booked ahead on the attack class submarine. And that work's no longer there. Now, the way companies work, for those that haven't ever had to be a business development manager or a director of a company, you have to work and make sure you've got an order book that runs out uh, a couple of years to make sure you can plan with your workforce uh, to uh, be able to achieve the objectives of the company. When someone rips out a major contract, uh, uh, you, you know, that, that, those, that, that company would not have been pursuing work because they would have known that their workload was set for the next couple of years. They didn't have capacity to do any more. So they would have sort of been 
uh, resting in terms of trying to develop further business. Suddenly that work is stripped out from underneath them and it leaves a company that might have 150 people going, what do we do now? And there has been some uh, attempts by the government to deal with individual workers, but not with the companies. In my view, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the response to companies has been very shallow and harmful. These are good companies. Some of these companies have actually invested. They've invested to get to the point of being able to tender for a contract to meet the requirements of uh, a naval group, and they've got to a point where they're basically ready to go and the, the, the contract has been cancelled. All of that investment is lost. And that is an investment that sometimes comes from the, from the wallets of mum and dad company owners. And uh, uh, again, I don't mind the fact that we've cancelled this contract. It's about how we went about it and what we are or are not doing in respect of uh, the um, uh, in respect of uh, those companies that have been caught up in this uh, in this whole thing. So, you know, I'm going to be continuing to answer, ask questions on behalf of my constituents, and I don't think it's unreasonable for me to expect that those questions get answered in, in a timely fashion. I'm not asking for anything that's classified. I'm not asking for anything that's overly sensitive. I know, I know the Prime Minister might be sensitive about questions about the French president, but they, the, the questions ought to be answered on time and it is uh, uh, disrespectful that the Prime Minister hasn't answered them. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I also rise to take note of the Minister's response. And on this occasion, I do agree with Senator Patrick. It is not unreasonable to get an answer to these questions. It is not unreasonable to get a timely answer to these questions. But it's also entirely unsurprising that we don't have an answer to Senator Patrick's questions. Because when it comes to this announcement, when it comes to the impact of this announcement, on my state, there are many questions which remain unanswered by this government. Questions which go to the heart of the future economic prosperity of my state. Questions about local jobs, questions about local contact, content in the new contracts. These are significant questions, and by failing to answer them, by failing to have an open conversation with the people of South Australia, this government is creating anxiety, deep anxiety, deep anxiety with the people working on these contracts, deep anxiety for people who have changed their whole lives to work on these projects, either in South Australia or indeed abroad. And I've had families contact me from abroad who have found this incredibly stressful. We still don't know what will be built in South Australia. We don't know when. We don't know precisely how local companies, how local content will be engaged. We don't know what the future looks like. And whilst we, we support the AUKUS decision, we're provided bipartisanship on that, as we should, there are significant questions which remain unanswered. And they need to be answered as a matter of urgency. South Australians are anxious about this, and it's no wonder they're anxious, because time and time again, when it comes to submarines in our state, when it comes to defence expenditure in our state, when it comes to local content requirements in our state, they've been misled by this government. They've been led down one path, fed something, then fed something else, promised one thing, had it ripped away from them, promised something else, stepped back from that. And now we've got more than 1,100 jobs on the line that we know about. That's not including the people working for small businesses, the people working for businesses gearing up to tender for this work, the businesses who have spent money but not yet have a contract in their hand. And Senator Patrick's right, it takes time. It takes time, particularly for these small businesses. Not every company is a large company. Not every company can withstand this kind of uncertainty. And the workers are stressed. They are stressed and they're nervous and they don't trust this government. They don't trust this government to be honest with them. They don't trust this government to act with urgency. And so when Senator Patrick stands here 
and ask for an answer for these questions. I'm happy to stand here and support him because my state needs answers. These workers need answers. We've used estimates to do that. We're using the committee system to do that. It's reasonable that on the floor of this parliament, all that information that we requested, that we need to know urgently, so that we can provide some comfort and assurance to the people in my state who are anxious. And let me be clear, it's not just the people working on this program directly. It's not just those who are directly employed by Naval Group, although of course it is most critical for them. But let's be clear, when there is uncertainty for this industry in my state, it affects our entire state. It affects business confidence in our state, which has a significant impact and a flow-on effect on the rest of the economy, on other people's jobs, on the decisions South Australians are making for themselves and their future and their families. South Australians already stressed around issues of brain drain. South Australians who don't want their kids to go into state for work, who want a bright future for them in our state. High-skilled jobs, secure jobs, technical jobs, jobs which will give them a long-term future in South Australia. But they need answers, they need clarity. We need to know that this government is absolutely committed to maximising South Australian input and involvement in this. We need answers on that. The South Australian workforce working on these projects needs answers on that. They need that security, they need that assurance, and so does every single small business owner and employee who depends on this work in South Australia. So whilst we support the decision, we don't support the lack of clarity, right? We want assurances. We want assurances for South Australian workers. I want assurances for my state. I want to know about the future of secure and high-skilled work in my state when it comes to these defence projects. Thank you, uh, Senator Marielle Smith. And so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Griff. Senator Patrick, to take note, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I will now move to taking note. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Wong. It was a question in relation to why government senators voted against a motion calling on political leaders to condemn, without qualification, recent examples of violent extremism directed at health workers and other groups. Unlike too many senators opposite, Labor does not engage in fantasy politics. We're not trying to nod and wink to those who see a deep state conspiracy behind every public health measure. We're not playing footsie under the table with peddlers of quack remedies and vicious lies. While all Victorians, and I did too, struggled with lockdown, despaired at the lack of connection and worried deeply about the impact of what needed to be done, not many, not many felt the need to attack and urinate on the shrine of remembrance. And fortunately, not many Liberal senators felt the need to adopt the unthinking, dangerous formulation that Senator Henderson chose to. In September this year, in my home city of Melbourne, just metres away from the COVID wards of the Royal Melbourne Hospital, we saw an ugly, thuggish mob having just stripped the bunning shelves bare of high vis in an attempt to cosplay as construction workers, set itself upon the West Melbourne headquarters of the CFMEU. Union officials were punched and kicked, attacked with makeshift weapons. A dog was brutally kicked, and I thank the RSPCA for identifying and charging the putrid individual responsible. The union secretary had full beer bottles thrown at his head by some in the mob. Make no mistake, Dep Deputy President, a full beer bottle thrown at a person's head is a prospectively legal weapon. It is a miracle no one was killed. But this is the context in which Senator Henderson felt it appropriate to tweet, and I quote, I condemn these violent protests, but I understand why so many workers are turning against the Dan Andrews government. I condemn these violent protests, but. If violent protesters had thrown full beer bottles at her office and the people working in her office, I would have condemned this as an act of terrorism. I would have demanded that those involved be brought to justice. I would not have indulged in social worker-type excuse manufacturing 
exploring the origin of their rage. Terrorism is terrorism, Deputy President. And I refer to the ASIO Act and its definition of terrorism. Acts or threats of violence that are likely to achieve a political objective, either in Australia or overseas. Acts of threats of violence intended to influence the policy of a government, either in Australia or overseas. Terrorist acts and related offences are further defined in the Commonwealth Criminal Code Act 1995. Senator Henderson demanded I apologise for calling out her shameful, I condemn violence, but tweet. Not in one tweet in response, but in about 20. But that is Senator Henderson for us. Well, I will never apologise to an apologist for those who quite literally urinate on the memory of our fallen soldiers. Protest is a vital part of democracy. And when it is respectful and peaceful and passionate, it can be a powerful force for moving public debate. But you would never catch me making excuses for violent protesters or rioters, not for the Black Lives Matters protesters who set fire to a police union office in Philadelphia, not for unironically violent protests that sometimes gather to oppose Australian military interventions regardless of mission, not for any unionist in any situation. Every party represented in this chamber that helps make the laws that shape our nation must fundamentally respect the rule of law and the laws themselves. In a democracy, there is no need and there is no excuse excusing those who indulge in violence to advance their cause or to oppose another. Mr. Pre Mr Deputy President, I will finish by saying that Labor and I will never sit back and say nothing in the face of violence and intimidation in our cities and in our communities. We will not, like some of those opposite, walk on the edge of a razor and talk out of both sides of our mouths in an attempt to pry off a few votes while our nurses and healthcare workers, the literal heroes of this pandemic, cannot walk proud, cannot hold their heads high through their own streets without fearing that they will be attacked by those so far down the rabbit hole that I fear they are beyond redemption. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Look, the government uh, very clearly, and everybody on this side, clearly condemns those that seek to incite violence or engage in violence. And to try to suggest otherwise is absolutely unbecoming. I believe that Senator K Kitching is, in fact, better than that which she has portrayed herself this afternoon. Unfortunately, we have now seen her personally attack Senator um, Reynolds in quite a spiteful way, referring to brain cells and uh, other Senator, things. Senator Abetz, please resume your seat. That was dealt with at the time. Those remarks were withdrawn. It is absolutely inappropriate for you to repeat them, and I would ask that you withdraw that. Draw that which is on the Hansard. Um, Senator Kitching has engaged in personal denigration of other female senators in this place. Not one of them, but two of them. And of course, she's also engaged in denigrating the registered organisation, commission officials, and the list goes on. And so, Madam Deputy President, what this contribution by Senator Kitching has been all about, unfortunately, is to seek to attack and try to make a point out of something which does nothing for the cohesion of Australian society. I am sure that every single senator in this place condemns those that would seek to incite violence or actually engage in violence. There is no difference between us over the aisle or across the political divide in this country, and that is why we are such a good cohesive society. And for those that seek to inflame the situation by referring to some who engage in conduct unbecoming, do the cohesion of our nation no benefit. This time of taking note of answers is an opportunity, especially for the opposition, to put forward to the Australian people what their vision for Australia is all about, what their plan is, what their policies are. But instead, how do they use the time to attack 
individuals. And that is what happens when you've got a hapless, sad, forlorn opposition, devoid of policies, devoid of a plan, devoid of a vision. What do you do? You talk about individuals, you seek to denigrate the individuals, you seek to point to some social media comment and uh, blow that into something of a great note. The simple fact is we on this side, Madam Deputy President, are committed and devoted to ensuring that Australia emerges from COVID-19 with a good, sound, strong economic recovery, as it is being overseen by our Federal Treasurer. We are concentrating on jobs, job security, job development. We are looking at national resilience to ensure that Australia can withstand the withhold of supplies, be it in fuel, in medical supplies and elsewhere. National resilience, a fundamental issue that you would have thought those opposite who lust after the government benches might actually have a reason and rationale for that desire. But no, it is just for the sake of power, and they think that they can achieve that by tearing down members of the government. The Australian people see through that. They want more substance. They don't just want the personal attacks. So we as a government continue in ensuring our defence capability, our environmental stewardship. All these matters are front and centre of our considerations. And whilst the ALP continues to use question time to personally denigrate the Prime Minister and anybody else that they think they can have a cheap shot at, we get on with the business of government, economic development, security, keeping our country safe from COVID and from external threats, ensuring that we have good environmental stewardship. They are the things that the people of Australia elect us to do. That is what the Australian people want us to concentrate on and not engage in the sort of personal attacks, partisan uh, politics, which are, quite frankly is not even appropriate for undergraduate student politics. And so I invite the ALP to reconsider their approach to uh, public policy debate Thank you, Senator in this Rebecca, chamber. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, there can be no doubt in that an essential element of a well-functioning democracy is the right to freely express views uh, on, on the government of the day and the decisions that the government makes. As will come as no surprise to most, being a Labor parliamentarian and a former union official, I have myself certainly spent my fair time, um, alongside many others, robustly articulating uh, our views on certain government decision-making that was not in the interest of the workers at all. And work choices was just one example. However, in exercising one's right to freedom of political communication in Australia, it is important that the manner in which this right is exercised is in accordance with the values that underpin our democracy, respect, civility and the rule of law. I condemn without reservation those who seek to articulate their views through violence or the threat of, and as we all do, in this place, condemn it without reservation. But there is certainly a place in this country for protests. One might even suggest that such activity enhances the quality of our democracy. What there is no place for, however, is harm or threats thereof to participants in that democracy. And I am appalled to hear of members of parliament, whether it's in this place or in state parliaments, that their families and staff are receiving threats to their lives. We should all be appalled for such acts. This is not what a well-functioning democracy is about. It is our duty, not just as members of this place, but as passionate Democrats, to call out this bad behaviour in the strongest possible terms. Now that's what we are doing here today, and I only hope that in due course 
We will all join together and also call on the government to do the same without reservation. Failure to do so and being complicit sorry, failure to do so is being complicit in undermining our democracy. And it gives tactic approval to behaviour which we all know it is, to, it, it is wrong. And it is our duty as legislators to come together and overcome this division. And it is our duty not to tear this place down, not to tear down the fabric of our community. Rather, it is our duty to mend those tears when they do appear. I am disappointed that there are some and, in other, and others in the other place who do not share our commitment to solemn undertaking, and I do hope that in time that they will. And we saw some examples today and, and yesterday, uh, which I do hope will remain as a one-off. We can and should be very proud of the democracy which we as Australians have built here in this country. Indeed, unlike others, we have, for the most part, been spared the perils of political motivated violence. Yet such circumstances have not come about through luck. They have come about through deliberate action, through a conscious understanding of the importance of always acting with the purpose of strengthening our democracy, not in tearing it down. You know, and, and these are things that I recall as a young student, not just at school but university. You know, core fundamental principles of respect for one another. And yes, we'll have the argy bargy that occurs in this place. But when you have actions of members in the Senate and also members in the other place that do put others' lives in danger and their families in danger. You, know, you do need to reflect on that and ask why. Is it that you're not able to put forward your arguments articulately in this place? Like why do you have to resort to violence? Why do you have to resort to putting someone's life in danger? And in my home state, Victoria, recently, many members of the state parliament addresses were leaked. You know, and, and one must ask why. What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove? Like many people in our country, you go and protest and do so peacefully. Do it the steps of parliament, as many, many groups have done for decades on Spring Street. That's what good democracy is about, and I want to make sure that we maintain it that way, Deputy Thank President. Thank you, Senator Jacconi. Your time has expired. Senator McMahon. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, so I rise to respond to uh, Senators Kitching and Sikoni taking note of um, answers from Senator Birmingham to question asked by Senator Wong. Now, <clears throat> I might be paraphrasing Senator Wong a little bit, but basically her question was, why did we as a government not oppose the motion that was put up? Well, the fact is there was no motion put, so we didn't not oppose, we didn't vote against there was no motion put to the Senate to vote on. Now, if we turn to some of the, um, the comments made by Senator Kitching um, regarding the issue of, of violent protests and, uh, and violence and unacceptable behaviour, um, you know, we, we did hear from Senator Birmingham. Uh, he said, of course, of course we oppose and condemn um, any form of, of, of threatening or uh, inflicting violence in, in any form whatsoever. So, you know, he did address that. We as a government and we as individuals do, do completely um, oppose uh, threatening or, or violent or insightful behaviour by, by anyone. Um, <clears throat> now, those opposite um, and uh, those in the corner would, would have us believe that this is all right-wing extremism. Um, it's not. Certainly there are extremists out there, right and left-wing and other types, Hello. and we must always take action against extremist, politically motivated violence. And we are. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, 
This year, the government has made a record $1 billion investment um, in ASIO's most sensitive capabilities. This is to um, investigate, discover, stamp out, prevent um, and crack down on this kind of extremism and this kind of violence. So we are definitely doing a lot about the issue. But the other thing that we need to look at is why are we seeing this massive rise in, uh, in violence and threats, fortunately at the moment is mostly threats, directed towards um, people in government, people in public office. Now, none of it's excusable, but those on the other side don't care why. They don't care. Um, we do. On this side, we do. And we recognise that a lot of these people who aren't the extremists are actually pretty normal people who are behaving in a very, very abnormal way, a way that they would not normally behave in. Now, we need to look at what is causing that. Um, I know from, from some of the people that I know in the Northern Territory that are going to these protests, they're not behaving or threatening violence, but they are behaving in a way they would not normally do so. And the reason they have done that is, is absolute uh, frustration and, um, and, and their, their livelihoods being taken away from them by the government. Now, that doesn't excuse what they're doing, but these people need help. Um, they ne we need to intervene before they get to the stage where they feel their only, their only course of action is to, to threaten people. Um, and we are doing that. We are making record investments in mental health. We recognise that a lot of the stresses that people have suffered over COVID have driven them to experience mental health issues. And we are investing in mental health to combat these issues. Those on the other side don't care about mental health. They don't, they're not speaking out about it. They're not committing to investing in it. They don't care about helping people through one of the most difficult and extraordinary times that we will probably ever live through. And we need to acknowledge the impact that, uh, that this disease and that these responses to disease, and, and often it is in the, the state and territory Labor governments that are reacting extraordinarily and um, taking away people's lives and livelihoods. We need to acknowledge that and we need to provide help and support for these people that are experiencing mental illness as a result of the COVID responses. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, today we asked the government to support a very simple motion, a motion to call on the Prime Minister and all political leaders to condemn without reservation, without qualification, the threats of violence at re recent protests, including in Melbourne. So that sounds pretty simple, right? Well, not simple for the Morrison government, because this government wouldn't even allow that important motion to be put. And on behalf of all Victorians, I have to say that I am completely disgusted by that decision. It is a disgrace that the government would not allow that motion to be put today, that the government wouldn't take the step that was offered to them of offering the leadership that we need for Victoria, for the country, to absolutely, unequivocally, without qualification, without reservation, condemn the violent protests and threats of violence to politicians, to their families and to our democracy. It is a disgrace. And it is Victorians who are seeing the worst of all of this right now. Uh, it is Victorians that are experiencing the violent threats and the disgusting actions of these people who are threatening our democracy in Victoria uh, and uh, the threats that are now, uh, it seems, unfortunately, being spread around the country. Uh, in my home state, we have seen um, attacks on essential workers. We have seen nurses trying to vaccinate people spat on. 
We have seen protests, as uh, Senator Kitching said, uh, at our shrine, and we have seen the shrine desecrated by violent protesters in Melbourne. Uh, we have seen protesters out the front of the parliament with gallows. We have seen protesters out the front of, of parliament um, with mocked up nooses chanting, hang Dan Andrews, hang Dan Andrews. And all we were asking for today is for the government to support a motion, to support a motion, to allow it to be moved to show their support for that motion, calling on the Prime Minister and all political leaders to condemn without reservation or qualification these sorts of threats of violence. And they refused. They refused. It is a complete disgrace because what we are seeing is not only members of parliament being threatened in Victoria, we're seeing their families being threatened as well. We are seeing death threats to premiers in Victoria and now in other states as well. We are seeing these protests spread. We are seeing members of parliament in other states as well receiving the same threats uh, and needing protection. Uh, we have speakers at a rally this weekend claiming they would go to any lengths necessary to rid our parliament of these traitorous politicians. So this needs to end. This needs to be put to an end now. Uh, and what we need is for the Prime Minister to stand up. What we need is for the Prime Minister to lead. What we need is for the Prime Minister to get out of the gutter where he is scrounging around for votes right now and actually call this behaviour out. To call it out from the highest elected office in the land. To call it out without reservation. To call it out now to join us on the Labor side and call out this violent behaviour now. But instead, instead of that leadership, what we have is a Prime Minister who is actively sowing distrust for political gain. That is what we have in this country right now. He is playing a dangerous game with dangerous consequences. He is flirting with the violent protesters in Melbourne. Uh, and he is doing that with his doublespeak. On one side, he is saying, I condemn the protesters. He is saying that. And then exactly out of the, out of the other side of his mouth, at the same time, uh, he is saying, I understand their frustrations. I understand their frustrations. I understand that they think it's time for governments to get out of people's lives. What we need is leadership, not doublespeak, from this Prime Minister. The question is that the Senate take note of the answers by Senator Birmingham. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I rise to take note of the response to my question uh, to Minister Rustin. Uh, we saw last night duelling announcements about a domestic and family violence commission. And the timing of the government's announcement was very interesting. It was shortly there after the opposition party had made their announcement, and the two announcements were quite similar. Now, tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and we've had 38 women already this year killed by violence. That's 38 too many, and uh, hence I asked the minister. Uh, about these recent announcements, and I was a bit concerned by one element of her response. She seemed to imply, and I'll follow this up, but she seemed to imply that the uh, commission that the government was proposing would somehow be an oversight of frontline organisations. Now, I hope I incorrectly infer that. I hope that's not the case, because what this government needs to do is actually listen to those frontline service workers who are saving women's lives who are drastically underfunded, who are working well over time on the smell of an oily rag, often at award, weight, award wage pay rates, because they actually are very passionate about keeping women safe. So I, I was just a little bit disturbed that the minister uh, made an offhand remark that I will follow up and hope is not some kind of uh, watchdog role that they intend to play over the frontline services sector to try to stop domestic violence. So that's the first thing that I wanted to place on record. But the other point was 
We just had this Women's Safety Summit. Remember the one that was kept on getting delayed and ended up being by Zoom, and in fact it wasn't really an exchange of information, it was just a one-way broadcast. Uh, but anyway, at that summit, one of the statements uh, that was clearly made went to the need for more housing. Now, this shouldn't be news to anyone that's been paying attention to this issue. Women are being forced to choose between violence and homelessness because there is no crisis housing, there is no transitional housing and there is no long-term affordable housing in this country. There's no social housing. Private housing is, is barely any vacancy rates and rentals are through the roof and no one can afford to buy a home anymore. Housing is a key issue for keeping women safe. And so I asked the minister well and good about this commission, assuming they're not going to just attack frontline workers, but how many roofs will that provide? for women escaping violence. So she didn't really answer that question, but hey, it's called question time. It's not called answer time after all. Um, I want to remind the minister that the fastest growing group of homeless people in this nation are women, and they're older women to boot. Before COVID, it was women over 55 that were the fastest group headed towards homelessness. Now it's women over 45. So this is a problem that is touching so many of us in this nation, and rather than passing the buck to the states, as this government likes to do, they need to step up and provide real funding so that we have enough homes in this nation to house people that need it, particularly those older women and particularly women that are fleeing violence, and not just long-term affordable housing, that transitional and crisis housing as well. Um, now, I also asked the minister about the uh, investment or lack thereof in prevention programs, and in particular, this government's vexatious and vexed relationship um, with respectful relationships programs in schools. Now, remember the palaver about safe schools? Um, this crew on the government benches just are so torn apart when it comes to providing basic consent education to children to keep them safe um, and teaching them about what a real respectful relationship uh, means, whether that's a same-sex relationship, whether it's a heterosexual relationship, whatever. They, are just, they just can't deal with the notion that we should actually give to kids the tools to keep themselves safe. Um, again, I didn't really get a response from the minister on whether they will stop attacking uh, proper education and consent education in schools and start funding it, um, but this is not the first time we've raised this issue. The last issue I talked about and asked the minister about, again with not really a very good response, was the quantum of funding that needs to be provided so that no one is turned away from a frontline domestic and family violence service when they reach out for help. The sector has clearly said they need $12 billion over 12 years, which is the life of the next national plan. It's a billion a year. This government is providing, on the back of the envelope, my calculations, about 2 per cent of what the sector is asking for. It is not enough. Not a single person that reaches out for help after fleeing violence should be turned away. And that is this government's job to stump up the funds to make sure that those frontline heroes have the beds and the personnel to do that job. The question is that the Senate take note of answer given by Senator Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Firavanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of five legislative instruments as set out in the list I have provided to the clerk. I advise the chamber that the list will be circulated to senators with today's notices. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. Uh, I will now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clerk. Postponement notification has been received in relation to general business 1260 for today to the 30th of November. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 12 on today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. As um, per usual practice, we'll proceed through the formal business in a way that's conducive to the operation of the chamber. Uh, could I suggest that we start with government business motion number one? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being as, taken as formal? There being no objection. Senator. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Autonomous Sanctions Act 2011 and for related purposes. I will put that question. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Uh, I will put the question that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Autonomous Sanctions Act 2011 and for related purposes. Minister. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the first day of the next period of sitting. We will now move to a motion, uh, government business motion number two. Thank you, Mr. Dunningham. Uh, President, I ask the government business notice of motion number two relating to the consideration of a disallowance motion be taken as formal. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. We will now move to motion 1275 in the name of Senator Cox. I ask that general business notice uh, motion uh, number 1275 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, the motion is taken as formal. Senator Cox. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now move to business of the Senate notice of motion number two. Uh, in the name of Senator Waters. Very much, President. Uh, before uh, moving it as formal, um, at the request of another senator, I would seek lead to amend the reporting date to bring it forward to the 3rd of February 2022. So uh, I so move that amendment. And I ask that business of the Senate. Is, le is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you very much. And I so ask that amended business of the Senate notice of motion number two be taken as formal. Uh, there being no objection, the motion is taken as formal. Senator. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? And is Senator Eckert. Is leave granted? Yeah. One minute. Uh, thanks, Senator Mr. Dunham. President. Yes, these matters have already been considered by the committee. The bill responds to recommend, uh, recommendation number 18 of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters from its report on the conduct of the 2019 federal election and matters related thereto. The amendments will enhance public confidence in Australia's political processes by aligning transparency uh, requirements for political actors who seek to influence the outcome of an election to more closely resemble those for political parties, candidates and members of the Australian Parliament. I will now put the motion. Uh, the, those in favour of the motion say aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Geschichte dran. Stop the bells. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Uh, ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. There are going to be further divisions, so I would ask senators to remain in the chamber. We'll move on to 1272 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. 
Thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 1272 be taken as formal. There being no objection, it's so taken as formal. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. One minute. Stop the bells. Oh no, we're still going. Apologies. Now we can stop the bells. Uh, question is the motion be agreed to. Ayes are passed to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim to tell her for the ayes and Senator Urquhart to tell her for the noes. There being nine ayes and 43 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Senator Patrick, we'll go to your motion next. I'll just give you a moment to resume your seat. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number uh, 1277 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Senator Dunian. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted for one minute? Thank you, Mr. President. It remains the view of the government that National Cabinet was established as a committee of cabinet, and its documents and de deliberations should remain confidential. On the 17th of September this year, the Prime Minister and all leaders of state and territory governments made it clear that the National Cabinet has strengthened relationships by facilitating regular confidential discussions in the national interest founded on the same principles of trust, confidence and collaboration which underpin state, territory and Commonwealth cabinets. 
Uh, cabinet confidentiality is a long-standing principle of the Westminster systems of government and a well-established ground Order. for a claim of public interest immunity with respect to orders by the Senate. The release of documents required by any Senate order committee resolution or question on notice to which public interest immunity claim has been made on the grounds of them being related to deliberations of National Cabinet would unacceptably breach the Convention of Cabinet Confidentiality, which ought to be respected by the Senate. And I appreciate Senator Patrick Senator showing Patrick. a bit of respect to Senator people making a contribution. Order. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for, for four minutes. Stop the bells. 
The question is the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes. Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. There being 24 ayes and 20 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to uh, motion 1273 in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim, I believe you are chasing the call. President, I am indeed. Thank you. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 1273 be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is so taken. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? One minute. Thanks, Mr President. More than 6,000 submissions were received during the public consultation process, and the department does not have the capacity to contact all of the submitters to confirm their permission to release their submission publicly. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim, I believe, on 1274. 1274. Thank you, President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 1274 be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government response is yet to be finalised and will be released as soon as it's able to be. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now I believe that concludes formal business. I would ask senators to quietly leave the chamber. We will move to the matter of urgency. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Thorpe. That the, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice today that I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. That the Glasgow Climate Pact, agreed to by nearly 200 countries, including Australia, resolve to pursue efforts to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, which, according to the International Energy Agency, would require no new coal mines or new gas fields and is consistent with respecting, promoting and considering the rights of First Nations and Indigenous peoples when taking actions to address climate change. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Cox to move the motion. I move this as a matter of public urgency. Uh, I rise to acknowledge and thank three brave environmental warriors who are right at this minute in 35-degree heat 
putting their bodies on the line to stop works today at Woodside's Pluto project in the Burrup, working to stop the environmental criminals. This morning I smoke, spoke to Petrina, a mother, a school teacher who has locked herself to a concrete barrel inside a caravan to block the Burrup Road, the only road into Australia's biggest gas hub. Alongside her is Elizabeth, a grandmother, and Caleb, a 23-year-old school teacher, who is chained to a concrete barrel under a car. The lands of the Murujuga people make up are made up of five language groups, so I pay my respects to them, their elders past and present, and their emerging leaders. Murujuga always was and always will be Aboriginal land. The word Murujuga means hip bone sticking out in the Nyalama Yambara language and consists of a narrow peninsula of land as well as 42 islands located near the town of Dampier in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. For First Nations people, land and people are connected both physically and spiritually. There is a belief among First Nations people that if country gets sick, damaged, degraded and polluted, then they too will become ill and might even die. By protecting the land, the people are also protected. Everyone is responsible for looking after country, even non-First Nations people who live and work on this land. This is not Woodside's land, this is not BHP's land, and it's not the state government's land. This is our land, and we have looked after this land for thousands of years. We have been the custodians of the ancient Murujuga rock art, which depicts the Seven Sisters dreaming story that is etched into the rock. We know that when people fight for nature, nature wins. We saw this at James Price Point. We saw it when people were locked onto tractors to save the Beelia wetlands to stop a highway through that beautiful and precious wetlands. A campaign, by the way, that Labor supported and protected. So we know that Labor can protect the environment, but they only do it when they get votes to win elections. Why can't they do it all the time? I'll tell you why. It's because of donations. Woodside donates $220,000 every year to both the Liberal and Labor parties. In a statement to the Australian Finance Review, Financial Review, Labor Resources spokesperson Madeleine King said the Scarborough pro project was consistent with a global move towards decarbonisation. Pretty much that sounds like a line straight out of Woodside's playbook. Is Woodside writing talking points for Labor or are Labor writing talking points for Woodside? It's anyone's guess. The Greens are the only party that are consistently turning up to protect nature, to protect Aboriginal cultural heritage and to reduce the dangerous polluting emissions that are cooking this planet. On Monday, the state Labor government's support of Australia's biggest polluting gas project paved the way for Woodside and BHP to give the final tick of approval for the Scarborough gas project, which will generate 1.6 billion tonnes of emissions, equivalent to 15 coal-fired coal power stations every year. There's a groundswell of opposition coming together against this project, including investors. The world is turning against oil and gas and the extraction of fossil fuels since the Glasgow summit. We know that Japan and Korea are transitioning out of gas. Any suggestion by Woodside CEO Meg O'Neill that this project will assist in decarbonising the planet is blatantly untrue. There is no credible evidence to back that up. Today, I was taking a look at Woodside's Indigenous Communities Policy, which was released, funnily enough, in August 2020, so not that long ago. And unfortunately, I had to laugh with horror as I read the policy because it couldn't be further from the truth. post and caves, where lots of corporates made statements like this, Woodside claim that they will be guided by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. They will ensure their management of cultural heritage is thorough, transparent and underpinned by consultation and continued engagement. They will avoid future damage to cultural heritage and, if avoidance is not possible, minimise and mitigate the impacts of consultation with communities. 
They will also support self-determination, economic empowerment and cultural heritage protection. To me, this is an absolute lie. Now we are witnessing Jook and Gorge in slow motion thanks to Woodside's obsession with fossil fuels. In my conversations with community, I have seen no evidence of Woodside upholding UNDRIP and protecting cultural heritage. In fact, what I have witnessed is the, the exact opposite. This is nothing short of gross negligence, and these governments and companies will have to answer to our kids and their kids for generations to come. They are the criminals here. And to Petrina, Elizabeth and Caleb, I say thank you because you are the real change makers. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, again, I uh, thank those in the corner for their MPUs. They're like Dorothy Dix is to us. They set up uh, a, a, a debate which we're very, very happy to have. The Morrison government is the only party in this chamber with a whole of economy, long-term emissions reduction plan that will see us meet and beat our 2030 target and achieve net zero by 2050 without imposing new costs on households, small business or our traditional industries or the economy. Those opposite will, will tax their way there. We know that. They've done it before. They'll do it again. Those in the corner will just blow up the economy. Shutting down fossil fuels overnight would just kill the economy. Loss of jobs would be enormous. Poverty would be rife. All the things that they pretend they argue for, we would see in Australia overnight. The Prime Minister took to COP26 a plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 in the Australian way, and that is looking at where we have strategic advantage and where we can easily make the easiest and biggest gains with the least amount of money. And by money, we're talking about incentives to partner with other levels of government and business. We will act in a practical, responsible way to reduce emissions while preserving Australian jobs and taking advantage of new opportunities for industries in regional Australia. The government will not support the Greens' reckless and economy-destroying climate policies that will force industries to shut, projects to be delayed or cancelled and destroy Australian jobs and industries. Labor, if elected at the next election, and there's a big if, will have no choice to bow to the Greens' bidding. And we hear that from the Greens every day in this place, how they say they need to be the balance of power party in this parliament. And we've seen what that would cause. Australia's economy is almost unique amongst developed countries, with an economy specialising in the production of energy and emissions-intensive commodities. That's why our proportion of non-export emissions is incredibly low. Ahead of and during COP26, Australia worked closely with our Pacific family to come up with uh, ways to bring about lowering emissions while building their resilience and funding any needs that they have. We particularly welcome the outcomes on the international carbon markets and the standardised transparency framework, which was a major focus for Australia because transparency is, is the key to accountability and to translating ambition into achievement. And this goes to the heart of the Paris Agreement, which relies on countries delivering on their commitments to achieve a global net zero outcome. Australia's, Australian, Australia's emissions reporting and transparency is the gold standard, and we expect all major emitters to display similar levels of transparency. As I mentioned before, the, uh, uh, in, in our area of the, the world, through the $104 million Indo-Pacific Carbon Offset Scheme, we're working with our regional partners to build the capability of their emissions accounting and reporting capabilities. Strong transparency and integrity standards are vital to ensuring carbon markets deliver real and verifiable emissions reductions. Australia has doubled its climate finance commitment to $2 billion over the next five years. More than 70 per cent of our support is focused on climate resilience and adaption. 
At COP26, countries committed to scale up cooperation to make low emissions technologies the most cost effective and reliable option available. We, the technologies that we need to reach net zero don't yet exist, but our technology, energy technology roadmap maps a path to meeting, finding those technologies, bringing down the costs such they're competitive, and ensuring that we, Australia, and the rest of the world have the technologies available to us to significantly reduce emissions and decarbonise our economy. Analysis by the uh, IEA, the International Energy Agency, shows that half the global reductions required to achieve net zero will come from technologies that are not yet ready for commercial deployment. The China, the world's largest emitter, has not yet put an, an, an end to building thermal coal generation and production. In fact, in the first half of 2021, the country announced that they were going to build 43 new coal-fired power plants will, which, which will emit an estimated 150 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. At Glasgow, Prime Minister Modi of India announced that by 2030, India will reduce its total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tonnes and meet half of its energy requirements with renewable fuels and also pledge to reach net zero emissions by 2070. Other developing countries do not have the luxury of well-off countries such as the EU's by buying cheap offset credits to reduce their emissions. They require solutions that are inexpensive, that provide reliable power and that materially reduce their emissions. And that's why the Morrison government's technology investment roadmap is so important. This government's roadmap is a plan to accelerate new te technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, batteries, healthy sto soils that will help reduce emissions here and around the world. So far, we have committed to invest $20 billion in new energy technologies by 2030 to drive at least $80 billion of total public and private investment over the decade. This investment will support at least 160,000 new jobs. This roadmap is clearly working. Over the last two years, our position against our 2030 target has improved by 639 million tonnes. This is the equivalent of taking all of Australia's 14.7 million cars off the road for 15 years. So while those of us that are happy to stand up and make statements and make them feel good and look good on social media, this government is working on delivering actual results that not only reduces our emissions, but also drives investment and economic growth. We are about taking action, not making statements. Thousands of jobs will be created by 2050 by the creation of an Australian hydrogen industry. And this follows on very nicely from the, the work that has been done over recent decades on building an LNG industry. The amount of investment, some government, mostly private, that built that industry will go a long way to create that's created markets that Australia will follow on, that we will transition to selling hydrogen into when those markets transition away from, um, from natural gas. Regional hydrogen hubs that we are building in regional Australia will help develop the industry and create jobs. Our priority is to produce clean hydrogen under $2 a kilo. Low-cost clean hydrogen holds significant promise for the world's energy future and Australia has what it takes to be the, that world leader in hydrogen, just like we did with LNG. Our government's $1.2 billion hydrogen investment is set to increase boosting economic activity and jobs in regional Australia. An additional $150 million for a further two locations under the Clean Hydrogen Industrial Hubs program will enable the rollout of hydrogen hub hubs across seven priority regional sites. Hubs will consolidate Australia's natural resource strengths to unlock cheap, clean energy and stimulate a potential surge in industrial activity. An Australian hydrogen industry could generate more than 8,000 jobs and deliver over $11 billion a year in GDP by 2050. The research that's going on will help 
um, lead the creation of those hydrogen hubs and industry, where we will then reach our goal of producing green hydrogen below $2 a kilo. And our aim is to accelerate this process so that clean hydrogen achieves parity with other energy fuel sources that give us firm power uh, in the quickest possible way. The Morrison government has a plan. We took that plan to, to the last election. We took it to Glasgow. We're meeting and beating that plan. We are meeting, meeting and beating our emissions targets, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Ayres. Well, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, the Morrison government doesn't have a plan. It's got a pamphlet. It's got a different, it's got a different plan uh, every few months. It always changes. It's a plan that, that lacks ambition and lacks capability uh, and lacks the things that Australians need. Uh, to have confidence in the government. Mr Albanese uh, has indicated all the way through this term that following the Glasgow conference uh, and following the government finally releasing what passes for modelling, that uh, Mr Albanese and Mr Bowen will set out for the electorate precisely the climate and energy framework. Uh, that will deliver a credible approach to Australia's position on climate and energy, uh, and that will come uh, soon. And he will do it. Uh, he's indicated that it will happen, and it will happen. It is something that the government has singularly failed to do uh, over the course of the last eight long eight going on nine long years of failure and ineptitude. With all the resources of government, they have failed. I suppose in some respects they have succeeded. They have had not one policy framework but 21, a hodgepodge of mutually opposed, utterly contradictory, befuddled and shambolic policy offerings. That is why we are last in the OECD. And it's only a Labor government that will deliver a credible policy framework in climate and energy. Uh, Labor, Labor's climate and energy policy, when it's released, will be directed towards the following national objectives. Number one, reducing electricity and energy prices for Australian households and businesses. Two, reducing our emissions profile, Australia's emissions contribution, uh, in order to importantly reduce our contribution, but also to try and restore Australian credibility around the world that has been so utterly trashed by this government. Three, it will be about driving investment in good jobs, in new good jobs, permanent jobs not bodgy labour hire jobs, not casual jobs, but real jobs in our industrial suburbs and in our regions and in our cities. And we'll do that by having lower reliable electricity and energy prices, in making improvements in reliability and capacity to the grid, with investments in capability, with expansions in mining and mining technology uh, and in other uh, efforts to try and push Australian exports up the value chain. Our contribution in the National Reconstruction Fund and the Rewiring the Nation funds, already announced, will be the biggest single policy contribution of any Australian government at rebuilding and reindustrialising our regions. That's what we'll do if we're elected. It's a solemn commitment to the regions and our, and our industrial suburbs. Uh, it will have a real material uh, uh, effect on our ambitions profile, and it will finally be, from an Australian government, a credible commitment on climate and energy. Now, if you vote for the government, you won't get that. If you vote 
For the Greens political party, you won't get that. You'll undermine that. If you vote for the National Party or One Nation, the only way you'll make progress on climate and energy and on jobs in the regions is by voting for the Labor Party. It is a critical national objective. There's no wedge, no political games, no tricks, no clever politics, no marketing, no spin, nobody left out, nobody left behind. It is a critical national objective for our economy, for our society, for our environment and to protect jobs. If you want real action on climate and energy, if you want lower power prices, if you really care about blue-collar jobs beyond dressing up as a blue-collar worker, if you want more industry and a better environment, then vote for it. Then vote for it. If Australians waste votes on them or them, that will undermine the capacity for change. It puts us further behind in the race for jobs and opportunity. Because unlike the bloke who currently leads the government, Albo will do what he says and say what he means and will deliver. Sorry, sorry, uh, Senator Ayres. Uh, Senator Davey on a point of order. I think we are advised not to refer to people from the other place by their nicknames. If, if, we'll do. if we could refer to, to members of the other place by their thanks. correct titles, thank you, Senator. Thanks, thanks very much. Because on our side we've got party discipline, a strength of purpose, a common commitment, and we've demonstrated that. One message, not 12 messages, not like Mr Morrison, who says one thing in, in Glasgow and says something entirely different in Gladstone. Or Senator Canavan, who says that we should put aside $250 billion of public money to directly fund projects that commercial lenders won't fund. Or his mate, Mr Pitt, who supports this but doesn't say it anymore because he wants to protect the only job that he cares about, his own, in the Cabinet. Now, Senator Canavan, in a rare moment of clarity, said that he knows that that policy that he supports and that Mr Pitt supports will push up mortgage interest rates and increase the cost of borrowing for businesses. But that's OK, apparently. Home mortgage costs up by what? $50 a month, $80 a month, a couple hundred dollars a month? This is a reverse scare campaign. It's Senator Canavan who's wandering around the country telling Australians and Australian businesses that his policy framework is going to push interest rates up. When wages are going down year after year in the longest sustained period of zero wage growth, household incomes are going down, Senator Canavan wants to push mortgage interest rates up. He thinks ordinary Australians can find a couple of hundred dollars every month to fund his ideological frivolity. I want to go from a former Trotskyite to the bunch of current Trots and faded university politicians over here. That cavalcade to Queensland symbolised everything that's wrong with this self-indulgent self-defeating narcissism that defines the Greens political party today. What's their real target for 2022? 10%. Their real target's 10%. 10% of Australian voters is the only thing that they care about. They don't care about the climate. They don't care about the, the they only care about themselves. It's been a long time both Senator Canavan and the Greens need each other. Political polarisation suits them because that's their business model. There's no progress with the Greens political party. I mean, save me. These people who come in here talk about the old parties, they say. They've been here for 37 years in Australian, in Australian parliaments. 37 years the Greens have been turning up 
in Australian parliaments. You know how many national parks they've delivered? Zero. How, many, how much impact on species extinction has the Greens political party had? Zero. Not a, not a kilogram of carbon, not a kilogram of carbon has been emitted or not emitted or taken out of the atmosphere because of the activity of the Greens political party. It's just narcissism and noise and seats. That's all they're interested in. Pretend progressives who haven't learned, who haven't changed. It's the same stunts, the tired, boring, irrelevant stunts. 10 per cent of the primary vote is all that they care about. They are not part of the solution. They are part of the problem if you care about climate change and if you care about real action on climate. Thank you, Senator Ayres. We have Senator Roberts remotely. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, we can't hear you at the moment. I'm sorry. Senator Roberts, we can't hear you. Nope, still can't hear you. And can, oh, you hear me, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Senator Roberts. Please proceed. Thank you. Despite harming the Aboriginal people in many ways, the Greens dishonestly and falsely pretend to care for Aboriginals. In pushing Greens policies ripening in 2030, the Greens are in fact pushing Australia down the UN's Agenda 2030 path. For example, consider something as basic as land rights and land use before we get on to the Glasgow distraction. It's not immediately obvious that the United Nations globalist strategy significantly influenced Australia's Native Title Act that pretends to give Aboriginal people access to land, yet actually limits and in many ways prevents all Australians, including Aboriginals, from using the land, even accessing the land. My recent listening across Cape York, all Cape York communities in far north Queensland, confirmed yet again many Aboriginal and European community leaders' dissatisfaction at the reality and impact of Native Title legislation. The Native Title Act's preamble refers many times to United Nations principles when a claim is successful under native title, individuals find that they are prevented from owning their own home within the area of the claim and face impediments in raising money for business loans for lack of collateral. In practical terms, the rights of Aboriginal people and their lives have not been improved under the Native Title Act. So having said that, let's look at the other policy that the Greens have raised here. The United Nations actually drives the Glasgow agenda. Let's look at that more closely, because it lacks substance, as do the Labor Greens Coalition climate and energy policies and the Liberal Nationals Coalition climate and energy policies. Contradictions erupt and abound in climate and energy policies because no politician has ever provided the logical scientific points as evidence for those policies. John Howard, his government, introduced the abominable re renewable energy target and he stole, his government stole farmers' property rights to use their own property. Yet six years after being booted from office in 2007, he confessed in London in 2013 that on climate science he is agnostic. He had no science. The whole thing was driven just on whims and, and fairy tales. He had no science to support what has become the gutting of our electricity sector and our productive capacity. In 2016, the father of the Senate, Ian MacDonald, said there's never been a debate on the climate science, and he is correct, and there still hasn't been one. Two months ago, 10 federal parliamentarians confirmed in writing to me that they have never been provided with the scientific evidence, they, and they have the integrity and courage to say so. In August last year, 19 federal parliamentarians and the Greens, Labor, Liberal, Nationals parties failed to provide me, and they were all advocating climate alarm and climate policies, failed to provide me with any scientific evidence for their claims. In 2007, coming to the Labor Party, and 2008, Kevin Rudd claimed 4,000 scientists support the claim that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. The UN IPCC, the climate body in the UN, own data shows that only five endorsed the claim, and there's doubt they were even scientists. And the Greens, instead of science, 
have a well-worn trick of using emotional stories and have never produced the evidence. There is no basis for these policies, and with that, the UN is driving it in this country. Freedom of information requests and parliamentary research, parliamentary library research, revealed to me no evidence for this. So here we have the Labor Greens coalition pushing this, this and it hurts who the most? It hurts the people who are poorest. The people thank who are you, not Thank you, Senator not Roberts. Done. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I, I welcome uh, the opportunity to debate this motion because, because uh, I have, uh, I must confess, I have felt a, a hole uh, in my life since the Glasgow Climate Conference ended. Uh, it was uh, the best comedy I have seen for decades. Uh, it was a laugh a minute. Uh, uh, I was waiting on bated breath for most of the, uh, the agenda, and ever since its end, it's a bit like the Olympics ending. You know, there's, just, there's nothing to watch on TV anymore. Nothing really comes up to scratch. Or, or, or one of the highlights was, uh, I think it was day 42 or something. It was the Gender Innovation and Science Day. Oh, I know Senator Dunham was uh, watching that one strongly. That was a, that was a, that was a cracker. That was an absolute cracker. But it was mainly the participants at Glasgow that made it what it was. It was the people that went along there, uh, and we must all. Uh, uh, we all owe them a, a, a debt of gratitude. I love the during Glasgow. I loved the, this one. One of my favourites was the headline. Um, I think it was a Reuters story. A headline said, "German Greens want more Russian gas." <laughs> German Greens want more Russian gas. Uh, well, you know, um, it sums it up. It sums it up, doesn't it? The, the the green activists. They like to talk the talk. They love to talk the talk. But when it comes to walk the walk, they still want to be able to heat their homes. They still want to be able to fly to these climate conferences, and they'll use fossil fuels as much as they can to get it. They just really don't want the gas coming from Australia or the gas coming from their own countries. They like it to come from dictatorial uh, regimes like Mr. Putin's or, or indeed the Chinese Communist Party. Who will get to another favourite? Another favourite was uh, BBC Scotland. BBC Scotland tweeted this during the, the Glasgow conference. They tweeted. Gas and air is the most popular pain relief in childbirth, but many don't realise its climate impact. That's what they tweeted. They tweeted it. Now, I've had five children. I don't think I'll be going to a delivery suite again. But for all those listening who may, uh, particularly the blokes out there, who may one day find themselves in the delivery suite, suite trying, to, uh, trying to give comfort to uh, their wife, um, I just make a suggestion. It's probably best not to say to your wife in that circumstances, look, I know this is tough, honey, but we must think of the planet. I don't think that would be a smart idea. I don't think you should do that. No one is going to do this. How absurd are these guys? How absurd is the United Nations, who say, who say that we can only eat to save the planet? We're only allowed to eat now 14 grams of red meat a week. A week. 14 grams a week. So if you're, any of us here are going down to the Kingston Hotel and, and having a 400-gram having a rump, or so uh, this fortnight. Just remember, that's about you're a little bit over your, your allocation for the month. That's it. That's it. That's it for you. No more red meat for the month if you care about the planet. Uh, otherwise, you are an environmental vandal. You're a criminal, in fact. You're absolutely a criminal. But we can't, I, can't, I can't go through this contribution without paying tribute to the, to the, to the greatest entertainer Australia's exported for some time, uh, Mr Twiggy Forrest. Mr Twiggy Forrest was over there. And he was getting some pressure, I suppose, about the fact that President Xi Jinping had not attended the Glasgow conference. And he, 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 he responded by saying that he was going to try and convince, uh, unsuccessfully as it turned out, but he was going to try and convince Mr Xi Jinping to come along uh, to Glasgow, to come to the conference. Because he, he said, uh, Mr Forrest was reported as saying that uh, from what he sees happening in China, the younger generation have a very strong will to have a carbon neutral power. And he goes on to say, he went on to say, Mr. Forrest went on to say that, and one thing which the Chinese government is incredibly good at doing is listening to the mood of its people. That's what he said. He listening to the mood of his of its people. Now, I, I actually agree with Mr. Forrest on this. I agree uh, with Twiggy on this one because I, I ask you, I ask you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, when has been, when is the last time? You heard a person living in China complain about their own government. It doesn't happen. <laughs> you do this stuff, you never hear about it. 
It's just, it's just not happening. So they must be doing a fantastic job because there are no complaints coming out of China. Mr Forrest is absolutely right. How absurd are these guys? These are the people who want to tell us what to do, who want to dictate our lives, who want to tell us what to eat, tell us what car we can drive, tell us how we can power our home. And they have done all this work, all this work. And I don't know if the Greens stayed around for the end of Glasgow. They must have missed the ending of it because this motion, this motion says that because of the Glasgow conference, we must, we're not allowed to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to approve new coal mines uh, or build new gas facilities. Uh, that's not actually how it ended. That's not how it ended. How it ended, how it ended was that it actually ended in tears. The whole thing ended in tears, literal tears. It was crying because India had the temerity to want to develop and grow the same way other industrialised economies have done. So they demanded that no, in fact, coal mines should be allowed. The coal-fired power should still be allowed. Uh, it only should be reduced over time. Uh, they did. There was no mention of gas being ruled out completely. So nothing about the approval of the Scarborough project is inconsistent with Glasgow. And this motion simply shows that the people over there are either not watching Glasgow or are too mentally scarred by it that they have already repressed the experience from their memory. Because ever since Glasgow, ever since Glasgow, it's been a huge win, huge win uh, for oil and gas. Ever since the end of it, there's been nothing but good news for the workers in this country that work in this great coal industry that we are lucky enough to have, that work in the oil and gas industry. It has been a cavalcade of great news for them. We of course heard, it's already been mentioned here, we have heard that we've had the approval of the massive $16.5 billion Scarborough project. Over 3,000 Australian jobs, 3, jobs uh, for people from this country uh, will be able to work thanks to the approval of that project. That's gone ahead. They've, got, they've attracted $16.5 billion of investment. We're constantly told no one will build coal mines or gas fields. Well, they're doing that there. Since Glasgow, we've had the headline, headline this one is in Reuters. Uh, saying China doubles down on a slower coal exit after COP26 spat. So China's building more coal. They're building, building more coal, building more. It's a green light for coal under this Glasgow agreement. We've had one of the more remarkable things, actually, one of the remarkable things, we've had the Dutch government, a, a very green government. They were committed to a, to a stronger Glasgow agreement that ended up coming out. But the Dutch government, since Glasgow, are now, are now focused on uh, desperately trying to keep uh, a little company called Shell headquartered in Amsterdam. So what are they doing? They are, they are offering Shell uh, a tax cut of 15 per cent to keep them in at the Netherlands. And so they go to Glasgow, fly over there on presumably their private jet, or at least it's got to be fossil fuel jet, uh, say they all wanted to go green, go back home, go back home. Uh, uh, to, to the lo lovely su su surrounds of Amsterdam and are giving tax cuts to big oil companies because they, well, guess what, they want jobs too. I'm sure the Dutch government want jobs too. And, and finally, we've seen since Glasgow, since Glasgow, this headline: U.S. coal prices surged to the highest point since 2009, the highest point in over 12 years. Uh, uh, let's go, Brandon. Indeed, because this is meaning this, 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 this restriction of coal, of oil, of gas, is pushing up fossil fuel prices to their record levels uh, that we've ever seen, because there is significant demand for fossil fuels around the world. And I want to finish on making a very important point that relates back to the Scarborough project. Uh, this is a project that will produce uh, oil and will produce a lot of gas. And there are a lot of things that come from those products that uh, I think the average Australian doesn't, doesn't understand. It is not just the heating for homes uh, or what you put in your petrol tank. It creates a whole raft of other, pro uh, other products that our modern economy relies on. One of the sadder news, saddest piece of news since Glasgow has been that Intertech Pivot, an Australian company, has announced that it will close the last urea manufacturing facility in Australia. Urea is the most important fertiliser used in agricultural production. It is by far the most uh, fertiliser that's used in this dry continent, and we would not be able to grow the same amount of food that we do without it. Now we will be completely reliant on imports for our urea fertilisers. Urea, urea comes from natural gas. You cannot make urea without natural gas. It is the carbon dioxide in the urea that activates the plant growth and allows us to grow things in this, in this world. Now you never hear that from these so-called experts on the oil and gas industry that like to say a lot about an industry that they know very little about, that they talk to no one in, 
and they just want to shut it down, not knowing the consequences for average Australians. This is not just about the workers uh, in that industry. It's not just about the royalties that help pay our hospitals and schools. It is about our basic ability to feed ourselves as a country, to power ourselves as a country, and ultimately, ultimately to defend ourselves as a country. Because if we shut down all of the oil and gas and coal uh, production here in this country, we know the Greens, as I've said, the Greens will still want the products, they'll still want to eat, they'll still want to fly, they'll still want to, to be able to heat their homes. They will instead import all those products from other regimes who don't do that, like China, like Russia, and will become more dependent on them. To defend this country, we need to support our resources industry, including coal, oil and gas. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Let's be clear. The only way to get a good climate policy, or any climate policy for that matter, is to change the government. Moving away from fossil fuel requires an effective energy transition, and we have an incredible renewable future ahead of us, but only a Labor government will deliver this and will deliver Australia's potential as a renewable energy superpower, reduce emissions, reduce energy prices and deliver the industry and jobs growth that can be a serious part of addressing climate change. We all remember when the Greens teamed up with Tony Abbott in 2009 to sink Australia's best chance at lasting climate action, and we are still reeling from that now. Had the Greens supported real action on climate change back then, Australia would be in a much better position today. The coalition's decade of delay has already cost thousands of new energy jobs and is setting Australia up for failure. The government's approach to this critical climate conference in Glasgow was just plain embarrassing. Rather than digging deep to commit to a plan for transition, the Prime Minister spent most of his trip to Glasgow in a diplomatic incident with France and being accused by President Macron of lying. Morrison had to be dragged kicking and screaming to the most basic commitment, a target of net zero emissions by 2050. And then he voluntarily signed an international agreement to revisit the 2030 targets at the end of the COP, but a few hours later said he wouldn't. Liberal inaction, chaos and lies has left Australia behind the game in terms of economic opportunities. In contrast, Labor sees the world's climate emergency as Australia's jobs opportunity. We should be fighting at the front of this emergency, not whinging at the back of the pack. I'm proud to represent South Australia in this place, and under the Weatherall government, our state took the need to transition to renewables very seriously. We became a world leader in renewables and in building a low carbon economy. There are so many projects in South Australia, particularly in regional South Australia, projects such as the Hornsdale Wind Farm and the proposed Port Augusta Renewable Energy Project, which is combining wind and solar and bringing together a clean energy generation capacity of 320 megawatts. The South Australian Big Battery, the list of projects goes on. What it takes is a government that believes and a government that will commit to the economic development to address climate change and build jobs. South Australia has shown that a transition away from fossil fuels and towards clean, renewable energy is possible, and it unlocks the economic opportunities and a pipeline of secure, well-paid, clean energy jobs. And that is the pathway that an Albanese Labor government will also take. But time is running out when we are desperately in need of a government that will take this emergency seriously, that will actually take serious action on well-balanced policies to make a fundamental difference to the future of this country. I want to acknowledge that part of this uh, motion uh, talks about the rights of First Nations people in relation to climate action. And can I say that First Nations people are critical to the process of responding to the climate emergency. From their deep knowledge of land management, 
the enormous leadership that they have shown, the commitment to balancing human needs with environmental needs and their inherent connection to the land and the understanding um, of how the climate operates and how the seasons operate and how to protect that land. First Nations voices are vital to the process and clearly they are calling out for better engagement and a stronger voice in responding to this existential threat to their country. The only option we have to address climate change and build a better future for this country, which includes building our economic strength, is to change the government. Those opposite and those on the corner have no hope. It is only a Labor government that is going to deliver us a decent outcome and address climate change. Thank you, Senator. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It was only yesterday that I stood up here to remind this place that climate crisis is being caused by a failure to listen to and act on the advice, knowledge, science and wisdom of First Nations people in this country. And not to mention Indigenous people around the world, particularly from countries that are still recovering from colonisation. First Nations people here and around the world have a role to play in preventing climate change and economic destruction, and that role is as leaders. For over 350 million First Nations and Indigenous people around the world, climate change will impact our homelands early and more severely. It's already happening in this country. This isn't some sort of hypothetical situation or something that is going to happen in the distant future. It's actually happening now. Today I stood out the front of this building to be in solidarity with traditional owners from what we now call the Beedaloo Basin. And I'd like to use the rest of my time to read their open letter and quote from them. I quote, we speak as traditional owners and custodians of and around the lands and waters that you call the Beedaloo and Connected Basins. Although we come from many nations, we have come together to put an end to the ongoing threat of fracking on our countries, which will denigrate and desecrate our lands. We know our country, we read it, we understand it, and we alone speak for it and its song lines. It is our birthright handed down by bloodline. Together, we fight for it. Our connections to country have been established and proven time and time again by the white man's law. We hold native title and land rights, a system that is meant to protect and enforce our rights. These have been denied to us. Our connections to country have been established and proven time and time again by the white man's law. We hold native title and land rights. And for years, we've been told lies by the gas and oil corporations that there would be no damage to the country or poison in our waters. These companies won't even answer the most basic of questions where they plan to drill or how many wells they want to build. These gas corporations lack any respect for us traditional owners. They have failed to follow proper process in consultation with us, failed to acquire consent, failed to acquire consent, failed to provide transparency in their dealings with us, and have systematically excluded our voices from the decision-making process for activities on our country. We don't have the same resources as these corporations. The system is already set up against us. This federal government coming in over the top of what little processes we have undermines our land rights as Northern Territory traditional owners. The same government who has never come out to our communities to sit with us or meet with us. 
They are failing to represent us. Giving $50 million to mining corporations for an economic recovery to start drilling will only line the pockets of huge corporations who want to take more than we're willing to give. It does nothing but hurt us, our communities and our country. What about our recovery? The money to finally fulfil the empty promises of proper housing in our communities or resourcing the health services we've been calling for for years. And what about countries' recovery? Countries' water is the blood that flows through our body, and it is already poisoned. Where is the money to clean the water many Northern Territory communities are forced to drink? This is short-term money that will cause long-term pain, so division and damage country and community. We will not allow you to cause any more pain, any more hurt or division in our communities. Hear us when we say we won't allow fracking gas fields on our country, not now, not ever. We are united. This is our land, and we're ready to do whatever it takes to protect country. Don't frack the NT. Don't frack the order, NT. Order, order, Don't order, frack the NT. Order, Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, you know perfectly well that props are not allowed. You continue, continue to flout the rules of, of, of this chamber. Please don't do that. Thank you. I call Senator Lyons. Have you, have you finished? No. Okay. Right. I, I, okay. Well, I'll, get, I'll return the call to you then, Senator Thorpe. And I hope that you can adhere to the standing orders. I will adhere to the standing orders and I'll put my prop away. So thank you. Uh, but I just hope that. People in this place listen to that very, very clear letter from Northern Territory traditional owners. If you can't do that, then please take your dot paintings down. Thank you. Uh, I call Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you, Deputy Acting Deputy President. Uh, coincidentally, earlier today I participated in an online event titled Women's Voices – Action for Change. This was a powerful discussion about achieving First Nations gender justice and equality, and it started with Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner June Oscar, who provided us with an overview of her landmark report, We Young and You Fungi – Women's Voices. <clears throat> This motion today is about the urgency of the Glasgow Climate Pact and reminds us in implementing the pact of respecting, promoting and considering First Nations people when taking actions to address climate change. We Yangi New Fungi takes a gender lens to all aspects of life, including climate justice. It starts with the premise that Aboriginal women are the backbone of caring for children and family and caring for country. In relationship to this matter, the fundamental strengths of First Nation women are linked right back to First Mothers. And to quote uh, Commissioner Oscar, who went on to say that for too long the door has been closed and decisions are made about our lives um, without First Nations women being in the room. <clears throat> If the government is serious about addressing climate change, and that's a big if because it has got a backbench full of uh, climate sceptics, and if it's really serious about limiting global temperatures to 1.5 degrees again, which I very much doubt, it must include First Nations women, people, particularly women. As Commissioner Oscar says, what we know matters. What we've seen, though, is policy development on the run. 
in the weeks leading up to the Glasgow summit, the government um, it was still lying about um, what it had achieved and what it would achieve in relation to meeting our Paris targets. We have a Prime Minister who can't even be honest about what he said during the last election about electric vehicles. We have a Prime Minister and a government who have signed up to technologies that are not yet invented. We have a government who is absolutely captured by its climate science denying backbenchers and two members of the Pauline Hanson party who they rely on this place week after week to get their legislation passed. And we have a government that's too afraid to bring legislation into this place because it's being held to ransom by up to five uh, of its own senators, and we saw that in action on Monday. The only way to achieve real action on climate change is to change the government and to elect a Labor government, because Labor believes that net zero emissions by 2050 is necessary but not sufficient. We need a roadmap right now that will get us there, not something that's made up and predicated on technologies that haven't even been invented yet. This is what an Albanese Labor government will achieve. Our climate ambition will be backed by costed policies to achieve that ambition. Good climate policy is good jobs policy, creating jobs and cutting power prices while reducing emissions. The regions will be at the centre of Labor's climate and energy policies. The only way to achieve that is through changing this government. They're tired. They've had eight years of nothing. Uh, in the weeks leading up to Glasgow was the only time we saw a policy that they won't tell us how much it's going to cost, that has no real targets, that actually doesn't have too many policies which are currently being able to be delivered right now. We have a Prime Minister who last election and uh, could not tell the truth about, uh, or now can't tell the truth, what he said about electric vehicles. We all know it's on video. You know, it was going to ruin your weekend, and now he's denying he ever said that. We've got a government that's committed to just re-electing itself, devoid of policies, is leading us nowhere on climate change, and quite frankly needs to be sacked by Australian voters at the next election. And I will take great pleasure in campaigning as hard as I can to get rid of the Morrison government, a government devoid of ideas, a government who lies about what it might do and what it's done and doesn't deserve to be in government. Thank you, Senator Lyons. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
understand each other. Bells. The question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator Cox be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, the teller for the, the noes. I think Senator McKim. The only excuse is you were texting your mother or something, was it? Yes. The result of the division is ayes 7, noes 25. The question is resolved in the negative. Uh, thank you.
Thank you. I ask senators to uh, leave the chamber uh, if they're not staying for the consideration of documents. So we are proceeding to the consideration of documents. The list, they're listed on page four of today's order of business. Is anyone seeking the call? We're dealing with documents, Senator Smith. So there is. I'll just take advice from the clerk. Okay, if there's no one seeking the call to speak on the documents, which is a little unusual, we'll we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> So, um, Senator. Oh, we do have Senator Macdonald. <laughs> I, I did think there might be some. So sorry to disappoint. That, that's okay. Senator Macdonald, are you seeking to speak to one of the documents on page four? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the a page with me to ensure that it is the Northern Australia document report. I don't believe we're at that part of the program. Well, then I shall sit down yet. again. Thank you. I'll just confirm that with the chair before we move on, with the um, clerk before we move on. No, so we'll move we'll move on to the next section, which is a table in consideration of committee reports and uh, government responses. Uh, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present a report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on its reviews of administration and expenditure relating to Australian intelligence agencies, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Mr. President, uh, sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm pleased to present the report on behalf of the committee. In delivering this report, the committee fulfils one of its primary statutory duties under the Intelligence Services Act, that being to review the administration and expenditure of six of Australia's intelligence agencies the Office of National, National Intelligence, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation and the Defence Intelligence Organisation. This report brings to a close what has been an extensive review process that was further complicated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictions on members of the committee, the agencies being reviewed and the parliament as a whole. This is core business for the PJCIS, and the committee takes the responsibility of the administration and expenditure reviews very seriously. For half of the agencies involved, this is the only discrete parliamentary oversight of their functions that is undertaken, as they are not subject to Senate estimates processes, nor do they produce public annual reports or budget statements. These reviews ensure that these agencies are scrutinised regarding the appropriate use of their funds and resources to achieve their stated objectives and mission statements. Budgetary arrangements are scrutinised along with administrative information such as the strategic direction and organisational structure of each agency, their human resources and performance management, the public accountability and public relations of each agency and legislative changes impacting their operation and litigation matters. Review number 18 was interrupted by the initial onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, so the committee, under the former chair, decided to roll over consideration of the 2018-19 reviews material into a combined effort with the 2019-20 material for review of, nine, of number 19. The committee undertakes classified and restricted processes for these reviews given the nature of the material provided and the crucial work of these agencies, and these processes required careful management of nearly two years of work, culminating in the report that I present today. The committee has found that all six agencies have managed their administration and expenditure appropriately in a period of significant operational pressure not only from the impact of COVID-19, but also the evolving security and technological operating environment, as well as the continued maturation and reform of the national intelligence community. The committee was particularly impressed with the way in which the intelligence community was able to continue their important work despite the disruptions of the pandemic and the public health restrictions put in place. The committee will play close interest in the future to the continuity of business plans and redundancies agencies put in place to mitigate against disruptions in the event of future pandemics. 
The committee has made four recommendations for government to consider. The first two recommendations are to investigate options for shared services to support staff complaints and resolution mechanisms, as well as psychological support for staff of intelligence agencies. The reviews highlight the need for ongoing and seamless access to staff support and psychology services, not only from the nature of the work of these agencies, but also in the face of challenges from COVID-19 and the evolution of the threat which, is, which needs to be countered. The committee has also recommended that the Archives Act be amended to ensure that agencies could address ongoing matters regarding expensive repeated requests for material that have been stuck in lengthy and expensive legal processes. Finally, the committee recommends that a review of the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic be undertaken by the Office of National Intelligence, ensuring they are captured and shared across the entire national intelligence community. The committee has also made a statement in this report regarding the future direction it intends to take with future administration and expenditure reviews, which will be to focus on themes and issues of concern rather than just routine matters that are adequately re reported or examined elsewhere. Madam Acting Deputy President, I want to put on the record my personal thanks and extend my gratitude to the extremely hardworking men and women at the head of our intelligence community. Mr Andrew Shearer, Director General of the Office of National Intelligence. Mr Mike Burgess, Director General of Security. Mr Paul Simon, the Director General of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service. Ms Rachel Noble, the Director General of the Australian Signals Directorate. Lieutenant General Gavin Reynolds AM, Chief of the Defence Intelligence. And Mr Scott Dewar, Director of the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation. By their very nature, most of our intelligence agency heads are very limited in what they can say publicly about their work and the amazing people that they employ. It is also not appropriate for them to respond, as much as they may wish to, to the criticism which often comes that way, much of it unjustified. In my view, the most unfair of these recent criticisms came from the former Prime Minister, Paul Keating, who really should know better given the office he once occupied. The, our intelligence agencies provide the best quality insight that they can, and then it is up to political leaders to make the policy decisions which flow from that. So let me say on their behalf, in my experience, our intelligence community is full of diligent, professional and dedicated people who take compliance with the law, their ethical obligations and the national interest of our country very seriously. Of course, we can never just take it on trust that that will always be the case. Any self-respecting liberal democracy must have in place a robust system of oversight and scrutiny, both to ensure that the significant powers we grant our agencies are used appropriately, but also that the public can have confidence that that is the case. So I'd also like to thank the Inspector General on Intelligence and Security, the Commonwealth Ombudsman, the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor and the Auditor General for the role that they play in assisting the PJCIS to perform our parliamentary oversight duties. I have the privilege in this position of working closely with the leaders of our national intelligence community, and I thank them for their cooperation, their transparency, and for making available some of the most sensitive information about their agencies to assist the committee to complete its review. While most Australians will never see the work that they do, we should all be very proud of and extend our gratitude to them, especially amid the increasingly challenging security environment in our own region. Similarly, I extend thanks to my fellow committee members, in particular the former Deputy Chair Anthony Byrne and the new Deputy Chair Senator McAllister, for their focus and dedication in fulfilling a critical part of the committee's statutory duty and parliamentary oversight role. And I commend the report to the Senate and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny, uh, of bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest Number 17 of 2021. And do you seek leave to continue your remarks? So the we're taking note. Tabling, Just tabling. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tukoni. Yes, Senator Dunning. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I present government responses to reports of the uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on its review of the relisting of Hezbollah's external security organisation as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement on Illicit Tobacco. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave's granted. I believe we have two more reports or two sections of reports that we just need to see if anybody wants to speak to. They're on page four of today's uh, red. Um, 
items five, six, seven and eight. I'm just confirming that no one's seeking to address any of those reports, government responses. That being the case, we'll move on to ministerial statements. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, on behalf of the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, and Mr Littleproud, I table a ministerial statement on developing Northern Australia. I think the magic words have just been uttered, <coughs> Senator MacDonald. They have. Thank so you. I'll give you the call, Senator. Thank you very much. I rise to take note of the 2021 annual statement to the parliament on developing Northern Australia and to acknowledge uh, the Honourable David Littleproud, Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia, because this truly is a government that is focused on developing the Northern Australia agenda. For a nation where just 1.3 million people—5.3 per cent of our population—live in the top 51 per cent of the nation, a casual observer could be forgiven for wondering why we'd prioritise the development of Northern Australia. Surely it is too hot, too wet, too dry, too unpopulated to care about. But for those of us who live, who work, who invest in Northern Australia, the reality, of, uh, reality is that it is the part of the nation that has the true potential to deliver the increase of food and fibre production essential minerals for our new, new economy, unique and wonderful tourism destinations, defence placement and Indigenous community connections. Our people are hardworking. They're used to being patient, waiting for seasons, for prices and recognition from our southern cousins. Only 5 per cent of our House of Reps members speak for the northern 50 per cent of landmass and 8 per cent of senators live in the north. And a foreign observer wondering why our economy has continued to not just survive but thrive during the pandemic need look no further than northern Australia. The north kept digging, driving, growing, providing jobs and keeping the royalties and taxes flowing. And that's why, as a nation, we care about developing northern Australia. The four pillars that I often uh, refer to in developing the North is an access to affordable and reliable electricity. We pay, on average, three times more for electricity in North Queensland than we do in Southern Queensland. Access to insurance and finance. In the North, we pay three times the price of insurance if we can get it in Northern Australia, uh, and finance is similarly weighted. We require suitable infrastructure, road, rail, flights and freight infrastructure, and fourthly, access to high quality medical care, aged care and child care. Now, I am delighted to say that this government is focusing on those very important issues, uh, particularly the Northern Australia Insurance uh, Fund, which should come into effect next year. Uh, this is a $10 billion reinsurance pool which will allow for insurers to re-enter the market in Northern Australia and ensure that we are suitably protected. The North performs functions the South does not and cannot. It funds much of the rest of the nation uh, through royalties for hospitals and schools. And again, for that reason, the North matters. Most importantly, though, recently, there has been $9.3 million allocated to the Regions of Growth pilot program, Broome to Kununurra to Darwin across Western Australia and the Northern Territory, the Beedaloo Basin to Catherine to Darwin in the Northern Territory again, Cairns to Gladstone, Mount Isa to Townsville in Queensland. The Minister has announced the master plans for three of those regions and their respective corridors, 20-year blueprints and five-year action plans to lead a structured and coordinated investment agenda. Most importantly, though, in collaboration with state and territory counterparts, industry and communities. And the first master plans will focus on locations within three regions of growth, Kununurra to Darwin, Catherine to Middle Arm and Mount Isa to Townsville. These projects will de-risk the north and give confidence to the private sector to uh, invest in Northern Australia. And this is important because it is developing plans for the North by the North. 
and I am truly excited by this advancement in policy thinking. Minister Littleproud has brought a new coordination to the government uh, policy settings in this country because he has turned his mind to coordinating a whole-of-government effort. Traditionally, departments work siloed, and what Minister Littleproud has done has encouraged uh, the introduction of more frequent roundtables where uh, both federal, state and territory jurisdiction agencies across a range of portfolios—health, defence, uh, infrastructure and many more—sit at the same table and discuss the significant advancements that have been made both in government research and investment as well as private enterprise. Because we know that it is in the north that the significant productivity gains of mining and agriculture in renewables and new industries will spring up. Resources are taking off pit to port. Vanadium and rare earths are mines that are being developed, and I applaud the Queensland government for recently investing in a public utility asset for a vanadium uh, processing facility. The CRC for Northern Australia is doing uh, extremely interesting work, promising results of studies into alternative cropping, into forestry and cane, utilising industries that are already successful in Northern Australia and finding new and more exciting uses for these crops. Uh, the important part is, is that allows farmers and producers to, to be more profitable, more successful. We know that that makes them uh, not only more sustainable, but it makes them better land managers, which is something uh, that there has been quite a deal of, of interest in in Queensland particularly. And importantly, in, bus in Indigenous business development, being able to uh, harness the enthusiasm and the potential of Indigenous communities uh, that are uh, looking for ways to engage their young people, their communities, on country and to stay on country and not have to go away. Townsville Port is Australia's largest northern port in sugar, lead, copper, zinc, fertiliser, molasses and live cattle as well. It is also the largest container and automotive port in northern Australia. More than 8 million tonnes of goods worth more than $10 billion are handled through there each year. So this is an exciting future, funded and supported by this coalition government, because it is important that we do turn our whole of nation, whole of government attention to developing, as I said, a cross-portfolio uh, solutions for the North. We need to positively discriminate for Northern Australia. In Townsville alone, $562 million was spent on flying consultants into that city, a city that has uh, incredible and useful capability and capacity in business consulting, in health consulting, in transport and freight consulting, and yet we continue to fly people into that city. And I think if I did the numbers, it would be the same right across Northern Australia. I am tired of businesses having a token office, a post office box and a serviced office in our northern cities and calling that being based in the north and then uh, calling for uh, government projects where they don't pay the salaries into northern Australia, where the people don't live there, they don't have their white collar salaries in the north, their kids in the schools, the uh, lawn being mowed. These are the sort of things that develop our northern capacity. So when I say I want to positively discriminate in favour of the north, it is to demand that appointments are filled with people who live in northern Australia, that contracts for consultants are awarded to companies that genuinely are based in the north, and to support projects and organisations that pay their wages and live and do not fly and fly out to northern Australia because it is only with that kind of practical approach that we can fulfil our true potential and destiny. And I applaud the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia for the work he has done in truly driving this agenda uh, and holding us to account. Thank you. Senator Watt, you have the call.
Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I would have loved to have been there with you in person, uh, but uh, unfortunately that hasn't been possible. But I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this and to take note of the Minister's statement uh, on Northern Australia. So I'd like to respond to the Minister's statement. And I do want to congratulate Minister Little Proud uh, and Senator MacDonald, who I know has taken on a new role uh, in relation to Northern Australia. And I want to congratulate Minister Little Proud on providing his first update as Minister for Northern Australia uh, to the House of Representatives. However, it must be said uh, that six years on from the introduction of this government's white paper on de developing Northern Australia, the truth is that we are still waiting on this government to deliver on many of the promises they've made to the North. We do hear a lot of talk from this government about the potential of Northern Australia. But six years on, we still haven't seen a whole lot delivered. Uh, and I think most people in Northern Australia would have expected to see more actually on the ground from this government six years after that white paper was released. Uh, this, speech, this week, while I haven't been with you in Canberra, I have taken the opportunity to spend the last two days in Cairns, uh, where I have seen a lot more of that potential on display uh, in both traditional industries that Cairns is very well known for, but for new industries as well. And what we need is a federal government that's going to get behind that potential, whether it be in Cairns, other places in Queensland, the Northern Territory or Western Australia, to convert that potential to reality. Uh, but unfortunately, over the life, life of this government, time and time again, we've seen advances in the Northern Australia agenda derailed by leadership squabbles within the National Party, uh, because it is the National Party that has held this portfolio for most of the life of this government. Just recently, we saw Minister Keith Pitt ousted from the job as Minister for Northern Australia after only one year in the role as a result of another leadership change in the National Party. So it is disappointing, I think, to everyone in Northern Australia who watches on seeing the Nationals fight for their jobs rather than the jobs of Northern Australians. Uh, of course, we've seen significant turmoil as well at the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. The, 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 key, uh, the key policy and program behind the government's Northern Australia agenda, uh, and that was exacerbated recently with the recent shock an unexplained resignation of its CEO. Labor supports the NAIF, as I have always made clear, and my predecessors as well. Uh, there is a genuine gap in financing projects in Northern Australia, which the NAIF could fill. And again, over the last couple of days, both in Cairns and in Brisbane, I've met with businesses who are currently seeking funding through the NAIF. There is no denying that there is a financing gap when it comes to projects in Northern Australia that the NAIF could be filling. Uh, and that's why I was pleased that the government, uh, over the last 12 months, adopted some of the suggestions proposed through the Senate inquiry into the federal government's Northern Australia agenda, such as allowing it to make equity investments and increasing support for small and First Nations projects. Uh, but six years after it was announced, the NAIF has still only released 8.5% or $427.6 million of its $5 billion budget. So at this rate, it'll take 70 years for all of the NAIF's funding to actually be rolled out. Uh, it's also been concerning this year to see the winding back of some of the Office of Northern Australia's key structures. This included downgrading the Ministerial Forum for Northern Australia to an as-needed format uh, and cutting off funding to the Indigenous Reference Group for Northern Australia. Uh, it's pleasing that the government under Minister Little Proud has now confirmed that the Indigenous Reference Group will be re-established. That should never have been in doubt. Uh, but it is concerning that so little consideration was given to the ongoing importance of engagement with First Nations Northern Australians, especially given the land ownership of First Nations people and the sheer population of First Nations people in Northern Australia. These types of structures are essential for the collaboration the Northern Australia agenda needs to succeed. Um, I want to pick up on one point Senator MacDonald made. She talked about the importance of uh, jobs being located in Northern Australia. I agree with her on that point, and it'd be really good to see this government follow suit. Uh, but we learned at Senate Estimates recently that the majority of the NAIF staff, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, the majority of staff of that organisation are based in Sydney, which is hardly Northern Australia. There are more NAIF staff in Sydney than there are across the entirety of Northern Australia. 
It's just not good enough. And it's another sign um, that unfortunately this government's promises to Northern Australia don't always get delivered. Um, what Northern Australia needs, uh, and I, I, I say this after spending significant amounts of time in Northern Australia uh, and speaking to many representatives, whether it be businesses, unions, governments and community organisations. Uh, as the government is fond of saying, the North is ripe with, poten with potential, uh, but, but it needs more than just recognising its potential. Our North needs a real bold plan backed by real action. The truth is that we do have the opportunity to set up Northern Australia to lead our country out of COVID-19. Uh, it has incredible opportunities that can really lead the pace for our country as a whole. Um, but what, what Northern Australia needs, as I say, is a real plan with real action uh, rather than woolly promises that end up not being delivered. Uh, and that's what Labor's economic plan for Northern Australia will do. Uh, and I just want to spend the remainder of my contribution putting forward an alternative agenda for Northern Australia, which, which, which actually will deliver on the potential that we know really exists in the region. Fundamental to Labor's plan is a very simple proposition, and that is that what we support and what Northern Australia desperately wants is more jobs in more industries. They don't want to be picked off and involved in some culture war between the Greens on the one hand and the National Party on the other, which want to say that you can only have the traditional industries or you can only have the new industries. What people in Northern Australia want is more jobs in more industries, and that's what Labor's plan will deliver. We want to create more jobs in the North's backbone industries like agriculture, resources and tourism. There remain huge opportunities across these traditional, well-established industries to build the supply chain and value add. Uh, things like food manufacturing, carbon farming, cultural environmental tourism and using our minerals to build things here in Australia, preferably in Northern Australia, like batteries. Uh, we want to create more jobs as well in the hidden industries that we often don't recognise and don't get featured in the government's agenda for Northern Australia. Industries like healthcare, education and human services. Go to any major town in, region, in Northern Australia and you will find that the biggest employers are those sectors, healthcare, education and human services. But despite the fact that they're such big employers, they're not even part of the government's Northern Australia agenda. That has to change because they have huge economic potential as well as catering um, to, the, to the service needs and lifestyle needs of our North. And of course, Labor also wants to create more jobs in the newer industries where our North has a massive competitive advantage like renewables, hydrogen, advanced manufacturing, aerospace and creative industries. Again, you don't hear much from the government about those industries, but they are fast growing. They have huge opportunities. Um, they generally provide well-paid jobs uh, and they pick up on the cultural uh, and, uh, and knowledge base that Northern Australia has in abundance. One of the Senate inquiry's key findings was, the, was that the Northern Australia agenda needs to get behind these new industries, creating greater and more stable employment across our North. Um, just as an example, with a government that is truly committed to its development, rather than a government that had to be kick, dragged kicking and screaming to net zero emissions by 2050, we could make Northern Australia the world capital of new energy generation. Just imagine the opportunities that we have to drive a new age of heavy engineering and advanced manufacturing in the north on the back of cheap, clean power. After years of manufacturing decline, we can re-industrialise our north, bringing manufacturing on shore by offering cheap power, creating good jobs for decades to come. That's just one example in one sector. So there are many opportunities like this arising across northern Australia, but they need a real plan that actually acknowledges the industries and gets behind them rather than poo-pooing them, which is what we've seen far too option from this government. Uh, and, and, and we need to see some serious commitments from the government to deliver them um, in infrastructure, in skills, but also in social infrastructure. Any time you go into Northern Australia, it doesn't matter where you go, housing is one of the first issues that's raised with you and the skill shortages are the other. And again, we've seen serious underinvestment from the government in those areas. We can't possibly expect to take the opportunities that exist, whether they be in those traditional industries, in the hidden industries or the new industries, if we don't provide that basic social infrastructure. And again, that is just not part of this government's plan. 
Labor has a clear plan uh, for more jobs in more industries. We'll deliver the infrastructure, the skills and all of the other social infrastructure that's needed. It's time for a change in Northern Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Watt. And do you seek leave to continue your remarks? I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you for prompting me, Chair. Uh, <laughs> Madam Deputy Premier. Thank you. Uh, are there any further ministerial statements? Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I table documents relating to the order for production of documents concerning questions asked by the Environment and Communications References Committee relating to oil and gas exploration and uh, production in the Beetaloo Basin. Thanks. No one's taking note. Oh, uh, Sen you. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I will. Um, uh, seek leave to uh, continue my remarks. We are about to have a disallowance debate in relation to Beetaloo Basin, and I'll continue, I'll continue uh, there. But I just want to make sure we can come back to those documents um, at a later stage. Thank you, uh, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. In accordance with the provisions of the Parliament Act 1974. I present a proposal for works within the parliamentary zone relating to the Dame Enid Lyons and Dame Dorothy Tangley commemorative sculpture. I seek leave to give notice of a motion in relation to the proposal. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that in accordance with section 5 of the Parliament Act 1974. Uh, the Senate approves the proposal by the National Capital Authority for capital works within the parliamentary zone relating to the Dame Enid Lyons and Dame Dorothy Tangney commem commemorative sculpture. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Electoral Legislation Amendment Political Campaigners Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. All those in favour say aye. Against? The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of political campaigners and to provide for the application of the amendments. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill will be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Dunning. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be an order uh, of the day for a later hour. And the question is that the debate be the resumption of the debate be made an order for a later, for the late order of the day for a later hour. <laughs> it must be getting late in the hours. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, those in favour say aye. Those against? No. The ayes have it. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse Amendment. Funders of Last Resort and Other Measures Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Uh, the question is that the bill proceed without formalities and read a first time. Those in favour? Those against? The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sex Abuse Act 2018 and for related purposes. Senator Dunningham. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Question is a motion put by the minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Those against? No. The ayes have it. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes in the membership of joint committees. Yes, so Clark, thanks. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, motion for the disallowance of the Industry Research and Development Beetaloo Cooperative Drilling Program Instrument 2021. 
Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise to contribute to the debate in relation to this disallowance motion in my name on behalf of the Australian Greens. This is a very important disallowance motion because what it seeks to do is to stop a $50 million slush fund going to mates of the Liberal Party to keep polluting our planet even more. What is going on here is that Mr Morrison and his government, his minister, Angus Taylor, and the resources minister, uh, Mr Pitt, want to open up the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory and build the world's largest gas field. And this, Madam Acting Deputy President, is when we are in the midst of a climate crisis. The COP26 climate summit in Glasgow two weeks ago heard very clearly from scientists right around the world and other world leaders that in order to combat dangerous global warming, we had to stop making climate change worse. We had to start leaving coal and gas in the ground. There's a lot of cleaning up to do right now, Madam Acting Deputy President, before even making it even worse. The International Energy Agency tells us that if we are to keep temperatures below the, three to, the critical threshold of 1.5 degrees, if we're to get to net zero by even 2050, we have to stop opening up new coal, new coal and gas fields. In fact, we can't have any new fossil fuels if we are to stop dangerous global warming. And of course, we know already what this devastating climate crisis is all about. Australia has lived through the worst bushfires we've ever seen only two summers ago. We know that our neighbours in the Pacific Islands are already feeling the devastating impacts of sea level rise. We know that famine and drought are hitting some of the most impoverished nations around the world. And we know that in order to stop this, we have to stop polluting. We have to stop making climate change worse. This current disallowance motion is to stop $50 million of Australian taxpayers' money being handed to private gas companies so that they can continue to drill and explore for more gas. What planet are we on, Madam Acting Deputy President, in a world where we are facing a climate crisis, where we're pleading with world leaders, and we're telling our children that we need to stop polluting, that we're spending government money, taxpayers' money, propping up the industry that is making our planet sick. And of course, this is all going on in the Northern Territory, in the Beedaloo Basin, without the consent of the traditional owners. In fact, when I was in Glasgow for the Global Summit only two weeks ago, I met with a young woman who is terrified and frustrated and angry of what the government is proposing to do on her people's land. Ricky Dank, a young, strong First Nations woman from Beedaloo, was there at the Global Summit pleading with world leaders to help stop this devastation, pleading not just for the rights of her people, but for the rights of every child on this planet. Because if this gas basin is allowed to be opened up, the Morrison government themselves boasts that this is going to be the biggest in the world <laughs> at a time when we've got to be getting out of fossil fuels, investing money instead in the transition to clean, green, renewable energy investing in the strategies that we undoubtedly need in terms of adaptation, because already the climate is warming. 
But rather than doing that, what we see is Mr Morrison putting his hand in the pockets of Australians, taking their hard-earned taxes and handing it over to his mates in the gas industry. These mates in the gas industry, Madam Acting Deputy President, let me just put it very clearly, are also donors to the coalition. When I was in Glasgow two weeks ago, over and over and over again, I heard from leaders, from scientists, from civil society, from key business people, and I said that I was from Australia. The first question they would ask is, what on earth is going on down there? Why is your government so obsessed with propping up coal and gas? We're all here trying to work out a strategy to reduce pollution, to transition, to get money out of subsidising fossil fuels. And all they're hearing from Australia's Prime Minister is, she'll be right, mate, we're doing enough, and by the way, we're going to keep funnelling money to our mates in the fossil fuel industry. The Prime Minister, when he spoke in Glasgow, sounded like a stroppy, grumpy, out-of-touch old man. He stood on the stage for three minutes. He travelled all the way to Glasgow for a speech for three minutes. And when he stood up, he was dismissive of the negotiations taking place, said Australia didn't have to do anything more, we were doing enough, and everything was hunky-dory back home. He directed his Australian negotiators to not sign the coal agreement to leave coal in the ground and to open no new coal power plants and mines. He refused to sign the methane pledge. Because guess where methane comes from, Madam Acting Deputy President? Gas. In fact, with the leaking of gas wells at the rates currently, three to four per cent, gas is even dirtier than coal. But the Prime Minister doesn't want you to know that. The Prime Minister is doing the bidding of the big fossil fuel companies, pretending that everything's a OK and that at a minute to midnight, perhaps in 2049, all of a sudden it will all be fixed and we will get to net zero by 2050. Well, the rest of the world knows that is bollocks. They know it is not true. And that is what we heard over and over and over again at the global summit. While other world leaders were getting together to discuss how they tackle climate change, how they deal with the influence and the undue pressure from the world's multinational coal and gas companies, we had Australia's Prime Minister running PR stunts for Santos. At Glasgow, at these summits, all of the countries have a pavilion where they showcase what their government is doing and what their people are doing to deal with climate change, what they're bringing to the global discussion and putting on the table, what their contribution is. Australia, the Australian pavilion, at the direction of the minister, Angus Taylor, had a coffee cart and a Santos logo. So what Australia brought to the global summit, what they wanted broadcasted, was we might make good coffees, but boy, we do gas well. The idea that you rock up to a climate change conference to discuss how your country works with others to cut global warming, showcasing one of the filthiest, dirtiest industries in the country, 
is appalling, and it left a bad taste in the back of everybody's mouth. And Mr Morrison and his pavilion stand, the minister, Angus Taylor, were a laughing stock on the world stage. Business leaders thought it, world leaders thought it, civil society knew it. And no wonder when I spoke with Ricky Dank, all the way from the Northern Territory, who is there to plead for her country and her people, she was so angry and frustrated. Because what was being presented by her government and her country was a fraud. You can't get to net zero by 2050, and you can't get to net zero by 2030 if you keep opening up new coal and gas. What part of that does this government not understand? But of course, we're here today debating this disallowance because it's not just the Morrison government that is doing this as a frolic on their own for their mates in the coal and gas industry. Sadly, Mr Acting Deputy President, they are doing it in full sight with the support of the Labor opposition. And this is just devastating to Australians across the country who know we need to get serious about climate change and that we are running out of time. This next decade is crucial. And yet we have the Labor opposition agreeing with the Morrison government for public money to be spent on carbon capture and storage to keep propping up the coal industry. And here today, what we will see is the Labor Party agreeing to allow $50 million of taxpayers' money to be handed from the government coffers straight over to their mates in the fossil fuel industry. It just beggars belief that this is what we are facing when the rest of the world is trying hard to come up with strategies to reduce pollution, to save the planet, to give our children a safe future. It is extremely disappointing to see the Labor Party fold into the lap of the fossil fuel industry like this. It's devastating to see when they know what a sham Mr Morrison's policies are. I mean, everybody does. It's been broadcast around the world. No one believes it. Everyone knows that he is not able to get to net zero without changing a thing. But it's worse than that. Labor want to allow Mr Morrison and Mr Taylor to spend $50 million propping up some private gas companies to do the wrecking on the land of the traditional owners without even having consent, to do it in the name of the next generation who are frustrated and angry that government and political leaders continue to turn a blind eye to the need of a safe climate to secure their future. Our planet is desperately sick. It needs help. It needs care. It needs restoration. And rather than helping to heal the planet, this program, paid for by taxpayers, is going to make our climate even worse, is going to make our planet even sicker. That is not a legacy that we should be leaving our children or the next generation. And I urge crossbenchers and the Labor Party tonight, don't let them get away with this. It's climate, it's, it's climate chaos, it's climate vandalism, and it's devastating.
Yeah. <coughs> oh, sorry, Senator McMahon. Um, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, so I, I rise to speak on this disallowance motion. Um, <clears throat> it's not the first time that this has been attempted. Uh, yes, this government has committed $50 million in grants to advance the exploration of the Beetaloo Basin, which we think and we hope uh, will be extremely productive. <clears throat> now, why have we done this? I mean, this government gives grants to uh, a lot of different industries that we think are going to be valuable for the Australian people and for our economy. We give lots of grants to things like hydrogen, battery storage, uh, solar, wind, uh, lots of grants to business development, lots of grants to manufacturing. Uh, we do a whole lot of work in this space to try and advance economic development. Um, and, and this is just one of those. <clears throat> um, so this is to bring forward exploration uh, of the Beetaloo Basin, which has the potential to bring um, a huge amount of jobs and economic stimulus to the Northern Territory in particular, and also to uh, Indigenous people and traditional owners. <clears throat> now, the Greens like to talk a big game about Indigenous people. But the truth is they actually don't care about Indigenous economic advancement, Indigenous jobs, Indigenous businesses and independence from welfare. Because if they did truly believe that, then they would be supporting this program. This program is not only going to provide jobs, actual jobs long term for the traditional owners of this area. It's also going to provide uh, the opportunity for Indigenous businesses. And in fact, I'm engaged with an Indigenous business at the moment in the region um, that is looking to provide services and a whole pile of other jobs um, to provide services to Senator this Thorpe. industry. Senator the fact Senator is, Martin, please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe, Acting point of order. Deputy President, can I bring your attention to the uh, state of the uh, House or Chamber? Sure. Yep, quorum required. Uh, ring the bells. Quorum present. Uh, Senator McMahon, you're in resumption. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, as I was saying, you know, the Greens like to talk a big game about supposedly supporting Indigenous Australians, but they actually don't. What they want to do is oppress them. What they're actually doing by this is trying to infantilise Indigenous Australians. Um, they, they want to keep them down. They don't want to give them economic opportunity 
because this is the biggest economic opportunity that Indigenous Territorians have had in a very, very long time. This will grow Indigenous businesses. This will provide Indigenous jobs. This will provide royalties for traditional owners. But see, the Greens don't even know what a traditional owner is. And when they can't find a traditional owner that supports their view, they go and make one. They actually create. They created a traditional owner. And Senator Hanson Young mentioned Ricky Dank, that she'd come all the way from the Northern Territory to Glasgow. But she actually didn't. She came all the way from Dubai, where she lives. And she has been confirmed by the Northern Land Council as not being a traditional owner. But she certainly wants a slice of whatever's in it for her from the Beedaloo Basin. So they can't find traditional owners that support their views, so they go and make them. They create traditional owners who are fake, fake traditional owners. That's what the Greens do. Um, so that's what they do. They make up what they want that supports their view. They, they are patronising so the Northern Land Council, the Northern Land Council, the body that is set up for uh, determining who are traditional owners and helping them negotiate with companies about their traditional lands. But they reject that. They reject that because, because that doesn't suit their narrative. That does not suit their narrative. So they reject the Northern Land Council, which is made up of Indigenous Territorians, um, and, and they go and make up their own traditional owners. Um, now they claim, and uh, Senator Hanson Young claimed this, um, that the traditional owners do not support this development on their land. But the truth is they actually do. Um, they, uh, they also uh, claim that the traditional owners are not capable of making the decisions uh, regarding their lands. So they are extremely capable. They sit down with the companies that want to explore. They sit down with the Northern Land Council, and they're capable of understanding what's going on, what's going to happen, and um, they Order. make informed. Order. They make informed decisions. They don't have decisions made for them by the Greens, which is what they'd have you, have you believe. Um, they make informed decisions about their traditional lands. They make informed decisions about what are and aren't sacred sites and where they do and do not want exploration to occur. You don't speak for me. You don't speak for my mob. Uh, so they make informed decisions. They're perfectly capable. They would have you believe they're not capable, but in fact they are, and they have made this decision that they do want to have exploration, economic opportunities and jobs on their land. Thank you, Senator. Craig Martin. Senator Pratt, are you seeking the call? <laughs> you, you are on no Okay, we're getting it. Thank you. Senator Mc Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, if the last couple of weeks have shown us anything, it is that if we want action on climate change, meaningful action on climate change, we are going to need to change the government. Because the Morrison government's performance on the international stage was embarrassing. The Morrison government went to Glasgow, committed, like all the other signatories, to updating their targets, to contributing to global momentum so that we could actually do something about climate change. That was their obligation. That's what they should have done. But we didn't see any of that, nothing of that at all. Instead, what we saw was an embarrassing effort to present their existing, weak, ineffective suite of policies as in some way a solution to the urgent global challenge of climate change. And they were called out, weren't they? They were called out. 
because the international community saw right through that. And international figure after international figure called on the Morrison government to do more. And the truth is Australians want them to do more as well. Australian people aren't silly. They know that the climate is changing. They know that there is an urgent task to start dealing with carbon emissions. They also know that the environmental emergency, the, environmental, the urgent environmental task, is also an economic opportunity because Australia is blessed with abundant natural resources and we have the opportunity to use those resources to create jobs of the future, to make sure that we do have a complex, diverse Australian economy with jobs in the regions, powered by clean renewable energy and creating opportunities for communities right across the country. There's no interest in that over there. The government is determined to continue with business as usual, to pretend that nothing needs to be done, to pretend that their do-nothing approach will be adequate. And people are angry about it. Labor will continue to argue for urgent and meaningful action on climate change in keeping with our commitment to reach net zero by 2050. Our record in government was to ratify Kyoto, to supercharge Australia's renewable energy sector and put Australia on a path of sharply declining emissions and what intervened to prevent that? Well, it was the election of the Abbott government and their determination to remove every meaningful institution that could have put Australia on a better path. Well, Labor has a very different approach, and a future Labor government will take the urgent task seriously. We've already announced that an Albanese Labor government will invest $20 billion to upgrade Australia's electricity grid, to unlock new sources of renewable energy and the jobs and power savings that come with them. We'll make electric cars cheaper by slashing inefficient taxes. We'll support 10,000 apprenticeships in the new energy trades of the future. And we'll cut bills and support the grid with community batteries for up to 100,000 solar households. And we know that this will receive the support of the Australian community because Australians are already embracing these technologies. Australians are already putting solar on their roofs and they're already looking for ways to improve their own carbon footprints. But where there is a, ga a role for gas to play in firming and peaking electricity and as a feedstock for manufacturing, exploration and extraction, then we understand that there is a role for gas in that transition. That gas uh, exploration and extraction must, of course, be subject to scientific, independent and evidence-based approvals. Evidence of the Beetaloo subbasin is in the early stages. It's uncertain what proportion of the resource will be technologically and economically viable to extract. And federal Labor respects the views of the Northern Territory government, which supports exploration of the Beetaloo Basin. We also supported a Senate inquiry into the Beetaloo Cooperative Drilling Program in the interest of transparency. And the work of that committee is ongoing. Labor will consider the final report of the Senate inquiry, which is due in March 2022. And as it stands, Labor does not support the disallowance motions proposed by the Greens Party. We will continue to advocate for ongoing consultation with traditional owners by both government and industry to ensure cultural heritage and the environment is protected as a matter of urgency. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The government stands by its gas-led recovery plans. The Beedaloo Basin has the potential to deliver 6,000 jobs and over 2 million petajoules of gas and drive economic recovery required. It's uh, we've got 30 seconds to adjournment. Uh, I'll Senator Hanson Young. Call. Uh, sure. Thank quorum. you, Senator Hanson Young. Yeah. Quorum. Yes, please. Okay. Quorum required.
Senator Faruqi, you can't leave the chamber while there's a quorum call. Uh, we, quorum's established. Thank you. It being 7.20, the debate is interrupted, so I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Uh, Senator Macdonald. Yeah. Thank you. It has been nearly two and a half years since I joined this chamber. Uh, what an incredible privilege to be a representative for my state. Uh, the great state of Queensland. But as that time has gone on, we have seen some extraordinary periods. We have seen a pandemic uh, like nothing before seen in this world. We have seen uh, e extraordinary uh, changes to technology uh, and opportunities for this nation. Uh, and we have also seen a debate around net zero emissions. Uh, something that we had um, a great deal of, of conversation about previously. But as I've been here, the debate has become increasingly dysfunctional. And I find it very distressing that I listen to senators talk about issues that are in no way related to the reality of the world that I live in in regional Australia. We've just had a response on the Northern Australia agenda from the uh, shadow uh, Northern Australia minister that talked about the need for more jobs. <clears throat> I talk. Uh, I hear often uh, Labor members, senators, talking about uh, wages going backwards, about we don't need immigration, that uh, immigrants are taking Australian jobs, and yet I wonder on what planet they've been living, because for the last uh, 18 months. We have seen uh, 300,000 people, roughly, leave Australia as uh, seasonal workers, uh, students uh, and other um, uh, workforce. And in regional Australia, it is desperate. It is dire. Business owners weep to me the number of hours that they are working to keep their business doors open long enough to be able to pay the basic, way, the basic bills of insurance and rent and overheads. And yet we will still have Labor talking about creating public servants' jobs in northern Australia as if that is some sort of solution. Uh, I spoke again to a business owner tonight who will not be able to keep his business doors open more than four days a week because he doesn't have the staff to do that. So, it, it is, I am reflecting tonight on my Senate colleagues who are up for re-election. The three of them, uh, Senator James McGrath, Senator Matt Canavan and Senator Amanda Stoker, because the three of them are going to form part of the future of this country. I have never felt the urgency of having people in this place to support the delivery of the government's agenda. I've never felt more strongly the urgency to fill this chamber with a review uh, of legislation uh, that goes ahead, but at the same time allows Australians to believe that they can uh, have the government that delivers on the practicality and the real issues that are facing them, that allows the government to implement its agenda 
as voted for by the people of Australia. We have enjoyed great success having six government senators from Queensland in this chamber uh, from Queensland, and the country is better for it. We have had terrific economy, excellent trade deals, low unemployment, and it is only because of strong coalition support in the Senate that the country is in such good shape. Inquiries are an important part of the function of government, and it helps in the lawmaking process so that it is fit for purpose. And importantly, they also give a voice to marginalised groups who need their issues officially investigated. I reflect on the work that we have done in a number of inquiries uh, in the Senate, and, uh, and I'm very proud of the light that we've been able to shine on specific things like the Great Barrier Reef science, uh, the dairy industry, inland rail, just a few under the uh, RAC committee. So I will be doing my utmost to ensure we return our three senators who are up for re-election. They have the runs on the board. They have helped steer Australia through a tumultuous time. They have ensured miners, farmers and working families in Queensland benefit from their representation. And we need this experience back for the good work this government can continue. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. And I rise to speak on one of the forgotten casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is the rural bank branches. While many of you may not think that that is a major issue, it is actually a very real and pressing one for people in regional Australia and right across New South Wales, my uh, constituency. The amazing women of the New South Wales Country Women's Association, they know that it's a problem. And this year they passed a motion acting, uh, uh, seeking action on the rapidly increasing closure of rural bank branches. This is an issue of life and death for many rural towns. Empty storefronts breed empty storefronts. And those who initially would travel into town to do their banking and their shopping may be forced to do both in another bigger town, accelerating the decline, assuming that they have the capacity to travel those distances and the money to put petrol in their car. These closures are often sudden and clients are often not notified by the banks that they're about to close. The big banks are moving further and further away from the social licence that they have to operate, and they cannot continue to disadvantage those who cannot bank over the phone or the internet, such as the elderly, people with disabilities and those who are underserviced by the tenth-rate NBN inflicted on this country by the Abbott government banked in by Morrison, the Morrison government and Mr Turnbull as well. Who should have known better? I want to read in the Hansard some of the stories of those CWA women who have fought against the closures of these important pieces of economic infrastructure. Here's their words. Here in Lauriton, mid-north coast of New South Wales, we have lost ANZ, St George and Westpac so far. NAB has limited hours but closed with the last lockdown. Sign says they will open again after lockdown just leaves us with Commonwealth and the post office. Finlay, just north of the Murray River, lost CBA within six weeks of notice, took the ATM. Leaves NAB open for three hours in the morning and the NAB ATM and post office, which can uh, manage only limited transactions, maximum cash out at the IGA, is $100. And this is the reality. That limited access to money that they need to use in their local community Kempsey ANZ closes this month. We'll have to travel either to Port Macquarie or Coffs Harbour, which is close to 100 kilometres away. 100 kilometres to your nearest bank. Both NAB and ANZ have closed in Wee War this year. I'm aware of one dear lady that's been with the CBA since a child, and that's quite a 70-plus years of loyalty, who now does not drive and now has to travel over an hour just to get her money. This is an example of the bush being abandoned again. Another one, Westpac branch in Corindai, New South Wales, closed last year at the beginning of the pandemic and never reopened. Now there are just half a dozen of the over 70 stories on bank closures that I've just shared with you. Each of them is from a different part of the state, but every one tells the same story of loss of community, loss of service, loss of connection. The decision to shut a rural branch is not a decision 
pushed by economic imperative. If it was, we could understand it. During the COVID-19 pandemic, banks' profits did not take a hit. They continued to soar. And yet, despite soaring profits, they went ahead and shut down bank, branch after branch. The Sydney Morning Herald in March of this year uh, ass asserted that, and I quote, across the big four, half-year cash profits soared by an average 62 per cent, dividends rebounded sharply, and lenders have said they have billions in excess capital that is likely to ultimately find its way into shareholders' pockets. The Australian reported earlier this year that one bank was closed because a staff member had had the time to make a customer a cup of tea and, in doing so, proved that it wasn't productive enough. Tell that to somebody who lives in a community and banked at a bank for 70 years. It's not good enough. And I see there is some support from people in the government, but they should not be allowing the banks to get away with this. It's a disgrace. You need to stand up for rural communities. In the last four years, we've seen over 10 per cent of rural bank branches close. And where is the National Party on this? The government must do more in this place to support these towns that they spout support for. But what we see is more inaction and more deference to the banks and a failure to stand up for community access. Thank you, Mr. Senator President. Senator Roberts, remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me? Certainly can. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'm ashamed to say that Australia is at war, at war with state and federal governments. I'm appalled that Friday, 17 December, looms in our state as the official date of segregation between the injected and the uninjected. Two years ago, anyone who dared suggest such a scenario would have been mocked and labelled a conspiracy theorist. It could never happen in our country. It would have been unthinkable that any Australian political leader would consider segregating based on injection status. Even as a strategy to deal with COVID under the guise that we can all regain our inherent human right to move freely throughout our country. Despite Victoria being the world's most locked down jurisdiction and Victorians until recently suffering under increasingly draconian restrictions, Victoria today has more cases of COVID than it did a year ago. There was never any science nor modeling that suggested we could suppress the virus. So instead government suppressed and oppressed the people to hide political foolishness failings and gross mismanagement. What started as a supposed war on COVID became a fear-driven war against the people of Australia to make politicians appear to know what they're doing. Yet politicians and health bureaucrats making decisions destroying our lives have not suffered themselves. These privileged positions have remained intact, have not lost jobs, and are not wondering how the hell to feed families. Instead, the privileged have been comfortably working from home, waiting for the storm to blow over. Our confidence and trust in governments have collapsed because we have been lied to. The Australian people witness sweeping inconsistencies, contradictions and hypocrisies on virus rules. And in this, the Queensland Premier excels. After nearly two years, state and federal politicians still do not act with one shared view of what a hotspot is, resulting in thousands of double injected Queensland re residents abandoned for months at huge cost just over the border in New South Wales, unable to return home. The fact that the Queensland Premier can hold Queensland residents in such low regard is repugnant, disgusting, inhuman. The Prime Minister's lame pretense to push back against mandatory injections provides little comfort to Australians. It drives scorn, derision and anger. He says the federal government does not mandate COVID injections, yet leaves the states and territories to run wild with mandates that gut and make a mockery of informed consent, bodily autonomy and human rights. Lies. Federal agencies destroy the primacy and privacy of the doctor-patient relationship. Federal government health data is essential for states to enforce mandates. And the Queensland Premier says her decision to divide and segregate is in line with the spuriously labelled National Cabinet, a concoction over which the Prime, the Prime Minister presides. Our political leaders don't know when to stop hurting the people. Their thirst for personal ease and for political control over the masses is their justification for draconian measures shed shredding privacy and human rights, wreaking havoc with people's lives and mental health, endorsing segregation based on injection status. The rhetoric throughout COVID has been, we're all in this together. Queensland segregation date of 17th of December shows we are not. 
It's unconscionable that unless injected Queenslanders will be barred from social leisure and health, health activities, health services. Is the federal government going to stand by and let the Queensland Premier deny uninjected Queenslanders a restaurant meal, a drink in the pub, a coffee, and despite paying our taxes, medical care except in an emergency? Confidence in the injection should translate into confidence of being protected, making it unnecessary to marginalise people choosing to remain injection free. Are people so scared that this logic is lost? There was an opportunity this week for the government to support Senator Hanson's bill, which outlaws discrimination based on injection status. Yet the majority of government senators hid in their offices and did nothing, hiding from constituents, scurrying from accountability. The federal government is doing nothing to stop the imminent segregation of the Australian people. To avoid getting hands dirty, enforcement will be outsourced to state po police and to small business owners. We need to stop our political leaders dividing us and driving, coercing discrimination against our fellow Australians. We need to work together as a nation of Australian people, not state against state in an in insane, futile race to suppress and eliminate COVID, when what's really being suppressed are the people. People are now taking to the streets, protesting to push back government overreach and to restore our freedoms. People know that freedom, privacy and human rights have been eroded too much for too long and at huge cost and with both courage and desperation, march in the streets now. It seems freedom isn't always easy and free. Sometimes it must be fought for. Today, we're still fighting for common sense, for our freedom and for our democracy. We want it back. Senator Fioravanti Wells. President, tonight I'd like to focus on the impact of COVID in southwestern Sydney. It was interesting to read today's front page of the Sydney Morning Herald about heavier lockdown measures being imposed in western and southwestern Sydney. As patron senator for McMahon, Werriwa, Fowler, Blacksland and, uh, and Watson, and with a satellite office located in Fairfield, I would like to share matters which I experienced firsthand which have enabled this perception to gain momentum. In mid-July, requirements were imposed on essential workers in the Fairfield LGA for COVID testing every three days. This raised concerns and perceptions about why southwestern Sydney was being singled out. At first, there were logistical problems with testing at Fairfield Showground immediately after the New South Wales Health Order was made, which compounded the problems. Residents felt that they were especially being targeted given the strong police presence on the streets. Now, I live on the northern beaches of Sydney. I went through lockdown at Christmas, but I have to say we did not see on the streets of the northern beaches uh, police cars lined up on Barring Joey Road uh, or police on the streets like we saw in the suburbs of southwestern Sydney. Instead of imposing extra surveillance, there should have been greater focus on multi multilingual services and closer consultation with community leaders. To this end, uh, in July, I posted a Facebook video message which had been translated into different languages. It was promulgated in the area, encouraging communities to get vaccinated. Also, my office started conducting direct calling into households. The feedback was clear. People were not happy about the delay in the vaccine rollout. Uh, they wanted the Pfizer vaccine. Those in small business and construction could not work from home. There were issues about homeschooling and the push to vaccinate their children. Livelihoods were being impacted and people blamed politicians and bureaucrats making decisions who continued to draw big salaries. All this against a background of cultural and linguistic diversity and changing messages about restrictions. Another issue which caused concern was the deployment of the Australian Defence Force personnel. Um, local councillors and community leaders were very critical of government, calling it insensitive. As one mayor stated, deploying the ADF to an area with a large number of migrant residents from war-torn countries was insensitive. I spoke to one major service provider who pointed out to me that with such a large cohort of people born overseas, many of whom had been granted protection under our humanitarian program, they had escaped hardship, including from war-torn countries where they were fearful of the army. 
An article in the Sydney Morning Herald of 20 August outlined how community leaders in the affected areas feared for people's mental health, women at risk and disaffected youth, as they warned that the imposition of a police curfew imposed unevenly and without social support would further entrench us and them attitudes and inequality across the city. Regrettably, instead of focusing on maximising vaccinations through walk-in hubs at mosques, churches, community halls, where called communities regularly congregate, we heard stories of delays in getting vaccination appointments. I might add that I advised the New South Wales government that that's the strategy, but regrettably, I received no reply. In the words of one community leader, if you want to do the curfew, regardless of whether it's legitimate or not, do it across the board. This message resound, resonated greatly. Community leaders reported hardships by small business and families being desperate because they could no longer afford to pay their mortgage, rent, bills or put food on the table to feed their children. The perception of different rules for different parts of Sydney compounded the sense of inequity. An op-ed by Jordan Baker, SMH education editor, who lived in an LGA of concern, stated that it wouldn't feel so oppressive if Sydney was all in this together. But here, there is no longer any pretense of that. As Dr Martin Kuldorf tweeted on 14 August, there is, as always, an enormous gap between the people who use elite media and political platforms to demand lockdowns and the people and families who actually bear the burden of those lockdowns. That's what makes lockdown advocacy for elites so cheap and easy. Senator Sheldon. Mr President, well, this Friday is Black Friday, the biggest shopping holiday in the United States and it's becoming increasingly popular in Australia. Ahead of Black Friday, I'm standing with the Transport Workers Union and, and the SDA and unions and MPs from around the world who this week are calling for an end to appalling work conditions and low wages for Amazon workers. Amazon believes it is too big to worry about pesky little Australia. It doesn't need to respect Australian laws. It doesn't need to repay Australian taxes. It doesn't need to treat Australian business fairly, and it doesn't need to give Australian workers a fair go. Amazon believes it can import the very worst of the anti-worker and anti-union behaviour from the United States. And as so long as this wretched and incompetent government is in power, maybe it's correct. Because let's look at what Amazon has been allowed to get away with in Australia so far. The ABC revealed back in 2019 that Amazon paid just $20 million in Australia tax in 2018 on a revenue of more than $1 billion. Because Amazon shifts its, its Australian revenue to tax havens. When giant companies like Amazon make billions using infrastructure paid by, paid by the Australian public, Australian taxpayers, and then doesn't pay their fair share of tax, that is theft. And then there are the biggest victims of Jeff Bezos's regime. That is the Amazon workers themselves. I want to commend the work of the SDA, the Union for Amazon Online Retail Workers, and the TWU, the Union for Drivers Making Amazon Deliveries. Because while the Morrison government is asleep at the wheel, the SDA and the TWU have been working tirelessly to reveal what is really going on at Amazon. There are Amazon flex drivers who are being paid a flat $27 an hour. And that's without superannuation, without fuel costs, without maintenance costs, without insurance costs, and without any paid leave. That isn't a living wage. It's also $13 an hour below the minimum recommended rate for a courier using their own car in Victoria. The Victorian rates schedule for owner drivers put the minimum rate at $40.71. Amazon continues to lie and say it is fully compliant on pay. But when I asked Amazon at the job security inquiry how the $27 hourly pay complies with the $40 hourly recommended minimum, Amazon refused to come clean. In fact, Amazon refused to even answer any of the most basic questions. 
When the TW officials attempted a legal right of entry at an Amazon site, Amazon called the police. When the SDA officials tried to speak to workers at their Moorbank facility, Amazon managers monitored their conversations. In fact, we know that globally Amazon monitors the social media activity of its workers and pays union busting firms to monitor and intimidate anyone who raises concerns or talks about organising. Alex Aliff, an Amazon flex driver in Melbourne, told the ABC earlier this year that, and I quote, they've created an atmosphere of fear. Well, over my dead body will Australia become a country where this corporate thuggery is accepted. We've seen reports that Amazon workers forced to urinate or defecate in bags because they don't have time for a break. Amazon workers being hired through labour hire companies like ADECO, ADECO at even lower wages. Overheated Amazon workers being carried out of warehouses on stretchers, while Jeff Bezos is telling the media that he wants Amazon to be the Earth's best employer. And when unions across the world attempt to help workers stand up for their rights, Amazon engages in the most vicious misinformation and harassment campaigns you've ever seen. And for what? So that Jeff Bezos can fly himself into space? Because as Bezos said to his workers when he hand landed back on Earth, you guys, guys paid for all this. Well, I think Amazon workers have paid enough. It's time to make Amazon pay. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Mr President, and given that gaslighting has been a clear theme of the day today, I rise tonight to speak on the Santos dirty, um, big dirty gas, Barossa gas project off the northern coast of Australia near the Tiwi Islands. The Barossa development area lies 100 kilometres north of the Tiwi Islands. Tiwi Islands are home to the Tiwi people who have a long and unbroken history with their country, contrary to some of the distorted reality that's been presented here tonight. Uh, the islands are known for their rich biodiversity of frogs, reptiles, birds and mammals, some of which are not found anywhere else in the world. The Tiwi people have carefully managed their natural and cultural resources for thousands and thousands of years. The Barossa could become one of the dirtiest gas projects in the world. The Barossa gas field has very high levels of CO2, around 16 to 20 per cent, which would be vented into the atmosphere. This is the bottom of the barrel super dirty gas that no one wants and it needs to stay in the ground. I was deeply saddened to learn that there's been no consultation with the Tiwi traditional owners of the Barossa project. Before June of this year, um, if you went to the Tiwi Islands and asked any of the local people about the Barossa project, they would have said they knew nothing, didn't know it was happening. And Santos claimed that they have consulted with the Tiwi Land Council. But there are some serious concerns with this because the Tiwi Land Council are currently undergoing a review to address the concerns around its performance and its governance. Santos claim, uh, recently Santos said they would travel to the Tiwi Islands and speak to all of the clan groups around the, around the Barossa project. The first meeting was held yesterday, but Santos didn't even have the guts to turn up in person. Instead, they attended online. How shameful. I see zero evidence of any efforts to uphold the principle of free prior informed consent. So again, how shameful of Santos to do this to the Tiwi people. What are Santos trying to hide? Perhaps it has something to do with the fact that First Nations people do not want to see the destruction of their lands and seas at the hands of billionaires and big corporations. Parks Australia have given a class approval for Conco Phillips, who were the original owners of this project, to construct a gas pipeline running for 61 kilometres through the Commonwealth Oceanic Shoals Marine Park. But they failed to properly consult with the most important stakeholders in the marine park, the Tiwi people. Santos, like its mates at Woodside and BHP, are well exercised in the art of greenwashing. A report on the potential impacts on the marine turtles for the Barossa gas export pipeline provided by Santos ascertains that there will be no impact on turtle populations on the Tiwi Islands. This report has received widespread criticism amongst anti-marine scientists, and it was not peer-reviewed, and it does not include any relevant research conducted in the Northern Territory. 
The report was actually written as a desktop review and done from my home city of Perth, thousands of kilometres away, with a severe lack of relevant data to incorrectly conclude that there will be no impacts of this project. They cannot be trusted and they, to investigate the environmental and social impacts of their own gas projects. I also have some serious concerns about the fact that the original proposal for the Barossa project that was provided by Conco Phillips was fundamentally different from the current planning being undertaken by Santos. At no point has Santos received approval from the community to damage the land and sea through this Barossa project. Today, I stand together with the Tiwi people in opposition to this project, and I'm calling on Santos, the government, to put an end to the Barossa project immediately, because consultation does not mean consent. Thank you. Senator Davey. I rise, uh, before I get on with what I wanted to speak on, I, also, I just want to refer to um, Senator O'Neill's contribution tonight. And I want to thank her for raising the importance of why this government has implemented a regional banking task force. She highlighted tonight the closure of banks in regional areas. And let's not forget which government privatised the Commonwealth Bank, which started the snowball of closing banks in regional areas. So thank you, Senator O'Neill, and I hope you look forward to the results of the Regional Banking Task Force, which I am co-chair of, which is actually looking at solutions to a problem that was of Labor's making. And then I move on, because I want to talk about the situation we have in regional Australia as we approach after years of drought, of mouse plagues, and we're now facing, thankfully, one of the best harvest seasons in years, La Nina keeping away at bay for the moment. But we are still facing a worker shortage. The scale of the shortage can be illustrated by looking at just the holiday worker visas, which have dropped by about 100,000 from pre-COVID days. Once upon a time, we relied on those holiday worker visas to come and help us with our harvests for horticulture, for broadacre farming, and even in the meat industry, we rely on seasonal workers and Pacific labour force. And as much as people say, just get Australians to do the job, farmers have advertised, farmers have sought Australians to do the job, and Australians aren't taking up the job. For whatever reason, I am not laying the finger of blame at Australians. What I am saying, however, is we are dependent on that workforce. So our government has taken action. Our government has implemented the Ag Workforce Visa. And this has been welcomed by a huge range of people. The National Farmers Federation, the National Irrigators Council, the New South Wales Farmers Horticulture Committee, the Victorian Farmers Federation, Ausveg, Growcom, Berries Australia, the Australian Forestry Products Association, and the list goes on. But guess who hasn't welcomed the government's action here? Labor and the unions. Funny that. I'll refer to the comments of Act 2 President Michelle O'Neill, who said, and I quote, the new visa program is not based on any independent verification of the need for short-term visa workers. Really? A hundred thousand less workers in the agricultural workforce because we don't have holiday makers, seasonal workers, thanks to COVID. What more proof do you need? And there are other criticisms being made by those opposite. One of the other furfies that they like to peddle is that the government is somehow allowing these workers to be exploited. Well, we're not allowing them to be exploited. Pacific workers, for example, are employed under the same industry awards, agreements and legislation as Australian workers. That means they're entitled to the same minimum rates of pay and conditions, and they are meant to be enforced by government. 
But let me bring to your attention the fact that the Minister for Immigration and Migrant Services, Alex Hawke, is due to move very soon new amendments that will create new offences and significantly increase penalties on employers that do the wrong thing to protect those migrant workers. And I am calling on the Labor Party to support those amendments to support migrant workers, seasonal workers, Pacific labour workers and working holiday makers so that we can continue to have a strong and vibrant agricultural sector. Because this important is far too important. The modern labour union movement doesn't really care about the rights of workers. They are just looking for an opportunity to point score against the government. So the campaign against the ag worker visa by the unions and by Labor just leaves a bad taste in the mouth of regional Australians who need workers because we need this harvest to be as good as it can be. And to do that, we need to get it off the fields. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. After eight long years of Liberal national government, Australians are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. We're in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Eight years of wage stagnation, skyrocketing private and public debt and job insecurity has left people struggling to pay for the necessities like food, rent, petrol and utility bills. Last week I was speaking to Amy, a Flinders student, um, who had just been advised by her landlord that her rent was going up by $35 a week. She can't afford it. I also spoke to Liam who's an admin trainee who lives on the opposite side of town to his workplace, and he doesn't know how he's going to fill his car with petrol next week, because he can't afford it. Our community deserves so much more from this government. Since the coalition came to office, it costs 22 per cent more to see a doctor, 35 per cent more for childcare. I hear from parents who are weighing up whether they can afford to return to work after the birth of a baby People struggling to pay the rent, put food on the table, have to watch the daily spectacle of waste and rotting on a scale never before seen in this country. Whether it's sports rorts, water rorts, regional rorts, car park rorts, Australians struggling under the crippling cost of living pressures must just shake their heads and wonder what on earth is going on in this country under this government. I met with Ross Womersley from SACOS a few weeks ago to discuss digital inclusion which is a key pressure in cost of living. In this day and age, you imagine that everybody has access to the internet and everybody has some form of device on which to access it. But that's not the case. 11 per cent of Australians are highly excluded from and 28.9 per cent are struggling to access digital platforms according to the 2021 Australian Digital Inclusion Index. According to the index, um, their digital affordability measure says that 14 per cent of Australians would need to pay more than 10 per cent of their household income to gain quality, reliable connectivity. For Australians in the lowest income quintile, 67 per cent of them would need to pay 10 per cent more of, uh, 10 per cent of their household income to gain this very same connection. Let's be clear, this isn't about gaming or streaming. This is about accessing jobs, this is accessing your work, this is about accessing government services, um, about accessing utility services, banking, education, what one would call the essentials. And as we head into an election, the Morrison government will undoubtedly roll out all the usual lines about being sound economic managers, but they are doing nothing for these people who are struggling with cost of living pressures. But we will. Labor will make it easier for families to get ahead and stay ahead. We'll do it by removing the financial barriers that discourage women from working out longer hours or pursuing their careers. We'll do it by expanding the MBN. We will do it through the inclusion of a $10 million billion Housing Australia Future Fund, um, which will develop social and affordable housing into the future, creating jobs, building homes and changing lives. It being 8 p.m., the Senate stands adjourned, and we will meet again tomorrow at 9:30 a.m. Same bat time.
Thank you all.